Chapter 10, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953. Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hagaru's Night of Fire The importance of Hagaru and the marine scheme of things was starkly obvious after the Chinese cut the MSR. Hagaru, with its supply dumps, hospital facilities, and partly finished C-47 airstrip, was the one base offering the 1st Marine Division a reasonable hope of uniting its separated elements. Hagaru had to be held at all costs, yet only a reinforced infantry battalion, less one rifle company and a third of its weapons company, and two batteries of artillery were available for the main burden of the defense. Owing to transportation shortages, the 3rd Battalion of the 1st Marines did not arrive at Hagaru until after dusk on 26 November. Even so, it had been necessary to leave George Company and a platoon of Weapons Company behind at Chigyong for lack of vehicles. The parka-clad Marines, climbing down stiffly from the trucks, had their first sight of a panorama which reminded one officer of old photographs of a gold rush mining camp in the Klondike. Tents, huts, and supply dumps were scattered in a seemingly haphazard fashion about a frozen plain crossed by a frozen river and bordered on three sides by low hills rising to steep heights on the eastern outskirts. Although many of the buildings had survived the bombings, the battered town at the foot of the ice-locked chosen reservoir was not a spectacle calculated to raise the spirits of newcomers. It was too late to relieve 2-7 minus that evening. Lieutenant Colonels Ridge and Lockwood agreed that Fox Company, 7th Marines, and Weapons Company, minus, of 2-7 would occupy positions jointly with 3-1. The hours of darkness passed quietly and relief was completed the next day. Fox Company then moved to its new positions near Taktong Pass. Four-mile perimeter required. On the morning of 27 November, of course, an all-out enemy attack was still in the realm of speculation. But it was evident to Lt. Col. Ridge, CO of 3-1, that 1-2 to two infantry regiments and supporting arms would be required for an adequate defense of Hagaru. With only a battalion minus at his disposal, he realized that he must make the best possible use of the ground. For the purposes of a survey, he sent his S-3, Major Trumpeter, on a walking reconnaissance with Major Simmons, CO of Weapons Company, and 3-1 Supporting Arms Coordinator. After a circuit of the Natural Amphitheater, the two officers agreed that even to hold the reverse slopes would require a perimeter of more than four miles in circumference. The personnel resources of 3-1 would thus be stretched to an average of one man for nearly seven yards of front. This meant that the commanding officer must take his choice between being weak everywhere or strong in a few sectors to the neglect of others. In either event, some areas along the perimeter would probably have to be defended by supporting fires alone. Under the circumstances, commented General Smith, and considering the mission assigned to the 1st Marine Division, an infantry component of one battalion was all that could be spared for the defense of Hagaru. This battalion was very adequately supported by air and had sufficient artillery and tanks for its purposes. The terrain gave the enemy two major covered avenues of approach for troop movements. One was the hill mass east of Hagaru, the other a draw leading into the southwest side of the town, where the new airstrip was being constructed. Nor could the possibility of a surprise attack from some other quarter be dismissed entirely, since CCF observers would be able to watch marine preparations from the surrounding hills in daylight hour. Lt. Col. Ridge decided that final troop dispositions must depend not only on terrain but equally on intelligence as to enemy capabilities. Until he had more information, the units of 3-1 were to remain in the areas formerly occupied by 2-7. Attempts to Clear MSR the battalion CP had been set up in a pyramidal tent at the angle of the road to Udamni. Most of the day on the 27th was given over to improving positions. At the southwest end of the perimeter, 
First Lieutenant Fisher's Item Company took over from Captain Barber's Fox Company, the rifle company of 2-7 remaining at Hagaroo. On the strength of preliminary S-2 reports, Ridge instructed the commanders of his two rifle companies to improve their sectors, which included the entire south and southwest curve of the perimeter. All the division headquarters troops except one motor convoy had reached Hagaroo by the 27th, and it was due to leave Hungnam the next morning. The new division CP was located in the northeast quarter of town, near the long concrete bridge over the frozen Changjin River. Rows of heated tents surrounded a Japanese-type frame house repaired for the occupancy of General Smith, who was expected by helicopter in the morning. Already functioning at the CP were elements of the General Staff Sections and Headquarters Company. The busiest Marines at Hagaru on the 27th were the men of the 1st Engineer Battalion. While a Company B platoon built tent decks for the Division CP, Detachments of Company A were at work on the maintenance of the MSR in the area, and Company D had the job of hacking out the new airstrip. Apparently, the latter project had its sidewalk contractors, even in sub-zero weather, for this comment found its way into the company report. Dozer work was pleasing to the eye of those who wanted activity but contributed little to the overall earth-moving problem of 90,000 cubic yards of cut and 60,000 cubic yards of fill. Motor graders and scrapers with a 5.8 cubic yard capacity had been moved up from Hamhung. So difficult did it prove to get a bite of the frozen earth that steel teeth were welded to the blades. When the pan was filled, however, the earth froze to the cutting edges until it could be removed only by means of a jackhammer. The strip was about one-fourth completed on the 27th, according to minimum estimates of the length required. Work went on that night as usual under the floodlights. Not until the small hours of the morning did the first reports reach Hagaru of the CCF attacks on Yunam Ni and Fox Hill. Since the remnants of 2-7 were still at Hagaru, for lack of transportation, when Lt. Col. Lockwood, commanding officer of the battalion, received a dispatch from Col. Litzenberg directing him to proceed to Toktong Pass and assist Fox Company. At 0530 he requested the loan of a rifle company of 3-1 to reinforce elements of Weapons Company minus 2-7. Lt. Col. Ridge could spare only a platoon from Howe Company, and at 0830 the attempt was canceled. An hour later, Weapons Company and three tanks from the 2nd Platoon of Company D, 1st Tank Battalion, made another effort. They pushed halfway to the objective, only to be turned back by heavy Chinese small arms and mortar fire from the high ground on both sides of the road. Supporting fires from 3-1 helped the column to break off contact and return to Hagaru at 1500. No better success attended a reinforced platoon of Howe Company 3-1, accompanied by three Company D tanks, when it set out on the road to Koto Ri. On the outskirts of Hagaru, within sight of Captain Corley's CP, the men were forced to climb down from their vehicles and engage in a hot firefight. They estimated the enemy force at about 50, but an OY pilot dropped a message warning that some 300 Chinese were moving up on the flanks of the patrol. The Marines managed to disengage at 1530 with the aid of mortar and artillery fires from Hagaru and returned to the perimeter with losses of one killed and five wounded. A similar patrol from Item Company 3-1 struck off to the southwest of the perimeter in the direction of Hungman Ni. Late in the morning of the 28th, this reinforced platoon encountered an estimated 150 men and called for artillery and mortar fires. After dispersing this CCF group, the patrol routed a second enemy detachment an hour later after a brief firefight. Any lingering doubts as to the extent of the Chinese attack on the MSR were dispelled by reports from the OY and HO3S1 pilots of VMO6. They disclosed that defended enemy roadblocks had cut off Udumni, Fox Hill, Hagaru, and Kotori from any physical contact with one another. The advance units of the 1st Marine Division had been sliced into four isolated segments as CCF columns penetrated as far south as the Chinhung Ni area. Intelligence as to CCF capabilities. 
There was no question at all in the minds of Lieutenant Colonel Ridge and his officers as to whether the Chinese would attack at Hagaru. As early as the morning of the 27th, the problem had simply been one of when, where, and in what strength. It was up to the S-2 section to provide the answers, and upon their correctness would depend the fate of Hagaru, perhaps even of the 1st Marine Division. 2nd Lieutenant Richard E. Carey, the S-2, was a newcomer to the battalion staff, recently transferred from a George Company infantry platoon. His group consisted of an assistant intelligence chief, Staff Sergeant Severio P. Gallo, an interpreter, and four scout observers. There were also two CIC agents assigned to 3-1 by Division G-2. At Hagaru, as at Majani, the Marines had won respect at the outset by allowing the Korean residents all privileges of self-government which could be reconciled with military security. The police department and town officials had been permitted to continue functioning. They in turn briefed the population as to restricted areas and security regulations, particularly curfew. Korean civilians entering Hagaru through marine roadblocks were searched before being taken to the police station where they were questioned by an interrogation team from the S-2 section. Hagaru's resemblance to a gold rush mining camp was heightened on the 27th by a tremendous influx of both troops and Koreans from outlying districts. A large truck convoy from Headquarters Battalion arrived to set up the new Division CP, and detachments from various Marine and Army service units entered in a seemingly endless stream. The Korean refugees had much the same story to tell. Most of them came from areas to the north and west of Hagaru, and they had been evicted from their homes by large numbers of CCF troops. Carey instructed his CIC agents to converse with incoming Koreans and learn everything possible about the enemy situation. Again, as at Majani, people who had been thoroughly indoctrinated with communism were found highly cooperative. As untrained observers, however, their estimates of CCF numbers and equipment could not be taken too literally. Since their statements agreed that the enemy was in close proximity, Carey decided to take the risk of sending his two CIC agents on the dangerous mission of establishing direct contact. They were enjoined to make a circuit of the perimeter, mingling whenever possible with the Chinese and determining the areas of heaviest concentration. The results went beyond Carey's fondest expectations. Not only did his agents return safely from their long hike over the hills, but they brought back vital information. Well-led and equipped Chinese communist units had been encountered to the south and west of Hagaru. And since Marine Air also reported unusual activity in this area, it was a reasonable assumption that the enemy was concentrated there approximately in division strength. This answered the questions as to how many and where. There remained the problem as to when the attack might be expected, and again on the 28th, Carey sent out his CIC agents to make direct contact. I expected little or no information, he recollected, but apparently these men had a way with them. Upon reporting back, they told me that they had talked freely with enemy troops, including several officers who boasted that they would occupy Hagaru on the night of 28 November. Major enemy units were reported to be five miles from the perimeter. Dusk was at approximately 1800, with complete darkness setting in shortly afterwards. Adding the estimate of three and a half hours for Chinese movements to the line of departure, the S-2 section calculated that the enemy could attack as early as 2130 on the night of the 28th from the south and west in division strength. Positions of Marine Units These intelligence estimates were accepted by Lt. Col. Ridge as the basis for his planning and troop dispositions. As the main base of defense, the tied-in sectors of Howe and Item companies were extended to include the south and southwest sides of the perimeter, nearly one-third of the entire circumference, in a continuous line 2,300 yards in length, or more than a mile and a quarter. Each platoon front thus averaged about 380 yards, which meant that supporting arms must make up for lack of numbers. East Hill, considered the second most likely point of enemy attack, was to be assigned to George Company on arrival. 
Captain Sitter's outfit had orders to depart the Chigyong area on the morning of the 28th so that it would be expected at Hagaru before dark. The southeast quarter of the perimeter, between East Hill and the left flank of Howe Company, was to be held by the following units. 1. Weapons Company, less detachments reinforcing the rifle companies and its 81mm mortars in place near the battalion CP, manning a roadblock on the route to Koto Ri and defending the south nose of East Hill. 2. Dog Company 1st Engineer Battalion, less men at work on the airstrip, occupying the ground south of the concrete bridge, and 3. Dog Battery, 2nd Battalion, 11th Marines, which had the mission of covering 75% of the perimeter with observed indirect fire and 25% with direct fire. These dispositions left a gap between Weapons Company and the Engineer and Artillery units on the west bank of the Changjin River. But this stretch of frozen marshland was so well covered by fire that an enemy attack here would have been welcomed. The first reports of the CCF onslaughts at Udam Ni and Fox Hill, as interpreted by Lt. Col. Ridge, clearly indicated that no time was to be lost at buttoning up the Hagaru perimeter. He called on Col. Bowser, the Division G3, on the morning of the 28th and recommended that an overall defense commander be designated with operational control over all local units. Ridge also requested that George Company and the 41st Commando be expedited in their movements to Hagaru. Before a decision could be reached, General Smith arrived by helicopter and opened the Division CP at 1100. A Marine rear echelon had remained at Hungnam to cope with supply requirements. Colonel Francis A. McAllister, the G-4, left in command, accomplished during the forthcoming campaign what General Smith termed a magnificent job in rendering logistical support. The CP at Hagaru had been open only half an hour when General Almond arrived in a VM-06 helicopter to confer with the division commander. Departing at 1255, he visited the 31st Infantry troops who had been hard hit the night before by CCF attacks east of the Chosen Reservoir. On his return to Hamhung, the Corps commander was informed that Sink Fi had directed him to fly immediately to Tokyo for a conference. There he learned that the 8th Army was in full retreat, with some units taking heavy losses both in personnel and equipment. Generals Almond, Walker, Hickey, Willoughby, Whitney, and Wright took turns at briefing the commander-in-chief during a meeting which lasted from midnight to 0130. At Hagaru, it was becoming more apparent hourly to Ridge that his prospects of employing Captain Sitter's company on East Hill were growing dim. As he learned later, the unit had left Chigyong that morning in the trucks of Company B, 7th Motor Transport Battalion, commanded by Captain Clovis M. Jones. Sitter was met at Koto Ri by Lt. Col. Robert W. Rickert, Executive Officer of RCT-1, and directed to report to the Regimental S-3, Major Robert E. Lorigan. Efforts to open up the road to Hagaru had failed, he was told, and it would be necessary for George Company to remain overnight at Koto Ri. The probability of such an outcome had already been accepted by Ridge on the basis of the resistance met on the road to Koto Ri by his Howe Company patrol. With this development added to his worries, he received a telephone call at 1500 from Colonel Bowser informing him that he had been named Defense Commander of Hagaru by General Smith. Just ten minutes later, a single CCF shell, assumed to be of 76mm caliber, exploded in the battalion CP area and fatally wounded Captain Paul E. Storasley, the S-4. The perimeter was so cluttered with tents and dumps that artillery fire at random could hardly have been wasted, but the enemy gun remained silent the rest of the day, doubtless to avert Marine counter-battery reprisals. Only three hours of daylight remained when the newly designated defense commander summoned unit commanders to an initial conference. It was not made clear just what troops had been placed under his operational control. A primary reason, commented Ridge, was that no one knew what units were there, this being compounded by the numerous small elements such as detachments, advance parties, etc., of which many were corps and rock units. 
Hence, the Battalion S-1 and his assistants were a combination of town criers and census takers. We did, however, get most of the commanders of major units, if such they could be called, to the initial conference, but the process of locating and identifying smaller units was thereafter a continuous process which we really never accurately completed. The larger outfits could be summoned to the conferences by telephone, but it was necessary to send out runners in other instances. With George Company not available, the question of defending East Hill loomed large. Ridge decided against all proposals that one of the two rifle companies be used for that purpose. On the strength of the S-2 report, he preferred to concentrate as much strength as possible against an attack from the southwest. This meant taking his chances on East Hill with such service troops as he could scrape up, and it was plain that a strong CCF effort in this quarter would have to be met in large part by firepower from supporting arms. The two main detachments selecting for East Hill, excluding the South Nose, were from Dog Company of the 10th Engineer, C Battalion, U.S. Army, and elements of 10 Corps headquarters. Since the mission called for control of mortar and artillery fires as well as tactical leadership, two officers of Weapons Company 3-1 were assigned, Captain John C. Shellnut to the Army Engineer Company and First Lieutenant John L. Burke, Jr. to the headquarters troops. Each was to be accompanied by a Marine Radio, SCR-300, operator. Smaller detachments were later sent to East Hill from two other service units, the 1st Service Battalion, 1st Marine Division, and the 4th Signal Battalion of 10 Corps. The anti-tank company of the 7th Marines defended the area to the north of East Hill. Next came Howe Battery, 3rd Battalion, 11th Marines, which had the mission of supporting Fox Company 27 on the hill near Toktong Pass. But by moving gun trails, the cannoneers could with some difficulty fire the 270-degree arc of the perimeter stretching from the right flank of Item Company around to the north nose of East Hill. Between the sectors held by Howe Battery, 311, and Item Company, 31, were troops of five Marine units, Regulating Detachment, 1st Service Battalion, 1st Motor Transport Battalion, Marine Tactical Air Control Squadron 2, MTAX-2. Division Headquarters Battalion, and h and Company 3-1. The only other unit in this quarter was Weapons Company Minus 2-7, which held the roadblock on the route to Udem Ni. At the conference, it was decided that since Lt. Col. Charles L. Banks' regulating detachment had taken lead in organizing the supply area on the north side of Hagaru, the arc of the perimeter east of the river and west of East Hill was to be made into a secondary defense zone. Banks thus became in effect a subsector commander. The only infantry troops in the supply area being detachments of two seven units, it was also agreed that tactical decisions concerning the zone should be discussed with the two ranking battalion officers, Lieutenant Colonel Lockwood, the commander, and Major Sawyer, the executive. These matters having been settled, the conference broke up shortly after 1700 and the various commanders hastened back to their outfits to make last-minute preparations for the night's attack. A strange hush had fallen over the perimeter, broken only by the occasional crackle of small arms fire, and the damp air felt like snow. End of chapter 10, part 1. Read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 10, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hagaru's Night of Fire CCF Attack from the Southwest How and Item Companies Were Ready all platoon positions were well dug in, though the earth was frozen to a depth of 6 to 10 inches. The men of Item Company used their heads as well as hands after Lt. Fisher managed to obtain a thousand sandbags and several bags of C-3. This explosive was utilized in ration cans to make improvised shape charges which blasted a hole through the frozen crust of snow and earth. 
Then it became a simple matter to enlarge the hole and place the loose dirt in sandbags to form a parapet. This ingenious system resulted in deluxe foxholes and mortar emplacements attaining to the dignity of field fortifications. Both company fronts bristled with concertinas, trip flares, booby traps, and five-gallon cans of gasoline rigged with thermite bombs for illumination. Three probable routes of enemy attack channeled the low hills to the southwest, a main draw leading to the junction between the two company sectors, and a lesser draw providing an approach to each. The ground in front of the junction had been mined, and two tanks from the provisional platoon were stationed in this quarter. Detachments from Weapons Company also reinforced both rifle companies. Thus, the six platoons faced the enemy in the following order. Item Company Company Commander Lieutenant Fisher Lieutenant DeGerne, 1st Platoon Lieutenant Hall, 3rd Platoon Lieutenant Needham, 2nd Platoon Howe Company Captain Corley, Company Commander Lieutenant Barrett, 1st Platoon Lieutenant Ensley, 3rd Platoon Lieutenant Mason, 2nd Platoon. Beginning at 1700, hot food was served to all hands in rotation. A 50% alert went into effect after dark as the men were sent back on regular schedule for coffee and a smoke in warming tents located as close to the front as possible. The first snowflakes fluttered down about 1950, muffling the clank of the dozers at work as usual under the floodlights on the airstrip behind the Howe Company's sector. Just before 21.30, the expected time of CCF attack, both company commanders ordered a 100% alert, but the enemy did not show up on schedule. It was just over an hour later when three red flares and three blasts on a police whistle signaled the beginning of the attack. Soon, trip flares and exploding booby traps revealed the approach of probing patrols composed of five to ten men. A few minutes later, white phosphorus mortar shells scorched the Marine front line with accurate aim. The main CCF attack followed shortly afterwards, with both company sectors being hit by assault waves closing in to grenade-throwing distance. The enemy in turn was staggered by the full power of Marine supporting arms. Snowflakes reduced an already low visibility, but fields of fire had been carefully charted and artillery and mortar concentrations skillfully registered in. Still, the communists kept on coming in spite of frightful losses. Second Lieutenant Wayne L. Hall, commanding the 3rd Platoon in the center of Item Company, was jumped by three Chinese whom he killed with a 45 caliber automatic pistol after his car being jammed. The third foe pitched forward into Hall's foxhole. On the left flank, tied in with Howe Company, 1st Lieutenant Robert C. Needham, 2nd Platoon, sustained most of the attack on Item Company. The fire of 2nd Lt. James J. Boley's 60mm mortars and 2nd Lt. John H. Miller's light machine guns was concentrated in this area. It seemed impossible that enemy burp guns could miss such a target as Lt. Fisher, 6 feet 2 inches in height and weighing 235 pounds. But he continued to pass up and down the line, pausing at each foxhole for a few words of encouragement. By midnight, the enemy pressure on Needham's and Hall's lines had slackened, and on the right flank, 2nd Lt. Malin L. Desjarn's 1st platoon received only light attacks. This was also the case on the left flank of Howe Company, where 2nd Lt. Ronald A. Mason's 2nd platoon saw little action as compared to the other two. A front of some 800 yards in the center of the 2300-yard Marine line, including two platoon positions and parts of two others, borne the brunt of the CCF assault on Howe and Item Companies. Captain Corley had just visited his center platoon when the first attacks hit Howe Company. 2nd Lieutenant Wendell C. Ensley was killed while the company commander was on his way to 2nd Lieutenant Roscoe L. Barrett's 1st platoon, on the right, which soon had its left flank heavily engaged. Never was CCF skill at night attacks displayed more effectively. Barrett concluded that the Chinese actually rolled down the slope into the Howe Company lines so that they seemed to emerge from the very earth. The 3rd Platoon, already thinned by accurate CCF white phosphorus mortar fire, was now further reduced in strength by grenades and burp gun bursts. 
About this time, the company wire net went out, and Corley could keep in touch with his platoons only by runners. The battalion telephone line also being cut, he reported his situation by radio to the battalion CP. Two wiremen were killed while trying to repair the line. The Chinese continued to come on in waves, each preceded by concentrations of light and heavy mortar fire on the right and center of the Howe Company position. About 0030, the enemy broke through in the 3rd platoon area and penetrated as far back as the company CP. A scene of pandemonium ensued, the sound of Chinese trumpets and whistles adding to the confusion as it became difficult to tell friend from foe. Tracers were so thick recalled Sergeant Keith E. Davis, that they lighted up the darkness like a Christmas tree. Corley and five enlisted men operated as a supporting fire team, while First Lieutenant Harrison F. Betts rounded up as many men as he could find and tried to plug the gap in the 3rd platoon line. This outnumbered group was swept aside as the next wave of CCF attack carried to the rear of Howe Company and threatened the engineers at work under the floodlights. A few Chinese actually broke through and fired at the Marines operating the dozers. Second Lieutenant Robert L. McFarlane, the equipment officer, led a group of dog company engineers who counterattacked and cleared the airstrip at the cost of a few casualties. Then the men resumed work under the floodlights. The battalion reserve, if such it could be called, consisted of any service troops who could be hastily gathered to meet the emergency. Shortly before midnight, Ridge sent a platoon strength group of 10 Corps signalmen and engineers under 1st Lieutenant Grady P. Mitchell to the aid of Howe Company. Mitchell was killed upon arrival, and 1st Lieutenant Horace L. Johnson, Jr. deployed the reinforcements in a shallow ditch as a company reserve. About midnight, the fight had reached such a pitch of intensity that no spot in the perimeter was safe. The Company C Medical Clearing Station, only a few hundred yards to the rear of Item Company, was repeatedly hit by machine gun bullets whipping through the wooden walls as surgeons operated on the wounded. The Division CP also took hits, and a bullet which penetrated General Smith's quarters produced unusual sound effects when it ricocheted off pots and pans in the galley. The Chinese seemed to be everywhere in the Howe Company zone. Shortly after midnight, they surrounded the CP, portable galley, and provision tent. It is my personal opinion, commented Captain Corley, that if the enemy had decided to effect a major breakthrough at this time, he would have experienced practically no difficulty. However, he seemed content to wander in and around the 3rd platoon, galley, and hut areas. The Chinese, in short, demonstrated that they knew better how to create a penetration than to exploit one. Once inside the Howe Company lines, they disintegrated into looting groups of purposeless tactical fragments. Clothing appealed most to the plunderers, and a wounded Marine in the 3rd platoon area saved his life by pretending to be dead while communists stripped him of his parka. About 0030, the battalion CP advised Corley by radio that more reinforcements were on the way. Lieutenant Johnson met the contingent, comprising about 50 service troops, and guided them into the company area, where they were deployed as an added reserve to defend the airstrip. Item Company was still having it hot and heavy, but continued to beat off all CCF assaults. Elements of Weapons Company, manning the south roadblock, came under attack at 0115. Apparently, a small enemy column had lost direction and blundered into a field of fire covered by heavy machine guns. The hurricane of marine fire caught the communists before they deployed, and the result was virtual annihilation. East Hill lost to enemy. Half an hour later, with the situation improving in the Howe Company zone, the battalion CP had its first alarming reports of reverses on East Hill. The terrain itself had offered difficulties to men scrambling up the steep, icy slopes with heavy burdens of ammunition. These detachments of service troops, moreover, included a large proportion of newly recruited rocks who had little training and understood no English. The largest of the East Hill units, Company D of the 10th Engineer Combat Battalion, commanded by Captain Philip A. Kolbs, U.S. Army, was composed of 77 American enlisted men and 90 rocks. Combat equipment, in addition to individual weapons, consisted of four 50 caliber machine guns, 
five light 30 caliber machine guns, and six 3.5 rocket launchers. The Army engineers had arrived at Hagaru at 1200 on the 28th, shortly before the enemy cut the MSR. After being assigned to the East Hill sector during the afternoon, the company used the few remaining hours of daylight to move vehicles and gear back to an equipment park in the perimeter. It was 2030 before the four platoons got into position on East Hill after an exhausting climb in the darkness with heavy loads of ammunition. Some use was made of existing holes, but most of the men were not dug in when the Chinese attacked. On the left, the collapse of a rock platoon attached to 10 Corps headquarters led rapidly to confusion everywhere on East Hill. Captain Shellnut, the Marine officer assigned to the Army Engineers, found that he could not close the gap by extending the line to the left. Nor did the men, particularly the rocks, have the training to side-slip to the left under fire and beat off flank attacks. The consequence was a general withdrawal on East Hill, attended in some instances by demoralization. Shellnut was killed as the four engineer platoons fell back some 250 yards in a tight knot, according to Lieutenant Norman R. Rosen, U.S. Army, commander of the 3rd platoon. This was the situation as reported by the Marine radio operator, PFC Bruno Podolak, who voluntarily remained as an observer at his post, now behind enemy lines. At 0230, a telephone call to Colonel Bowser from the 31CP was recorded in the message blank as follows. How company still catching hell and are about ready to launch counterattack to restore line. About an hour ago, enemy appeared on East Hill. A group of enemy sneaked up to a bunch of Banks' men and hand-grenaded hell out of them and took position. Sending an executive officer over to see if we can get some fire on that area. Should be able to restore the line, but liable to be costly. Reserve practically nil. Do have a backup behind the break and how lines on this side of airstrip, composed of engineers and other odds and ends. At 0400, there was little to prevent the enemy from making a complete breakthrough on East Hill and attacking the Division CP and the supply dumps. A friendly foothold had been retained on reverse slopes of the southern nose, but the northern part was held only by artillery fires. Along the road at the bottom of East Hill, a thin line of service troops with several tanks and machine guns formed a weak barrier. All indications point to the fact that the Chinese themselves were not in sufficient strength to follow up their success. Their attack on East Hill was apparently a secondary and diversionary effort in support of the main assault on the sectors held by Howe and item companies. At any rate, the enemy contented himself with holding the high ground he had won. Some of the defenders of East Hill had fought with bravery, which is the more admirable because of their lack of combat training. Battle is a business for specialists, and Lieutenant Rosen relates that the Army engineers had a great deal of difficulty with our weapons because they were cold and fired sluggishly. We had gone into action so unexpectedly that it had not occurred to us to clean the oil off our weapons. As an example of the difficulties imposed by the language barrier, the officers were given to understand by the rocks that they had no more ammunition. Weeks later, commented Rosen, we found that most of them had not fired their ammunition this night, but continued to carry it. In view of such circumstances, the service troops put up a creditable, if losing, fight in the darkness on East Hill. The 77 Americans of the Army Engineer Company suffered losses of 10 KIA, 25 WIA, and 9 MIA, and the 90 Rocks, about 50 were killed, wounded, or missing, chiefly the latter the volcano of supporting fires. As usual, the men in the thick of the fight saw only what happened in their immediate area. The scene as a whole was witnessed by a young Marine officer of Company A, 1st Engineer Battalion, on duty at a sawmill two miles north of Hagaru. From the high ground, he could look south down into the perimeter, and the awesome spectacle of a night battle made him think of a volcano in eruption. Gun flashes stabbing the darkness were fused into a great ring of living flame, and the thousands of explosions blended into one steady, low-pitched roar. Seldom in marine history have supporting arms played as vital a part as during this night at Hagaru. 
It is possible that a disaster was averted on East Hill when the Marines of Captain Benjamin S. Reed's Howe Battery shifted trails and plugged the hole in the line with howitzer fires alone. Lieutenant Colonel Banks and Major Walter T. Warren, commanding the anti-tank company of the 7th Marines, acted as observers. Reporting by telephone to the gun pits, they directed the sweating gunner so accurately that an enemy attack would have come up against a curtain of fire. Captain Stromenger's dog battery had been attached to 3-1 so long that a high degree of coordination existed. His 105s fired about 1,200 rounds that night, and POW interrogations disclosed that enemy concentrations in rear areas were repeatedly broken up. When CCF guns replied, shortly before midnight, there was danger of a fuel or ammunition dump being hit and starting a chain reaction of detonations in the crowded perimeter. Strohmenger ordered five of his howitzers to cease fire while he moved the sixth out about 150 yards to act as a decoy. Its flashes drew fire from the enemy, as he had hoped, revealing the positions of the Chinese artillery. Dog battery officers set up two aiming circles and calculated the range and deflection. Then the command was given for all six marine howitzers to open up. The enemy guns were silenced for the night. A later survey established that two CCF 76mm guns had been destroyed and two others removed. The 60mm mortars of the two rifle companies fired a total of more than 3,200 rounds, and on both fronts the heavy machine guns of Weapons Company added tremendously to the firepower. Illuminating shells being scarce, two Korean houses on the item company's front were set ablaze by orders of Lt. Fisher. The flames seemed to attract CCF soldiers like Malls, and the machine guns of the two tanks stationed here reaped a deadly harvest. Curiously enough, the Chinese apparently did not realize what excellent targets they made when silhouetted against the burning buildings. By 0400 it was evident that the enemy's main effort had failed. No further attacks of any consequence were sustained by the two rifle companies. It remained only to dispose of the unwelcome CCF visitors sealed off in the Howe Company zone, and at 0420, Captain Corley rounded up men for a counterattack. It will be just as dark for them as for us, he told his NCOs. Second Lieutenant Edward W. Snelling was directed to fire all his remaining 60mm mortar ammunition in support. Corley and Betts led the service troops sent as reinforcements while Johnson advanced on the left. A bitter fight of extermination ensued, and by 0630, the MLR had been restored. Howe Company, which sustained the heaviest losses of any Marine unit that night, had a total of 16 men killed and 39 wounded, not including attached units. After it was all over, the stillness had a strange impact on ears attuned the whole night long to the thump of mortars and clatter of machine guns. The harsh gray light of dawn revealed the unforgettable spectacle of hundreds of Chinese dead heaped up in front of the two marine rifle companies. Shrouds of new white snow covered many of them, and crimson trails showed where the wounded had made their way to the rear. Marine Attacks on East Hill But even though the enemy's main attack had failed, his secondary effort on East Hill represented a grave threat to perimeter security. At 0530, Ridge decided to counterattack, and Major Reginald R. Myers volunteered to lead an assault column composed of all reserves who could be scraped together for the attempt. It was broad daylight before the battalion executive officer moved out with an assortment of Marine, Army, and ROC service troops, some of them stragglers from the night's withdrawals from East Hill. Their total strength compared to that of an infantry company. About 55 separate units were represented at Hagaru, many by splinter groups, so that most of Meyer's men were strangers to one another as well as to their officers and NCOs. The largest Marine group was the platoon led by 1st Lieutenant Robert E. Yokums, Assistant Operations Officer of the 1st Engineer Battalion. Clerks, typists, and truck drivers were included along with Company D engineers. Armed with carbines or M1s and two grenades apiece, the men carried all the small arms ammunition they could manage. Few had recent combat experience and the platoon commander knew only one of them personally, a company clerk whom he had made his runner. 
It was typical of the informality attending this operation that a Marine NCO with a small group attached themselves to Yoakum's, giving him a total of about 45. They had an exhausting 45-minute climb up the hill to the line of departure where Myers directed them to attack on the left of his main force. The early morning fog enshrouded East Hill and Myers' attack had to wait until it cleared. The jump-off line lay along a steep slope with little or no cover. From the outset, the advancing troops were exposed to scattered small arms fire as well as grenades which needed only to be rolled downhill. New snow covering the old icy crust made for treacherous footing so that the heavily laden men took painful falls. Meyer's little task force can scarcely be considered a tactical organization. His close air support was excellent, but both artillery and mortar support were lacking. Yoakums did not notice any weapons save small arms and grenades. Our plane assaults were very effective, especially the napalm attacks, he commented on the basis of a personal log kept at the time. During these strikes, either live or dry runs, the enemy troops in the line of fire often rise and run from their positions to those in the rear. Marine Air came on station at 0930 as VMF-312 planes peeled off to hit the enemy with napalm and bombs. The squadron flew 31 sorties that day at Hagaru, nearly all in the East Hill area. Enemy small arms fire crippled one aircraft, but the pilot, 1st Lieutenant Harry W. Colmery, escaped serious injury by making a successful crash landing within the perimeter. All accounts agree that the ground forces met more serious opposition from the terrain at times than from the enemy. So cut up into ridges and ravines was this great hill mass that the troops seldom knew whether they were advancing in defilade or exposing themselves to the fire of hidden adversaries. Thus the attack became a lethal game of hide-and-seek in which a step to the right or left might make the difference between life and death. On the other hand, when the Corsairs provided shooting gallery targets by flushing out opponents, only a few men could get into effective firing positions along the narrow, restricted ridges before the Communists scuttled safely to new cover. It took most of the energies of the attackers to keep on toiling upward, gasping for breath, clutching at bushes for support, and sweating at every pore in spite of the cold. At noon, after snail-like progress, the force was still far short of the main ridge recognized as the dividing line between friendly forces and the enemy. By this time, more than half of Meyer's composite company had melted away as a result of casualties and exhaustion. Yoakum saw no more than 15 wounded men in the attacking force during the day. He noted about the same number of dead Chinese. As for enemy strength, he estimated that the total may have amounted to a company or slightly more. It was his conviction that three well-organized platoons could have pressed the assault without serious consequences and seized the immediate highest objective. What was behind that I am unable to say, but I feel that taking this high ground would have solved the problem. Most of the friendly casualties were caused by the grenades and grazing machine gun fire of concealed opponents who had the law of gravity fighting on their side. Yoakums was painfully wounded in the foot but continued with his platoon. The age-old problem of leadership in such an operation, he concluded, may be compared to moving a piece of string, pulling it forward will get you further than pushing. Enemy small arms fire increased in volume when Meyer's remnants, estimated at 75 men, reached the military crest of the decisive ridge. There, the groups in the center and on the right were halted by the Chinese holding the topographical crest in reverse slope. On the left, Yoakum's men managed to push on to an outlying spur before being stopped by CCF fire from a ridge to the northeast. Yoakum's position was still short of the commanding high ground, yet it was destined to be the point of farthest penetration on East Hill. Myers ordered his men to take what cover they could find and draw up a defensive line, short of the topographical crest, while awaiting a supporting attack. This was to be carried out by elements of Captain George W. King's Able Company of the 1st Engineer Battalion, which had been stationed at a sawmill two miles north of Hagaru to repair a blown bridge. These troops reached the perimeter without incident at noon and proceeded immediately to the assault. 1st Lieutenant Nicholas A. Canzona's 1st Platoon led the column. 
Orders were to ascend the southwestern slope of East Hill, pass through Meyer's force, and clear the ridge line. But after completing an exhausting climb to the military crest, the engineer officer was directed to retrace his steps to the foot. There, Captain King informed them that a new attack had been ordered on the opposite flank, from a starting point about 1,000 yards to the northeast. Moving to the indicated route of approach, Canzona began his second ascent with two squads in line, pushing up a spur and a draw which became almost perpendicular as it neared the topographical crest. Only his skeleton platoon of about 20 men was involved. There were neither radios nor supporting arms, and a light machine gun was the sole weapon in addition to small arms and grenades. Upon reaching the military crest, the engineers were pinned down by CCF machine gun fire along a trail a few feet wide with nearly vertical sides. Only Canzona, Staff Sergeant Stanley B. McPherson, and PFC Eugene B. Schlegel had room for deployment, and they found the platoon's one machine gun inoperative after it was laboriously passed up from the rear. Schlegel was wounded and rolled downhill like a log, unconscious from loss of blood. Another machine gun, sent up from the foot, enabled the platoon to hold its own, even though it could not advance. Canzona put in a request by runner for mortar support, but only two 81mm rounds were delivered after a long delay. It was late afternoon when he walked downhill to consult King, who had just been ordered to withdraw Company A to a reverse slope position. Canzona returned to his men and pulled them back about halfway down the slope while McPherson covered the retirement with machine gun fire. The winter sun was sinking when the wary engineer set up a night defense, and at that moment the howitzers of Howe Battery cut loose with point detonation and proximity bursts, which hit the Chinese positions with deadly accuracy. Canzona estimated the enemy strength in his zone at no more than a platoon, which might have been dislodged with the aid of artillery or even mortar fire. About 500 yards south of the engineers, Major Myers held a defensive position with his remaining force of about two platoons. The battalion CP had reason to believe that the outposts on East Hill would be relieved shortly by George Company with the 41st Commando and Perimeter Reserve. Both had departed Koto Ri that morning in a strong convoy, which also included an Army infantry company, four platoons of Marine tanks, and the last serial of Division Headquarters Battalion. It was still touch and go at Hagaru at dusk on the 29th, but the defenders could take satisfaction in having weathered the enemy's first onslaught. General Smith, courteous and imperturbable as always, visited the battalion CP to commend Ridge and his officers for the night's work. Two rifle companies had inflicted a bloody repulse on several times their own numbers, and the counterattacking forces on East Hill had at least hung on by their eyelashes. In the final issue, a bobtailed rifle battalion, two artillery batteries, and an assortment of service troops had stood off a CCF division identified as the 58th and composed of the 172nd, 173rd, and 174th Infantry Regiments reinforced with organic mortars, and some horse-drawn artillery. Chinese prisoners reported that the 172nd, taking the principal part in the attacks on Howe and Item companies, had suffered 90% casualties. Elements of the 173rd were believed to have figured to a lesser extent, with the 174th being kept in reserve. This was the situation in the early darkness of 29 November when the disturbing news reached Hagaru that George Company and the commandos were being heavily attacked on the road from Koto Ri and had requested permission to turn back. End of chapter 10, part 2, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 11, part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953. Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Task Force Drysdale Before the Chinese struck at Udam Ni, they had penetrated 35 miles farther south along the MSR. At Chinhung Ni, on the night of 26 November, the Marines of the 1st Battalion, RCT-1, 
exchanged shots in the darkness with several elusive enemy groups making light probing attacks. Lieutenant Colonel Donald M. Schmuck, a new battalion commander, had set up a defensive perimeter upon arrival with his three rifle companies reinforced by 4.2-inch mortar and 75mm recoilless rifle platoons. The identity of the enemy on the night of the 26th was not suspected, and patrols the next day made no contacts. At 1900 on the 27th, however, another light attack on the perimeter was repulsed. During the next two days, patrol actions definitely established that Chinese and estimated battalion strength were in a mountain valley to the west, hiding in houses by day and probing by night apparently in preparation for a determined attack. Schmuck decided to strike first. On the 29th, a Baker Company reconnaissance patrol searched out the enemy positions, and the next day the battalion commander led an attacking force composed of Captain Barrow's Able Company and part of Captain Noren's Baker Company, reinforced by 81mm and 4.2-inch mortars under the direction of Major William L. Bates, Jr., commanding the weapons company. While First Lieutenant Howard A. Blancheri's Fox Battery of 211 laid down supporting fires, the infantry ran the Chinese right out of the country, according to Major Bates's account. We burned all the houses they had been living in and brought the civilians back with us. We had no more difficulty with the Chinese from that valley. The communists were found to be warmly clothed in new padded cotton uniforms and armed with American weapons presumably captured from the nationalists. An estimated 56 were killed by the ground forces before the Corsairs of VMF-312 took up a relentless pursuit which lasted until the enemy remnants scattered into hiding. Some of the Chinese were mounted on shaggy Mongolian ponies. CCF attacks on 2-1 at Kotori. During this same period, Lt. Col. Sutter's 2nd Battalion of RCT-1 had several hard-fought encounters with the new enemy. After arriving at Koto Ri on the 24th, he set up a perimeter defense facing west, north, and east, which included a 4.2-inch mortar platoon, as well as Easy Battery of 211, commanded by Captain John C. McClellan, Jr. Some commanding ground was left unoccupied, but Sutter believed that a tight perimeter offered advantages over widely separated blocking positions. In addition to 2-1, the Regimental CP and H&S Company, the AT Company, minus, the 4.2-inch Mortar Company, minus, Company D of the 1st Medical Battalion and the 2nd Battalion of the 11th Marines, less batteries D and F, were at Koto Ri. The perimeter, second in importance only to Hagaru as a base, was to be jammed during the next few days with hundreds of Marine and Army troops held up by CCF roadblocks to the north. On 27 November, the enemy made his presence known. A motorized patrol of platoon strength from Captain Jack A. Smith's Easy Company, supported by a section of tanks, engaged in a firefight with about 25 Chinese in the hills west of Koto Ri. Two wounded CCF soldiers were left behind by the dispersed enemy. At this point, the patrol proceeded on foot until it was stopped by the fire of an estimated 200 communists dug in along ridgelines. At 1600, the Marines returned to the perimeter with two men wounded. Enemy losses were reported as eight killed and 15 wounded in addition to the two prisoners. Upon being questioned, these Chinese asserted that they belonged to a Chinese division assembling to the west of Koto Ri with a headquarters and a mine shaft. There could be no doubt the next day that the enemy had swarmed into the area in fairly large numbers. A Marine outpost on a hill northeast of the perimeter received heavy small arms fire at 0845 and was reinforced by a platoon from Easy Company. Finally, these troops had to be withdrawn and an airstrike called on the hill to evict the enemy. At 1058, General Smith ordered Colonel Puller to push a force up the MSR to make contact with the tank patrol being sent south from Hagaru and to clear the MSR. Groups of Chinese, sighted during the day to the north, west and east, were taken under artillery fire by Captain McClellan's battery. Reconnaissance planes landing at the Koto Ri OY strip reported CCF roadblocks on the way to Hagaru, and at 1330, Captain Gildo S. Katispati, the S-3, 
dispatch Captain Welby W. Cronk's dog company in vehicles with orders to open up the route. Following in dog company's wake came the last serial of division headquarters troops on its way to Hagaru. Less than a mile north of the perimeter, the convoy ran into a storm of rifle and automatic weapons fire from Chinese entrenched along the high ground on both sides of the road. The Marines of Dog Company piled out of their vehicles and deployed for a hot firefight, supported from Koto Ri by 81mm mortars of Captain William A. Kerr's Weapons Company. Two platoons swung around to clear the enemy from the ridge. The other platoon and the headquarters troops advanced along the road. At 1615, a platoon from Captain Goodwin C. Groff's Fox Company was ordered out to assist in evacuating casualties. But as the afternoon wore on, it grew apparent that the Chinese were in greater strength than had been anticipated, and all troops were directed to return to Koto Ri at 1735. They did so under cover of strikes by the Corsairs of VMF 312. Marine losses numbered 4 KIA or DOW and 34 WIA. Enemy casualties were estimated at 154 killed and 83 wounded, in addition to three prisoners taken from a unit identified as the 179th Regiment of the 60th CCF Division. Captured Chinese weapons included 130 rifles, 25 machine guns, and two cases of grenades. That evening, George Company 3-1, 41st Commando, Royal Marines, and Baker Company of the 31st Infantry, 7th Infantry Division, arrived at Koto Ri on their way to Hagaru. Colonel Polar and his S-3, Major Lorigan, organized the newcomers into a task force under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Drysdale, CO of the British unit, with orders to fight its way to Hagaru the following day. Luckily, the enemy did not elect to attack the overcrowded perimeter on the night of the 28th. Every warming tent was packed to capacity, and a CCF mortar round could hardly have landed anywhere without doing a good deal of damage. After a quiet night, the Chinese began the new day by digging emplacements in the hills to the west under harassing fire from F Company. The howitzers of Easy Battery and the mortars of 2-1 provided supporting fires for Task Force Drysdale when it moved out at 0945, followed by a convoy of Division Headquarters troops. A platoon of Easy Company 2-1 went along with corpsmen and ambulances to assist in evacuating any early wounded back to Koto Ri. Stubborn CCF resistance resulted in casualties from the outset, and it was 1600 before the Easy Company escort platoon got back to the perimeter. The Chinese, keeping the perimeter under observation all day, evidently concluded that the Northern Rim, defended by Easy Company, offered the best opportunity for a penetration. Marine airstrikes were called in on the Chinese swarming over the nearby high ground during the last minutes of daylight, but enemy mortar rounds hit Easy Company at 1745. They were followed by bugle calls and whistle signals as the CCF infantry attacked from the high ground to the northeast. The assault force was estimated at company strength, with the remainder of a battalion in reserve. Unfortunately for the Chinese, they had made their intentions clear all day with unusual activity in the surrounding hills, and Easy Company was not surprised. Major Clarence J. Mabry, the 2-1 executive officer, could be heard above the machine guns as he shouted encouragement to Marines who poured it into the advancing Communists. They came on with such persistence that 17 managed to penetrate within the lines, apparently to attack the warming tents. All were killed. In addition, about 150 CCF bodies lay in front of the sector when the enemy withdrew at 1855, after suffering a complete repulse. It was conjectured that the Chinese had interpreted the return of the Easy Company platoon late that afternoon as an indication that a gap in the line needed to be hastily plugged. But the supposed weak spot did not materialize, and at 19.35, the enemy signed off for the night after pumping four final mortar rounds in the vicinity of the battalion CP without doing any harm. Losses of 2-1 for the day were 6 KIA and 18 WIA, total CCF casualties being estimated at 175 killed and 200 wounded. 10 heavy machine guns, 7 LMGs, 12 Thompson submachine guns, 76 rifles, 4 pistols, 
and 500 grenades were captured. That was all at Koto Ri, where Recon Company arrived during the day to add its weight to the defense. But during intervals of silence, the sound of heavy and continuous firing to the north gave proof that Task Force Drysdale was in trouble. Convoy Reinforced by Marine Tanks Lieutenant Colonel Drysdale's plan of attack had called for his British Marines to lead out at 0930 and seize the first hill mass to the east of the road. Captain Sitter's George Company of 3-1 was to follow and pass through to attack Hill 1236 with Baker Company of the 31st Infantry in reserve. Lieutenant Colonel Sutter, assisted by his staff, had the responsibility for planning and coordinating preparatory artillery and mortar fires from Koto Ri and attaching an air liaison officer to the task force. The first hill was taken without meeting serious resistance, but Sitter came up against well-entrenched CCF troops when he attacked Hill 1236, about a mile and a half north of Koto Ri. It was nip and tuck until Master Sergeant Rocco A. Zulu fired his 3.5 rocket launcher at a range of 200 yards. Several rounds brought the Chinese out of their holes and the Marines took possession of the hill. The Commandos and George Company moved up about a mile astride of the road toward the third objective, Hill 1182. There the enemy resisted strenuously with well-placed mortar as well as machine gun fire from strong positions on the high ground. The impetus of the attack had been stopped when Sitter received orders from the task force commander to break off action, withdraw to the road, and await new instructions. Drysdale had received a message from RCT-1 at 11.30 advising him that the armor of Company D, less 2nd Platoon, 1st Tank Battalion, would be available to him at 1300. He decided to wait, therefore, and reform the column before continuing the advance. The two platoons of Company D tanks, reinforced by the tank platoon of the AT Company, RCT-5, reached Koto Ri at noon after moving out that morning from Majan Dong. Company B, 1st Tank Battalion, departed Tongjong Ni, just south of Majan Dong, but did not arrive at Koto Ri until 1500. The second platoon being attached to Sutter's battalion, the remainder of the company was directed to bring up the rear of the task force Drysdale, which by that time had renewed its attack. Thus the convoy was made up of the following components, including the elements which joined in the late afternoon of 29 November. 41 Independent Commando, Royal Marines. Estimated Strength, 235. Company G, 3-1. Estimated strength, 205. Company B, 31st Infantry, U.S. Army. Estimated strength, 190. Estimated vehicles, 22. Detachment Division Headquarters Battalion. Estimated strength, 62. Estimated vehicles, 17. Detachment First Signal Battalion. Estimated strength, 8. Estimated vehicles, 4. Detachment Seventh Motor Transport Battalion. Estimated strength, 12. Estimated vehicles, 22. Detachment Service Company, 1st Tank Battalion. Estimated strength, 18. Estimated vehicles, 31. Company B, minus, 1st Tank Battalion. Estimated strength, 86. Estimated vehicles, 23. Estimated tanks, 12. Company D, minus, 1st Tank Battalion. Estimated strength, 77. Estimated vehicles, 22. Estimated tanks, 12. Tank platoon, AT Company, RCT-5. Estimated strength, 29. Estimated tanks, 5. Total, estimated strength, 922. Estimated vehicles, 141. Estimated tanks, 29. At 1350, the head of the column had resumed the advance, with the order of march being D tanks and AT-5, 17 tanks, G-1, 22 vehicles, 41 commando, 31 vehicles, B-31, 22 vehicles, headquarters battalion, 66 vehicles, B tanks, 12 tanks. Shortly after moving out, Sitter's men were hit by heavy small arms fire from houses on the right of the road. The company commander went forward and requested the tanks to open up with their 90mm guns 
and the Chinese flushed out of the houses were destroyed by machine gun fire. Progress was slow because of the necessity of further halts while the tanks blasted out pockets of CCF resistance. Enemy mortar as well as small arms fire was encountered, and a round scored a direct hit on one of the trucks carrying personnel of 3rd Platoon of George Company, wounding every man in the vehicle. Further delays resulted while the tanks made their way over roadblocks or around craters. For the three infantry companies, the advance consisted of brief periods of movement alternated with interludes in which the troops scrambled out of the trucks to engage in firefights. Finally, about 1615, the column ground to a complete halt about four miles north of Koto Ri. At that time, the tanks of Company B were just leaving the 2-1 perimeter to join the convoy. The Fight in Hellfire Valley Drysdale and Sitter were informed by the tank officers that they thought the armor could get through, but that further movement for the trucks was inadvisable in view of road conditions and increasing enemy resistance. The task force commander requested a decision from division headquarters as to whether he should resume an advance which threatened to prove costly. It was a difficult choice for General Smith to make, but in view of the urgent necessity for reinforcements at Hagaru, he directed Drysdale to continue. The tanks had to refuel so that more time was lost. CCF fire was only moderate during this delay, thanks to the airstrikes of VMF-321 planes directed by Captain Norman Vining. When the column stopped, the vehicles had pulled off into a dry stream bed. Upon resuming the advance, unit integrity was lost and infantry elements mingled with headquarters troops. Not far south of the halfway point to Hagaru, increased enemy fire caused an abrupt halt in a long valley. The high ground rose sharply on the right of the road, while on the left a frozen creek wound through a plain several hundred yards wide, bordered by the Changjin River and wooded hills. This was Hellfire Valley, a name applied by Drysdale, and it was to be the scene of an all-night fight by half the men of the convoy. Such a possibility was far from their thoughts when they piled out of the trucks once more, as they had done repeatedly all day, to return the enemy's fire. It did not even seem significant when an enemy mortar shell set one of the trucks in flames at the far end of the valley, thus creating a roadblock and splitting the column. The enemy took advantage of the opportunity to pour in small arms and mortar fire which pinned down the troops taking cover behind vehicles or in the roadside ditches, and prevent a removal of the damaged truck. During this interlude, the head of the column, consisting of Dog Tanks, George Company, nearly three-fourths of the 41st Commando and a few Army infantrymen, continued the advance, with Drysdale in command, in obedience to orders to proceed to Hagaru at all costs. Left behind in Hellfire Valley were 61 Commandos, most of Company B, 31st Infantry, and practically all the division headquarters and service troops. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur A. Chidester, Assistant Division G-4 and senior officer caught south of the roadblock, ordered the barred vehicles to turn around and attempt to return to Koto Ri. Before his orders could be carried out, a Chinese attack severed the convoy about 200 yards to the north of him. Other enemy attacks cut the road south of the stalled convoy, both Chidester and Major James K. Egan being wounded and captured. Shallow ditches on either side of the road and the unused narrow-gauge railway were utilized by the isolated troops as protection from the fire of the Chinese, occupying the high ground rising abruptly at the right. The valley was about a mile long, covered with a frozen crust of snow, and far from affording much cover, it offered the enemy a convenient approach to the rear by way of the wide plain and frozen river. The Chinese fire was not heavy at first, but when darkness put an end to the marine airstrikes, the enemy became increasingly bolder. Even so, there was no attempt for several hours to close within grenade-throwing distance. During this interlude, the defenders had time to recover from their confusion and take defensive positions. As nearly as the scene can be reconstructed from confused and contradictory accounts, one large and three small perimeters were strung out over a distance of perhaps 1,200 yards from north to south. Toward the north, near the outskirts of the village of Pusong Ni, 
was the largest perimeter. It contained the troops caught north of the second fracture of the column and was led by Major John N. McLaughlin. His hodgepodge of 130 to 140 men included Captain Charles Peckham and part of his B Company, 31st Infantry, Warrant Officer Lloyd V. Durst, and a group of Marine MPs, some commandos, Associated Press photographer Frank Knoll, and assorted Marine Service and Headquarters troops. The three perimeters appear to have been resulted from the splintering of a larger group originally containing nearly all the men caught south of the second cut in the convoy. Major Henry J. Seeley, Division Motor Transport Officer, attempted to form a perimeter with these men but was frustrated by Chinese attacks which forced the men to fall back in small groups. About 300 yards south of McLaughlin's perimeter, the remnants of two Army platoons crouched in a drainage ditch. Apparently, several Marines, including Chief Warrant Officer D.R. Yancey, were with them. Some 30 yards farther down the ditch were Captain Michael J. Caprero, the Division PIO, First Lieutenant John A. Buck, General Craig's aide, and about 15 headquarters troops. A few other Marines clustered around Major Seeley, perhaps 100 yards south of Caprero's group. There was some hope at first that the tanks of Baker Company, 1st Tank Battalion, would come to the rescue. But the Marine armor ran into heavy opposition near Hills 1236 and 1182 along the road cleared only a few hours before by Task Force Drysdale. When attacking a convoy, the Chinese usually strove to split the motorized column into segments suitable for tactical mastication. That is what happened to Baker Company. The tanks and trucks nearest to Koto Ri got back without much trouble at 2110 after the enemy cut the column into three groups. The middle group, comprising most of the service trucks, was hit hardest. Lieutenant Colonel Harvey S. Walseth, the Division G-1, was wounded as this group finally fought back to Koto Ri at 0230 after heavy losses in trucks. This left the tank platoon which had proceeded farthest, and it formed a tight perimeter for the night about a half a mile south of Seeley's position, boxed in by friendly artillery fires from Koto Ri. At dawn, the tanks returned to Koto Ri without further enemy interference. No knowledge of these events reached the beleaguered troops in Hellfire Valley. They continued to hope that the tanks might arrive to the aid of men who had no weapons larger than a single 75mm recoilless, in addition to rifles, carbines, and grenades. There were also a few 60mm mortars, but no ammunition for them. Fortunately, no determined Chinese attacks were received up to midnight. Looting the trucks proved more alluring than fighting to the Asiatics, and their officers contented themselves with keeping the perimeters pinned down and enveloped on three sides. Not until the early hours of 30 November did the Communists resort to probing attacks by small groups armed with grenades. The headquarters and service troops gave a good account of themselves in the firefight. Signalmen, clerks, cooks, truck drivers, military policemen, the Marines of Hellfire Valley included a good many veterans of World War II, and they proved as steady as the tough combat trained commandos. Once again, the value of the Marine Corps' insistence on good basic training showed itself. Major McLaughlin sent reconnaissance parties south in an unsuccessful attempt to link up with the other perimeters. He decided, therefore, to remain in his position and fight off the Chinese until air could come on station at dawn. The wounded were placed in the deepest of the three ditches and Army medics gave first aid. As the night wore on, McLaughlin's situation became increasingly grave. By 0200, his men were out of grenades. An Army crew performed valiantly with the 75mm recoilless, firing at enemy mortar flashes until all soldiers were killed or wounded and the gun put out of action. Twice McLaughlin's men drove the Chinese from their mortars only to have them return. Some of the commandos managed to slip out of the perimeter in an effort to reach Koto Ri and summon assistance. But an attempt by Noel and two men to run the gauntlet in a jeep between 0200 and 0300 ended in their capture before they proceeded 100 yards. At about 0430, the Chinese sent their prisoners to the perimeter with a surrender demand. McLaughlin, accompanied by a commando, 
went out to parlay through an interpreter in the hope of stalling until help arrived, or at least until some of the men escaped. Initially I demanded a CCF surrender, he recalls, but it made little impression. The Marine officer stalled until the Chinese threatened to overrun the perimeter with an all-out attack. They gave him ten minutes to discuss the capitulation with his officers. McLaughlin went from one to another of the approximately 40 able-bodied men he had left. Some had no rifle ammunition at all, and none had more than eight rounds. For the sake of his wounded, he consented to surrender on condition that the serious cases be evacuated. The Chinese agreed, and the fight in Hellfire Valley ended. McLaughlin succeeded in killing enough time so that more men were given the opportunity to slip away while the enemy relaxed his vigilance during the prolonged negotiations. Largest of these groups was composed of the survivors of the three small perimeters. Caprero and Buck, both of whom were slightly wounded, managed to unite with the Army infantrymen just north of them and nine commandos, who joined them at about 0200. An hour and a half later, they linked up with the Marines under Seeley, who led the combined group in a withdrawal to the high ground across the river. Outdistancing their CCF pursuers, after shooting down several, they made it safely to Koto Ri. Other groups, including three more commandos and 71 Army infantrymen, also contrived to straggle back to the 2-1 perimeter. Although the Chinese did not keep their word as to evacuation of the wounded, they did not interfere with the removal of the more critical cases to a Korean house. When the enemy retired to the hills for the day, an opportunity was found to evacuate these casualties to Koto Ri. An accurate breakdown of the task force Drysdale casualties will probably never be made, but the following estimate is not far from the mark. Total, KIA 162, WIA 159, total battle casualties 321, lost vehicles 75. The casualties of Task Force Drysdale were heavy, commented General Smith, but by its partial success the task force made a significant contribution to the holding of Hagaru, which was vital to the division. To the slender infantry garrison of Hagaru were added a tank company of about 100 men and some 300 seasoned infantrymen. The approximately 300 troops which returned to Koto Ri participated thereafter in the defense of that perimeter. The head of the task force Drysdale Column, with the Company D tanks leading George Company and the commandos, was not aware at dusk on the 29th that the convoy had been cut behind them. There had been previous gaps during the stops and starts, caused by enemy fire, and it was supposed at first that the thin-skinned vehicles would catch up with the vanguard. Progress was fairly good, despite intermittent fire from the high ground on the right of the road, until the tanks reached a point about 2,200 yards from Hagaru. There the column was stopped by concentrated CCF mortar and small arms fire. One of the tanks was so damaged by a satchel charge that it had to be abandoned, and several vehicles were set afire. After Drysdale was wounded, the command passed to Sitter, who formed his force into a perimeter until the repulse of the Chinese permitted the march to be resumed. Several pyramidal tents just outside the Hagaru perimeter were assumed to be occupied by friendly troops until enemy in the vicinity destroyed two George Company trucks and caused several casualties. Later it was learned that the tents had been originally occupied by troops of the 10th Engineer Battalion and abandoned when the Chinese attacked on the 28th. At 1915, Captain Sitter reported to Lt. Col. Ridge, who directed that George Company and the 41st Commando spend the night in the perimeter reserve. After their all-day fight, the men of the column could scarcely believe their eyes when they saw the Marine engineers at work on the airstrip under the floodlights. Contrary to expectations, the hours of darkness on 29 to 30 November passed in comparative quiet at Hagaru except for CCF harassing fires. It was not a coincidence that the enemy kept his distance. Attacks on the East Hill and Item and Howe Company positions of 3-1 actually had been planned and partly executed by troops of the 58th CCF Division, according to POW testimony. They were broken up by marine air attacks and supporting fires which hit the assembly areas. 
The effectiveness of these fires owed a good deal to the intelligence brought back by Lieutenant Carey, the Battalion S-2, by CIC agents who circulated among Chinese troops on 27 and 28 November. The Battalion S-2 had a work table at the CP beside Major Simmons, the SAC, who directed six sorties of the night hecklers of VMFN 542. He guided the planes through the darkness to their targets with a fiery arrow as converging machine gun tracer bullets crossed over suspected CCF assembly areas. The 81mm Mortars of Weapons Company, 3-1, fired about 1,100 rounds during the night, and the corresponding unit of 2-7 made a noteworthy contribution. The following day, according to Carey, Chinese prisoners reported that most of the units employed around Hagaru were very badly hit. A few white phosphorus mortar rounds fell on the lines of Howe and Item companies, and a CCF green flare caused an alert for an attack which never materialized. In the early morning hours of the 30th, an enemy concentration appeared to be taking place on the Item Company front, but intensive 60mm mortar fire put an end to that threat. Attack of George Company on East Hill At 0800, the battalion commander ordered George Company to retake East Hill while the commandos remained in reserve. Sitter's plan called for his 1st and 2nd platoons, commanded by 2nd Lieutenants Frederick W. Hopkins and John W. Jagger, respectively, to pass through Myers Group, then make a sharp left turn and attack on either side of the ridge. 1st Lieutenant Carl E. Dennis's 3rd platoon and two platoons of Able Company engineers were to follow in reserve. Slow progress caused the George Company commander to modify the plan by giving his 3rd platoon and the two engineer platoons the mission of enveloping the CCF right flank. Lieutenant Dennis led the attack, with 1st Lieutenant Ernest P. Skelts and Lieutenant Canzona's engineer platoons following. Neither of the George Company attacks was successful. The trampling of hundreds of feet over the snow had made the footing more treacherous than ever, and once again the combination of difficult terrain and long-range Chinese fire accounted for failure to retake East Hill. Sitter's request to set up defense positions on the ground previously occupied by Myers was granted. Meanwhile, Dennis's platoon and the engineers were directed to withdraw to the foot of the hill so that the Corsairs could work the CCF positions over with rockets and bombs. End of chapter 11, part 1, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 11, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Task Force Drysdale. High-Level Command Conference Although the Marines at Hagaru had little to do with the higher levels of strategy, it was evident that the continued retreat of the 8th Army in West Korea must ultimately affect the destinies of 10 Corps. Of more immediate concern was the deteriorating situation of the three battalions, two infantry and one artillery, of the 7th Infantry Division east of the Chosen Reservoir. Brigadier General Henry I. Hodes, Assistant Division Commander, informed General Smith at noon on the 29th that the Army troops had suffered approximately 400 casualties while falling back toward Hagaru and were unable to fight their way out to safety. At 2027 that night, all troops in the Chosen Reservoir area, including the three Army battalions, were placed under the operational control of the Marine Commander by 10 Corps. The 1st Marine Division was directed to redeploy one RCT without delay from Udemni area to Hagaru area, gain contact with elements of the 7th Infantry Division E of Chosen Reservoir, coordinate all forces in and north of Hagaru in a perimeter defense based on Hagaru, open and secure Hagaru Kotori MSR. On the afternoon of the 30th, a command conference was held at Hagaru in the Division CP. Generals Almond, Smith, Barr, and Hodes were informed at the briefing session that a disaster threatened the three Army battalions. Allman was also much concerned about the attacks on the Marine MSR. 
He had been given a first-hand account that morning by the senior Marine officer on the 10 Corps staff, Colonel Edward H. Forney, who had just returned from Koto Ri. At the Hagaru conference, the 10 Corps commander announced that he had abandoned any idea of consolidating positions in the chosen reservoir area. Stressing the necessity for speed in falling back toward Hamhung, he promised Smith resupply by air after authorizing him to burn or destroy all equipment which would delay his withdrawal to the seacoast. The Marine General replied that his movements must be governed by his ability to evacuate his wounded. He would have to fight his way out, he added, and could not afford to discard equipment. It was his intention, therefore, to bring out the bulk of it. Allman directed Smith and Barr to draw up a plan and time schedule for extricating the Army battalions east of the reservoir. Those two generals agreed, however, that not much could be done until the Udum Ni Marines arrived at Hagaru, and the conference ended on an inconclusive note. That same afternoon, 10 Corps Operation Order 8-50 was received. It defined the Corps mission as maintaining contact with the enemy to the maximum capability consistent with cohesive action oriented to the Hamhung Hungnam base of operation. The decision to concentrate 10 Corps forces in that area meant the evacuation of Wansan. General Harris lost no time in directing MAG-12 to move from Wansan Airfield to Yanpo. Hedron-12 and three combat squadrons began shifting personnel and equipment at once. Transfer of the aircraft was completed on 1 December. In many instances, the planes took off on combat missions from Wansan and landed at Yanpo so that the ground forces were not deprived of air support. High-level naval commanders were already preparing for an evacuation of Northeast Korea if matters came to the worst. Admiral Joy foresaw as early as the 28th that if the retreat of the battered 8th Army continued, 10 Corps would have to choose between falling back and being outflanked. In view of the time needed to collect the enormous quantities of shipping required, he warned Admiral Doyle on that date that a large-scale redeployment operation might be necessary. Doyle in turn directed his staff to commence planning for redeployment either by an administrative outloading or by a fighting withdrawal. CCF attacks of 1 December at Hagaru. During the early hours of darkness on 30 November, it appeared that Hagaru might have a second quiet night. Three bugle calls were heard by item company at 2015, and the enemy sent up a green flare an hour later but no unusual CCF activity was reported until 23.30, when small patrols began probing for weak spots in the item company lines. The enemy could scarcely have chosen a less rewarding area for such research. As usual, Lt. Fisher had built up an elaborate system of concertinas, trip flares, and booby traps, and his sandbag foxholes and weapons emplacements afforded his men maximum protection. At midnight, when the enemy came on in strength, each successive assault wave shattered against the terrific firepower which a Marine rifle company, aided by artillery, tanks, 81mm mortars, and heavy machine guns, could concentrate. Several times the enemy's momentum carried him to the item company foxholes, but no communists lived to exploit their advantage. On one of these occasions, Sergeant Charles V. Davidson, having expended his ammunition, Prove that cold steel has its uses by bayoneting the last of his attackers. Again, as on the night of the 28th, the enemy had chosen to launch his major attack against marine strength, though his daytime observation must have disclosed the preparations for a hot reception in the item company sector. An estimated 500 to 750 Chinese were killed on this front at a cost to Fisher's men of 2 KIA and 10 WIA. The Chinese also repeated themselves by carrying out another attack on East Hill, which ended in a second costly stalemate. The western slope up to the military crest was held by the following units from right to left. First Lieutenant Ermine L. Meeker's 1st Platoon of Baker Company Engineers, 2nd, 1st, and 3rd Platoons of George Company, and Lieutenant Skelt's 3rd Platoon of Avo Company Engineers. To the left of Skelt, near the foot of the hill, were Lt. Canzona's 1st Platoon of Able Engineers, two tanks of the AT Company, 2-7, and elements of Lt. Col. Banks's 1st Service Battalion. 
The action began shortly before midnight with one of those comedy situations which develop on the grimmest occasions. The sign or password was Abraham and the countersign Lincoln, but two Company A engineers on a listening post did not pause for the customary exchange. Having been jumped by what their startled eyes took to be a Chinese regiment, they sprinted downhill yelling, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, as they slid into scouts' lines with the enemy close behind. His engineers had no leisure for a laugh. Within a few seconds, they were mixing it in a wild melee with communists who seemed literally to drop on them from above. Meanwhile, George Company was hard hit by well-aimed mortar fire which threatened to wipe out Lt. Hopkins' 1st platoon. The ensuing double-headed CCF attack bent back the left flank of George Company, with both the 1st and 3rd platoons giving ground. On the left, Skelt's platoon was pushed down to the foot of the hill by superior enemy numbers after exactly half of his 28 men were killed or wounded. Here the fight continued with Banks' service troops lending a hand until the Chinese were exterminated. This penetration was a hollow triumph for the enemy. No friendly forces being left in the center, the Howe Battery howitzers walked shells up and down the western slope. Mortars and machine guns chimed in, and Lt. Canzona's platoon was in position to direct the fire of the two tanks of A.T. Company 2-7. The scene became bright as day after an enemy artillery shell set 50 drums of gasoline ablaze in a supply area dump. Like an enormous torch, the flames illuminated the battle so vividly that General Smith looked on from the doorway of his CP, some 1,200 yards away. Several bullets pierced the roof and walls during the night. Again, as in the fight of 28-29 to 29 November, Marine firepower blocked the gap on the central and northwest slopes of East Hill. Marine and Army service troops took a part in the fighting, which is the more creditable considering that they were ordered out in the middle of the night, placed in a provisional unit with strange troops, and marched off into the darkness to attack or defend at some critical point. Lt. Meeker's engineer platoon, on the right of George Company, had a long-drawn firefight but got off with losses of one man killed and three wounded. At 0100, the CCF pressure on Sitter's troops was so heavy that Lt. Carey, former commander of the 1st Platoon, was taken from his S-2 duties to lead a group of reinforcements which he described as all available hands from the CP or any other units in Hagaru who could spare personnel. Carrying as much ammunition as possible, he arrived at the George Company CP to find Sitter still commanding in spite of his wound. Scarcely a full squad was left of Carey's old outfit when he helped to restore the lines. It was necessary for Ridge to send a further reinforcement consisting of British Marines of the 41st Commando before George Company's left flank was secured. A counterattack at daybreak regained lost ground and the situation was well under control when air came on station at 0900. Thus ended another night of confusion and frustration for both sides on East Hill. While the Chinese attack had been better organized and in larger force than the effort of the 29th, it was too little and too late for decisive results in spite of heavy losses. On the other hand, George Company and its reinforcing elements had suffered an estimated 60 men killed and wounded. Although the Marines of Hagaru could not have suspected it on the morning of 1 December, the enemy had, for the time being, shot his bolt. His first two large-scale attacks, as POW interrogations were to confirm, had used up not only the personnel of a division, but most of the limited supplies of ammunition available. Thus it is probable that the following estimates of CCF casualties, as published in the 3-1 report, for the period of 28 November to 5 December, were nearer to accuracy than most such summaries. 1. 58th CCF Division Estimated casualties of 3,300 for the 172nd Regiment, 1,750 each for the 173rd and 174th Regiments. 2. 59th CCF Division. Estimated 1,750 casualties for the 176th Regiment. No other units identified. The known Chinese dead in the two night battles amounted to at least 1,500 and if it may be assumed that three or four times that number were wounded, 
The total casualties would have crippled an enemy infantry division of 7,500 to 10,000 men, plus an additional regiment. Considering the primitive state of CCF resupply and medical service, moreover, it is likely that hundreds died of wounds and privations behind their own lines. The losses of 3-1 at Hagaru were given as 33 KIA, 10 DOW, 2 MIA, and 270 WIA, a total of 315 battle casualties, nearly all of which were incurred from 28 November to 1 December. There are no overall casualty figures for Marines or Army service troops, but it is probable that their total losses exceeded those of 3-1. Rescue of U.S. Army Wounded Casualties estimated as high as 75% were suffered by the three U.S. Army battalions east of the reservoir. At 2200 on the night of 1 December, the first survivors, most of them walking wounded, reached the Marine lines north of Hagaru with tales of frightful losses suffered in the five days of continual fighting since the first CCF attack on the night of 27 to 28 November. Following this action, Colonel Alan D. McLean, commanding the 31st Infantry, had set up a perimeter near Sin Hung Ni with the 3rd Battalion of his regiment and the 1st Battalion of the 57th Field Artillery. Along the shore farther to the north, Lt. Col. Don C. Faith, U.S. Army, held a separate perimeter with the 1st Battalion, 32nd Infantry. Both positions were hard hit by the Chinese on the night of 27 to 28 November and isolated from each other. During the next 24 hours, they beat off CCF attacks with the support of Marine and Fief planes, and Faith fought his way through to a junction with the Sinhung Ni force. When the senior officer was killed, Faith took command of all three battalions. Immobilized by nearly 500 casualties, he remained in the Sinhung Ni perimeter, where he was supplied by air. On the 29th, General Hode sent a relief force and company strength from 31st Infantry units in the area just north of Hagaru. These troops, supported by several Army tanks, were hurled back by superior CCF numbers with the loss of two tanks and heavy personnel casualties. On 1 December, fearing that he would be overwhelmed in his Sinhung Ni perimeter, Faith attempted to break through to Hagaru. After destroying the howitzers and all but the most essential equipment, the convoy with its hundreds of wounded moved out under the constant cover of Marine close air support, controlled by Captain Edward P. Stamford, USMC. Progress was slow and exhausting, with frequent stops for firefights. There were many instances of individual bravery in the face of adversity, but losses of officers and NCOs gradually deprived the units of leadership. As an added handicap, a large portion of the troops were rocks who understood no English. The task force came near to a breakout. At dusk, it was only four and a half miles from Hagaru when Faith fell mortally wounded and the units shattered into leaderless groups. Soon the column had ceased to exist as a military force. A tragic disintegration set in as wounded and frostbitten men made their way over the ice of the reservoir in wretched little bands drawn together by a common misery rather than discipline. By a miracle, the first stragglers to reach Hagaru got through the minefields and trip flares without harm. Before dawn, a total of about 670 survivors of Task Force Faith had been taken into the warming tents of Hagaru. Lieutenant Colonel Beal, commanding officer of the 1st Motor Transport Battalion, made a personal search in the morning for other survivors. Finding more than his jeep could carry, he organized a task force of trucks, jeeps, and sleds. The only CCF opposition to the Marines came in the form of long-distance sniping, which grew so troublesome late in the afternoon that the trucker set up a machine gun section on the ice for protection. Far from hindering the escape of the Army wounded, the Chinese actually assisted in some instances, thus adding to the difficulty of understanding the Oriental mentality. Of the 319 soldiers rescued by Beale on 2 December, nearly all were wounded or frostbitten. Some were found wandering about in aimless circles on the ice in a state of shock. A company-sized task force of army troops from Hagaru, supported by tanks, moved out that day to bring in any organized units of the three shattered battalions which might have been left behind. 
Known as Task Force Anderson after Lieutenant Colonel Barry K. Anderson, the senior army officer at Hagaru, the column met heavy CCF opposition and was recalled when it became evident that only stragglers remained. Beale and his men kept up their rescue work until the last of an estimated 1,050 survivors from the original 2,500 troops had been saved. A Marine reconnaissance patrol counted more than 300 dead in the abandoned trucks of the Task Force Faith Convoy, and there were apparently hundreds of MIA. The 385 able-bodied soldiers who reached Hagaru were organized into a provisional battalion and provided with Marine equipment. First Landings on Hagaru Airstrip Casualty evacuation had become such a problem by 1 December that Captain Eugene R. Herring, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, the division surgeon, called at General Smith's CP that morning. He reported that some 600 casualties at Hagaru were putting a severe strain on the limited facilities of C&E companies of the 1st Medical Battalion. It was further estimated that 500 casualties were being brought in by the UDEMNI units and 400 from the three Army battalions east of the reservoir. Although both figures were to prove far too low, they seemed alarmingly high at a time when only the most critical casualties could be evacuated by helicopter or OY. Flying in extreme cold and landing at high altitudes where the aircraft had less than normal lift, the pilots of Major Gottschalk's VMO-6 saved scores of lives. From 27 November to 1 December, when the transports took over, 152 casualties were evacuated by the OYs and helicopters, 109 from Udemni, 36 from Hagaru, and 7 from Kotori. Altogether, 220 evacuation flights and 11 rescue missions were completed during the entire reservoir campaign by a squadron which on 1 November included 25 officers, 95 enlisted men, 8 OY-2 and 2 L-5G observation planes, and 9 HO-3S-1 Sikorsky helicopters. First Lieutenant Robert A. Longstaff was killed by enemy small arms fire near Toktong Pass while on an evacuation flight and both Captain Farish and Lieutenant Englehart had their helicopters so badly riddled by CCF bullets that the machines were laid up for repairs. Two surgical teams from Hungnam had been flown to Hagaru by helicopter, but the evacuation problem remained so urgent on 1 December that the command of the 1st Marine Division authorized a trial landing on the new airstrip. Only 40% completed at this time, the runway was 2,900 feet long and 50 feet wide, with a 2% grade to the north. It was a tense moment at 14.30 that afternoon when the knots of parka-clad marine spectators watched the wheels of the first FIF C-47 hit the frozen, snow-covered strip. The big two-motored aircraft bounced and lurched its way over the rough surface, but the landing was a success. An even more nerve-wracking test ensued half an hour later when the pilot took off with 24 casualties. It seemed for a breath-snatching instant that the run wouldn't be long enough for the machine to become airborne, but at last the tail lifted and the wings got enough bite to clear the hills to the south. Three more planes landed that afternoon, taking off with about 60 more casualties. The last arrival, heavily loaded with ammunition, collapsed its landing gear on the bumpy strip and had to be destroyed and abandoned. At the other end of the evacuation chain, Clearing stations had been established by Ten Corps at Yanpo Airfield to receive and distribute casualties. A 30-day evacuation policy was maintained, and the casualties to remain in the area went to the 1st Marine Division Hospital in Hungnam, the Army 121st Evacuation Hospital in Hamhung, and the USS Consolation in Hungnam Harbor. Casualties requiring more than 30 days of hospitalization were flown from Yanpo to Japan, though a few critical cases were evacuated directly from Hagaru to Japan. It was planned for incoming transports at Hagaru to fly both supplies and troop replacements. Meanwhile, on 1 December, the 1st Marine Division had its first C-119 airdrop from Japan. Known as Baldwins, these drops consisted of a prearranged quantity of small arms ammunition, weapons, water, rations, and medical supplies, though the amounts could be modified as desired. The airdrops, however, did not have the capability of supplying an RCT in combat, let alone a division. 
At this time, the Combat Cargo Command, FIF, estimated its delivery capabilities at only 70 tons per day, and even though in practice this total was stepped up to 100, it fell five short of the requirements of an RCT. Fortunately, the foresight of the division commander and staff had enabled the supply regulating detachment to build up a level of six days rations and two units of fire at Hagaru. This backlog, plus such quantities as could be delivered by Baldwin drops, promised to see the division through the emergency. Infantrymen are seldom given to self-effacement, but at nightfall on 1 December, only an ungrateful gravel cruncher could have failed to pay a silent tribute to the other services as well as to the supporting arms of the Marine Corps. Navy medics, FIF airmen, Army service units, they had all helped to make it possible for the Marines to plan a breakout. Yet it is likely that the 1st Engineer Battalion came first in the affections of wounded men being loaded in the C-47s for evacuation. In just 12 days and nights, the engineers of Company D had hacked this airstrip out of the frozen earth. Marine infantrymen could never forget the two critical nights of battle when they looked back over their shoulders from combat areas at the heartening spectacle of the dozers puffing and huffing under the floodlights. In a pinch, Lt. Col. Partridge's specialists had doubled as riflemen, too, and several platoons were riddled with casualties. Thanks in large part to the engineers, the Hagaru base was no longer isolated on 1 December. And though the enemy did not yet realize it, he had lost the initiative on this eventful Friday. The Marines at Udemni were coming out, and they were coming out fighting with their casualties and equipment. End of Chapter 11, Part 2 Read by Aaron Bennett Chapter 12, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Breakout from Udam Ni The first steps toward regaining the initiative were taken by the Marine Command as early as 29 November. Upon being informed that the composite battalion had failed to open up the MSR south of Udam Ni, General Smith concluded that it was a task for a regiment. At 1545 that afternoon, he issued the following orders to RCTs 5 and 7. RCT 5 Assume Responsibility Protection Udam Ni Area Adjusting Present Dispositions Accordingly. RCT 7 Conduct Operations Clear MSR to Hagaru without delay, employ an entire regiment. That same evening, the Division CP received 10 Corps OI-19, providing that an RCT be redeployed from the Udam Ni area to Hagaru. No further directives from Division were necessary to implement this instruction, since it had been anticipated in General Smith's orders. Upon receipt, the two Udam Ni regimental commanders began joint planning for measures to be taken. The unusual command situation at Udam Ni, in the absence of the assistant division commander, was explained by Colonel Litzenberg. The 5th and 7th Marines were each acting under separate orders from the division. The division would issue orders to one regiment with information to the other, so that division retained the control, and, of course, the 4th Battalion, 11th Marines, in general support of both regiments, was not actually under the control of either of us. Lt. Col. Murray operated in very close coordination with me, sometimes at his own command post and sometimes at mine. We called in Major McReynolds, the commander of 411, discussed the situation with him, and thereafter Lt. Col. Murray and I issued orders jointly as necessary. This command arrangement functioned very well. There was never any particular disagreement. For purposes of planning the supporting fires for the breakout, an artillery groupment was formed and Lt. Col. Freehand given the responsibility of coordination. It was further agreed that no airdrops of 155mm ammunition would be requested because of the greater number of 105mm rounds which could be received with fewer difficulties. The problems of the two RCTs, commented General Smith, could not be separated. The only feasible thing for them to do was pool their resources, 
The assignment of command to the senior regimental commander was considered but rejected in favor of cooperation. At 0600 on the 30th, the two RCTs issued their Joint Operation Order 1-50, which called for the regroupment of the UDM knee forces in a new position south of the village and astride the MSR as a first step toward a breakout. Thus, in effect, the two RCTs and supporting troops would be exchanging an east and west perimeter for one pointing from north to south along the road to Hagaru. Not only was the terrain south of the village more defensible, but a smaller perimeter would serve the purpose. Lieutenant Colonel Weinkoff, Assistant G3 of the division, flew to Udemni on the 30th to observe and report on the situation. He was given a copy of Joint Operation Order 1-50 for delivery to General Smith on his return to Hagaru. That same afternoon, during a conference with General Almond at Hagaru, the Marine commander received 10 Corps Operation Order 8, directing him to operate against the enemy in zone, withdrawing elements north and northwest of Hagaru to that area while securing the Sudong Hagaru MSR. And at 19.20 that evening, Division issued the following dispatch orders to RCTs 5 and 7. Expedite execution of Joint Operation Order 1-50 and combined movement RCT 5 and RCT 7 to Hagaru, prepared for further withdrawal south. Destroy any supplies and equipment which must be abandoned during this withdrawal. As a prerequisite, a good deal of reorganization had to be effected at Udem Ni. In order to provide a force to hold the shoulders of the high ground through which RCT-7 would advance, it was decided to put together another composite battalion. The new unit consisted of George Company 37, Abel Company 15, and the remnants of Dog and Easy Companies 27, combined into a provisional company under Captain Robert J. Polson, a section of 81s each from 27 and 37 weapons companies, and a communications detachment from 37. Major Maurice E. Roach, Regimental S-4, placed in command, realized that such a jury-rigged outfit might be subject to morale problems. Noting that one of the men had made a neckerchief out of a torn green parachute, he seized upon the idea as a means of appealing to unit pride. Soon all the men were sporting green neckerchiefs, and Roach gave the new unit added distinction by christening it the Damnation Battalion after adopting Damnation as the code word. Beginning in the early morning hours of the 30th, regroupment was the chief activity at Udem Ni. Enemy opposition during the night took the form of scattered small arms fire varied with minor probing attacks. This comparative lull lasted until 0710, when Item Company of 35 beat off an enemy assault on Hill 1282, North Ridge, with the support of Marine airstrikes and 81mm mortar fire. In the same area, George Company had a brisk firefight from 1315 to dusk. The plan of the regroupment envisioned a gradual withdrawal from the north and west of Udem Ni by RCT-5 for the purpose of relieving units of RCT-7 and enabling them to extend the perimeter southward from the village. It fell at 2-5 to execute the most difficult maneuver of the day. Royce's battalion held a line stretching from Hill 1426 on Southwest Ridge along the high ground to 3-5's position on Hill 1282. After disengaging with the help of Marine Air and Artillery, 2-5 gave up Hill 1426 and pulled back nearly a mile, relieving elements of 3-7 on the left. Royce's new line included Hill 1294 on the southwest ridge, overlooking the MSR, and extended northeast to Hill 1282 as before. Meanwhile, 1-5 continued to hold a defensive line from Hill 1240 eastward to Hill 1167. These movements freed 3-7 to redeploy to new positions astride the MSR about 4,000 yards south of Udam Ni. In this same general area, 1-7 continued to block the valley to the southwest while holding Hill 1276 of South Ridge, about 2,500 yards south of the village. The question of whether we should make these movements during daylight or at night was a difficult one, said Colonel Litzenberg. We finally decided to make the movements in daylight when we could have advantage of observation from air cover and artillery. The movement, piecemeal by battalion, was successfully executed. The enemy took surprisingly little advantage of the adjustment. 
Movements were completed in an orderly and methodical manner as the units drew rations and ammunition for the breakout. Preparations were made for the destruction of all equipment which could not be carried out, and airdrops of ammunition and other supplies were received. As a solution for the problem of casualty evacuation, General Smith had suggested the construction of an OI strip. A start was made at 0900 on the 30th by the TD-18 dozers of Major McReynolds' artillery battalion, but the area came under enemy fire the next day, and the nearly completed strip could be used only twice. Joint Planning for Breakout The plan, as finally agreed upon, called for a combination of the two solutions. Since it was essential to relieve hard-pressed Fox Company and secure vital Toktong Pass prior to the arrival of the main column, one force would advance across country. And since it would have been physically impossible to carry the wounded over the mountains, the main body would fight its way along the road to Toktong Pass. The overall plan for the Udemni breakout, after being flown to Hagaru by helicopter for General Smith's approval, was incorporated into Joint Operation Order 2-50. This directive, later modified by fragmentary orders, was issued in the morning of 1 December 1950. It meant dispensing with the vehicles and heavy equipment of the cross-country force. Only the barest military necessities could be taken by men loaded down with ammunition while struggling through snowdrifts. The unit selected for the attempt was the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, commanded by Lt. Col. Davis. The plan of maneuver called for him to strike off across the mountaintops under cover of darkness on the night of 1 December. As other units moved out astride the MSR from Udemni to Hagaru, 3-5 was to be the advance guard. Lt. Col. Taplett's battalion had the mission of passing through 3-7 to seize the commanding ground on both sides of the road and lead the way for the rest of the Udemni troops. Thus, the attacks of 1-7 and 3-5 would converge in the general area of Fox Hill and Toktong Pass. The point of the advance was to be the only Marine tank to reach Udem Ni while the MSR was still open. It was left stranded after the recall of the crew to Hagaru, but Staff Sergeant Russell A. Munsell and another crewman were flown up from Hagaru by helicopter by Colonel Litzenberg's request. They were to man tank D-23 when it moved out with the point. Plans also called for a battery of 311 to advance near the head of the column so that it could go into position near Sinhung Ni and provide covering fires for the rear guard while other artillery units displaced. The 4th Battalion of the 11th Marines had orders to fire most of its 155mm ammunition before departure. All the men who could be spared from this unit were formed into nine provisional infantry platoons. Two were assigned to reinforce the 7th Marines and three to the 5th Marines. Four were retained under Major McReynolds' command to protect the flanks of the vehicle train. It was further prescribed that the guns of 411 were to bring up the rear of the convoy so that the road would not be blocked in the event of any of its vehicles becoming immobilized. Only drivers and seriously wounded men were permitted to ride the trucks in the middle of the column along with critical equipment and supplies. Since all additional space in the vehicles would doubtless be needed for casualties incurred in the breakout as well as Fox Company casualties, it was decided not to bring out the dead from Udem Ni. A field burial was conducted by chaplains for 85 officers and men. All available marine aircraft were to be on station. Moreover, carrier planes of TF-77 had been released from other missions by the 5th Air Force to reinforce the aircraft of the 1st Ma in direct support of the Udem Ni troops. The Fight for Hills 1419 and 1542 The transition from planning to execution began on the morning of 1 December. Only the 1st and 3rd Battalions of RCT-5 were left to the north of Udem Ni, and pulling them out was to prove equivalent to letting loose of the tiger's tail. The 3rd Battalion began its withdrawal at 0800, followed 90 minutes later by the 1st. The initial phases of the maneuver were carried out without great difficulty. The first major problem came when 3-5's last unit, George Company, pulled down from Hill 1282. There the Marines had been in such close contact with the enemy that grenades were the main weapon of both sides. 
The problem of preventing the Chinese from swarming over the top of the ridge at the critical moment and pursuing the Marines down the slope was solved by First Lieutenant Daniel Green, the FAC, with a dummy run by close supporting aircraft. While the first pass of the Corsairs kept the Communists down, Captain Chester R. Hermanson commenced his withdrawal. As soon as his men moved out at a safe distance, he signaled to the FAC, who called for live runs of marine air in coordination with the fires directed by the artillery liaison officer, First Lieutenant Henry G. Ammer. First Lieutenant Arthur E. House's 81mm mortar platoon also rendered skillful support during the withdrawal. The ancient ruse was so successful that George Company disengaged without a single casualty. Ammunition left behind by the rifle platoons was detonated just as the rockets, bombs, and napalm of the Corsairs hit the Chinese, followed by artillery and mortar shells. Hill 1282 seemed to erupt in one tremendous explosion. While Captain Hermanson's men crossed the bridge south of the burning town, an engineer demolitions crew waited to destroy the span. The rear guard unit for the withdrawal of the two battalions was 1st Lieutenant John R. Hancock's Baker Company of 1-5. He felt that his best chance would be to sneak off Hill 1240. Accordingly, he requested that no supporting fires be furnished by Baker Company, except at his request. Making very effective use of his light machine guns to cover his withdrawal with a spray of fire, Hancock disengaged without a casualty. The next stage of the regroupment was carried out in preparation for the attacks of 3-5 and 1-7. In order to clear the way on both sides of the MSR, 3-7, minus Howe Company, moved out at 0900 on 1 December to attack Hill 1542, while Howe Company went up against Hill 1419. Joint Operation Order 1-50 was modified, meanwhile, by verbal instructions directing 2-5 instead of 3-5 to relieve 1-7 on Hill 1276, thus freeing Colonel Davis's battalion for its assigned mission. The 1st Battalion of RCT-5 took position stretching from Hill 1100 on the west side of the MSR to the low ground southeast of the arm of the reservoir. This meant that after 3-7 minus seized Hill 1542, three Marine Infantry battalions would occupy a defensive line about three and a half miles in length, stretching diagonally northeast from that position to the arm of the reservoir, with Hill 1276 as its central bastion. Shortly before dusk, Lt. Col. Taplett's 3-5 arrived in position to pass through Lt. Col. Harris's 3-7. The two battalion commanders agreed that 3-5 would execute the movement even though 3-7 had not yet secured its objectives, and 3-5 attacked astride the MSR at 1500. Harris's battalion had been having it hot and heavy all day on hills 1419 and 1542 after jumping off at 0900. These objectives were too far apart for a mutually supported attack and the Chinese defended the difficult terrain with tenacity. Item Company, reinforced by artillerymen and headquarters troops, made slow progress west of the road against the Chinese dug in on Hill 1542. At 1700, George Company moved into position on the left. Both companies attempted an assault, but the 3-7 report states, each attack by I Company and G Company never reached full momentum before it was broken up. One platoon of Item Company reached the military crest before being repulsed. When night fell, the Marines were still on the eastern slopes of 1542. On Hill 1419, about 1,000 yards east of the road, Howe Company of 3-7 met stiff opposition from Chinese dug in along four finger ridges as well as the main spur leading to the topographical crest. It became evident that Howe Company alone could not seize the hill and about noon Abel Company of Davis's battalion joined the attack on Howe's left. The heavy undergrowth gave concealment to the enemy, though it also offered footholds for the Marines scrambling up the steep and icy slopes. Airstrikes were laid down just ahead of them, blasting the Chinese with bombs, rockets, and 20mm fire. Artillery support, however, was limited by the relative blindness of the forward observer in the brush, but mortars succeeded in knocking out several enemy positions. Howe Company's attack had come to a standstill because of casualties, which included Lieutenant Harris. 
First Lieutenant Eugenius M. Hovatter's Able Company regained the momentum thanks to the efforts of First Lieutenant Leslie C. Williams' 1st Platoon. Aided by Howe and Baker, which was committed late in the afternoon, Able Company secured Hill 1419 about 1930. Thus, the jump-off point for the 1-7 advance across the mountaintops had been seized. After setting up hasty defenses, Davis directed that all dead and wounded be evacuated to 3-5's aid station on the road. Howe Company was attached to his battalion by order of Colonel Litzenberg, since all units had been thinned by casualties. Then the battalion tail was pulled up the mountain and the last physical tie broken with other Marine units in the Udemni area. The Marines had seized the initiative, never again to relinquish it during the Chosen Reservoir campaign. March of 1-7 over the mountains. Planning at the battalion level was done by Davis, his executive officer, Major Raymond V. Friedrich, and his S-3, Major Thomas B. Tigge. It was decided to take only two of the 81mm mortars and six heavy machine guns. They were to be manned with double crews so that enough ammunition could be carried to keep them in action. Pack set radios, ANGRC-9, were to provide positive communications in case the portable sets, SCR-300, would not reach the Udemni perimeter. The artillery liaison officer was to carry a pack set, SCR-610, to ensure artillery communications. All personnel not sick or wounded were to participate, leaving behind enough walking wounded or frostbite cases to drive the vehicles and move the gear left behind with the regimental train. Extra litters were to be taken, each serving initially to carry additional mortar and machine gun ammunition, and all men were to carry sleeping bags not only for the protection of the wounded, but also to save their own lives if the column should be cut off in the mountains for several days. Every man was to start the march with an extra bandolier of small arms ammunition, and personnel of the reserve company and headquarters group were to carry an extra round of 81mm mortar ammunition up the first mountain for replenishment of supplies depleted at that point. After driving the enemy from the topographical crest of Hill 1419, the four companies were not permitted a breathing spell. Davis feared the effects of the extreme, 16 degree below zero, cold on troops drenched with sweat from clawing their way up the mountain. He pressed the reorganization with all possible speed, therefore, after no enemy contacts were reported by patrols ranging to the southeast. At 2100 on the night of 1 December, the column set out in this order. Baker Company, 1st Lieutenant Kirkaba, 1-7 Command Group, Lieutenant Colonel Davis, Abel Company, 1st Lieutenant Hovatter, Charlie Company, Captain Morris, Headquarters Group, Major Friedrich, Howe Company, 2nd Lieutenant Newton. The night was dark, but a few stars showed over the horizon in the general direction to be taken. They served as a guide, with a prominent rock mass being designated the first objective. The snow-covered peaks all looked alike in the darkness, and the guide stars were lost to sight when the column descended into valleys. Repeated compass orientations of the map examined by flashlight under a poncho never checked out. The artillery was called upon to place white phosphorus on designated hills, but the splash of these rounds could seldom be located. The point was slowed by the necessity of breaking trail in snow that had drifted knee-deep in places. After a path had been beaten, the icy footing became treacherous for the heavily burdened Marines. Some painful falls were taken on the downhill slopes by men who had to climb the finger ridges on hands and knees. Apparently, the enemy had been caught by a complete surprise, for the Marines had the desolate area to themselves. A more immediate danger was loss of direction, and the head of the column veered off to the southwest while crossing the second valley. A drift in this direction would eventually take the battalion toward the enemy-held road to Hagaru, which had been scheduled by the Marine artillery for harassing and interdiction fires. Radio failures kept Kirkaba at the point from receiving messages sent in warning. An attempt was made to communicate by word of mouth, but the shouts from behind often did not penetrate to ears protected from the cold by parka hoods. At last, the loss of direction became so alarming that Davis himself hurried forward with his radio operator and runner. In the darkness, he lost touch with them and floundered on alone, 
panting and stumbling. It took such effort to overtake the point that he did not make it until the men were scrambling up the next steep ridge. There the westward drift was corrected just in time, for the battalion was running into its first CCF position. The column had been heading uphill 1520, the eastern and western slopes of which were held by the enemy. An increasing volume of small arms fire was received as Davis gave his company commanders orders to reorganize units in preparation for attack. Exhausted though the men were, they summoned a burst of energy and advanced in two assault columns supported by 81mm mortars and heavy machine guns. Now the exertion of carrying extra ammunition paid dividends as Baker and Charlie companies closed in on a CCF position held in estimated platoon strength. Some of the Chinese were surprised while asleep or numbed with cold, and the Marines destroyed the enemy force at a cost of only a few men wounded. The attack cleared the enemy from the eastern slope of Hill 1520, but distant small arms fire was received from ridges across the valley to the east. Davis called a halt for reorganization, since the troops had obviously reached the limit of their endurance. Suddenly they began collapsing in the snow, like dominoes, as the commanding officer later described the alarming spectacle. And there the men lay, oblivious to the cold, heedless of the Chinese bullets ricocheting off the rocks. A strange scene ensued in the dim starlight as company officers and NCOs shook and cuffed the prostrate Marines into wakefulness. The officers could sympathize even while demanding renewed efforts, for the sub-zero cold seemed to numb the mind as well as the body. Davis had even requested his company commanders to check every order he gave, just to make sure his own weary brain was functioning accurately. At 0300 he decided to allow the men a rest, the first in 20 hours of continuous fighting or marching under a double burden. As a preliminary, the battalion commander insisted that the perimeter be buttoned up and small patrols organized within companies to ensure a 25% alert. Then the pack radio was set up to establish the night's first contact with the regimental CP, and the men took turns at sleeping as an eerie silence fell over the wasteland of ice and stone. Attack of 3-5 on 1-2 December Returning to the Udemni area, it may be recalled that Lt. Col. Taplitz 3-5 had passed through 3-7 at 1500 on 1 December with a mission of attacking astride the MSR to lead the way for the main column. Tank D-23, a Howe Company platoon, and a platoon of Abel Company engineers set the pace, followed by the rest of Howe Company and the other two rifle companies. After an advance of 1,400 yards, the battalion column was stopped by heavy CCF fire from both sides. Howe and Item Companies fanned out west and east of the road, and a long-drawn firefight ensued before the Marines cleared the enemy from their flanks at 1930. Artillery support for the breakout was provided by 111 and 311, minus Battery H. The plan called for 111 to take the main responsibility for furnishing supporting fires at the outset, while 311 displaced as soon as possible to the vicinity of Sinhung Ni, whence the last lap of the march to Hagaru could be effectively covered. The 1st Battalion would then join the vehicle column and move with it to Hagaru. Taplet gave 3-5 a brief rest after securing his first objectives, the high ground on both sides of the road just opposite the northern spurs of Hill 1520. Then he ordered a renewal of the attack shortly before midnight. Howe Company on the right met only moderate opposition, but was held up by the inability of Item Company to make headway against Chinese dug in along the western slope of Hill 1520. Neither 17 nor 35 had any idea at the moment that they were simultaneously engaged on opposite sides of the same great landmass, though separated by enemy groups as well as terrain of fantastic difficulties. So rugged was this mile-high mountain that the two marine outfits might as well have been in different worlds as far as mutual support was concerned. Item Company stirred up such a hornet's nest on the western slope that Captain Harold O. Schreier was granted permission by the battalion commander to return to his jump-off position so that he could better defend the MSR. There he was attacked by Chinese who alternated infantry attacks with mortar bombardments. Radio communication failed and runners sent from the battalion CP to Item Company lost their way. Thus the company was isolated during an all-night defensive fight. 
Second Lieutenant Willard S. Peterson took over the command after Schreier received a second wound. Taplett had ordered his reserve company, George, and his attached engineers into defensive positions to the rear of Item Company. The engineers on the right flank were also hit by the Chinese and had several wounded, including the platoon commander, First Lieutenant Wayne E. Richards, before repulsing the attack. Counted CCF dead in the Item Company area totaled 342 at daybreak on the 2nd, but the Marines had paid a heavy price in casualties. Less than 20 able-bodied men were left when George Company passed through to renew the attack on Hill 1520. For that matter, both George and Howe companies were reduced to two platoon strength. Taplett requested reinforcement by an additional company and was assigned the so-called Dog Easy Composite Company made up of the remnants of 2-7. This outfit moved directly down the road between George and Howe companies. It took George Company until 1200 to secure the western slope of Hill 1520. The Composite Company ran into difficulties, meanwhile, at a point on the MSR where the Chinese had blown a bridge over a deep stream bed and set up a roadblock defended by machine guns. While George Company attacked down a long spur above the enemy, Dog Easy Company maneuvered in defilade to outflank him. Lieutenant Green, the FAC, directed the F-4Us on target and the ground forces were treated to a daring exhibition of close support by Corsairs which barely cleared the ridge after pulling out of their runs. The roadblock was speedily wiped out, but the vehicle column had to wait until the engineers could construct a bypass. Then the advance of 3-5 was resumed, with George and Howe companies attacking on opposite sides of the MSR and the Composite Company astride the road following the tank and engineer platoons. End of chapter 12, part 1, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 12, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Breakout from Udam Ni. The Ridge Runners of Tok Tong Pass. All the rest of their lives, the survivors of the two Spearhead Marine battalions would take pride in nicknames earned during the breakout from Udam Ni. For Taplet's outfit, it was Dark Horse, after the radio call sign of the battalion, while Davis's men felt that they had a right to be known as the Ridge Runners of Tok Tong Pass. At daybreak on 2 December, 1-7 corrected its westward drift of the previous night in attack toward Hill 1653, a mountain only about a mile and a half north of Fox Hill. Davis's men got the better of several firefights at long range with CF groups on ridges to the east, but the terrain gave them more effective opposition than the enemy. The radios of 1-7 could not contact Marine planes when they came on station, and relays through tactical channels proved ineffective. Moreover, all efforts to reach Fox Company by radio had failed. This situation worried the battalion commander, who realized that he was approaching within range of friendly 81mm mortar fire from Fox Hill. The ancient morale weapon of surprise stood Davis and his men in good steed, however, as the column encountered little opposition on the western slope of Hill 1653. Howe Company, bringing up the rear with the wounded men, came under an attack which threatened for a moment to endanger the casualties. But after the litters were carried forward, Newton managed to keep the Chinese at a respectful distance without aid from the other companies. Charlie Company was given the mission of seizing a spur covering the advance of Abel and Baker Companies east from Hill 1520 to Hill 1653. The command group had just passed Morris on this position when the radio operator shouted to Davis, Fox 6 on the radio, sir. Captain Barber's offer to send out a patrol to guide 1-7 to his position was declined, but Fox Company did control the strike by planes of VMF-312, which covered the attack of Kirkabas Company on the final objective, a ridge about 400 yards north of Fox Hill. Aided by the air attack and supporting 81mm mortar fires, Baker Company seized the position and Able Company the northern portion of Hill 1653. 
It was 11.25 on the morning of 2 December 1950 when the first men of Baker Company reached Fox Company's lines. Abel Company held its position on Hill 1653 until the rest of the battalion was on Fox Hill. After grounding their packs, men from the forward companies went back to help carry the 22 wounded men into the perimeter. While supervising this task, the regimental surgeon, Lieutenant Peter A. Arioli, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, was instantly killed by a Chinese sniper's bullet. There were no other death casualties, though two men had to be placed in improvised straitjackets after cracking mentally and physically under the strain. Both died before evacuation was possible. The first objective had been reached, but there was to be no rest until Taktong Pass was secured. Baker Company paused on Fox Hill only long enough for Kirkaba's men to eat a hasty meal of airdropped rations. Then they moved out to seize the high ground commanding the vital terrain feature at a point where the road describes a loop from north to south. Abel Company followed shortly afterwards and the two outfits set up a single perimeter for the night while the rest of the battalion manned perimeters on the high ground east of Fox Hill. Barber's men remained in their positions. Five days and nights of battle had left Fox Company with 118 casualties, 26 KIA, 3 MIA, and 89 WIA. Six of the seven officers were wounded, and practically all the unwounded men suffered from frostbite and digestive ills. CCF attacks on Hills 1276 and 1542. While the two spearhead battalions advanced, the marine elements in the rear could not complain of being neglected by the enemy. All three infantry battalions were kept busy by CCF attacks, which persisted from midnight until long after daybreak. Lieutenant Colonel Royce's 2-5, which had been designated as rear guard, was hit on Hill 1276 in the early morning hours of 2 December. Under cover of rifle and machine gun fire, the Chinese advanced on Fox Company positions with their inverted wedge assault formation. Testimony as to its effectiveness is found in the 2-5 report. The Chinese used fire and movement to excellent advantage. They would direct a frontal attack against our positions while other elements of their attacking force moved in closer to F Company flanks in an attempt at a double envelopment. Then in turn the forces on both flanks would attack while the forces directly to our front would move closer to our position. In this, the enemy, by diverting our attention in the above manner, were able to maneuver their forces to within hand grenade range of our positions. One Fox platoon, assailed from three sides, was forced to withdraw at 0110 and consolidate with the rest of the company. At 0200, the FAC requested an airstrike from two night fighters on station. The aircraft were directed on target by 60mm mortar white phosphorus bursts and conducted effective strafing and rocket runs within 200 yards of the Marine front line. In all, five aircraft of VMF N542 were employed with excellent results during the night. At 0230, Royce directed Fox Company to retake the left flank hill from which the platoon had been driven. Two attempts were made before daybreak with the support of 4.2-inch mortar fire, but enemy machine guns stopped the assault. At 0730, an airstrike was requested. After strafing and rocket runs, Fox Company fought its way to the crest, only to find the positions untenable because of machine gun fire from the reverse slope. At 1000, the Corsairs blasted the enemy for 25 minutes with napalm and 500-pound bombs, and CCF troops were observed vacating the objective area. It was nearly time for the battalion to displace as the rear guard, however, and the enemy was left in possession of a scarred and scorched piece of real estate. Both Dog and Easy companies received probing attacks while the Chinese did not attempt to push home. At daybreak, some of them broke and ran along the Dog Company front, throwing away their weapons as they scattered in disorder. Marine fire pursued the retreating communists and cut down many of them. Captain Arthur D. Chalicombe's provisional company of artillerymen on Dog Company's right counted over 50 dead in front of its position. On the eastern flank, 1-5 came under attack about 2,100 by 75 to 100 Chinese who crossed the arm of the reservoir on ice. 
Mortar and artillery fire drove them back at 0100 with heavy losses, but attempts at infiltration continued throughout the night. In the morning, 51 CCF dead were counted in front of one Charlie Company machine gun, and total enemy KIA were estimated at 200. At the other end of the Marine line, a CCF attack hit 37 minus on Hill 1542. The assault force, according to the enemy report, consisted of Sung Wei Shan's 9th Company, 3rd Battalion, 235th Regiment, the 5th Company of 2235, and apparently two other companies of 3235. All were units of the 79th CCF Division, and their mission was to annihilate the defending enemy before daylight. George and Item Companies of 37, following their repulse from the upper reaches of Hill 1542, had formed a defensive perimeter on the eastern slope. As reinforcements, the depleted units were assigned a composite outfit known as Jig Company and consisting of about 100 cannoneers, headquarters troops, and any other elements which could be hastily put together. First Lieutenant Alfred I. Thomas of Item Company was placed in command of men who were for the most part strangers to him as well as to one another. Sung led the 9th Company's attacking column. Although the Chinese account states that his men were advancing from the northwest toward the topographical crest of Hill 1542, they actually held the summit. Their attack was downhill, though some climbing of spurs and finger ridges may have been necessary. After reconnoitering to a point within 25 yards of the Marines, the Chinese jumped off at 0430 with the support of fires from battalion weapons. Relying on the inverted wedge, the attackers bored in alternately right and left while seeking an opportunity for a knockout blow. The second platoon on the Chinese left took a severe mauling, losing its commander and almost half its men. The other two platoons had heavy casualties but succeeded in routing the jury-rigged jig company. Since it was a composite outfit not yet 24 hours old, there is no record of either its operations or losses. Apparently, however, a majority of the men straggled back to their original units. Lieutenant Thomas, who had commanded ably under difficult circumstances, rejoined 1st Lieutenant William E. Johnson's item company with such men as he had left. The Marines gave ground slowly under Chinese pressure until daybreak, when they held positions abreast of George Company, which had not been heavily engaged. The two companies were reduced to a total of fewer than 200 men. After being reinforced by H&S Company personnel, they formed a defensive line in an arc stretching from the MSR about 1,100 yards and taking in the eastern slopes of Hill 1542. Apparently, the Communists, like military forces everywhere, did not err on the light side when estimating the casualties of opponents. The Marine losses for the night were listed in the CCF report as killed altogether 100 enemy troops. This figure, indicating total casualties of several hundred, is manifestly too high. Owing to the loss of the 7th Marine's records, the statistics for item company are not available, but it does not appear that more than 30 to 40 men were killed or wounded. Advance of Dark Horse on 2-3 December Several CCF daylight attacks and platoon strength were received between Hills 1542 and 1276 during the morning hours of 2 December. All Marine units in this area were in process of disengaging, so that the emphasis was placed on breaking off action rather than attempting to defend ground soon to be evacuated. The vehicle train in the rear made slow progress during the afternoon of 2 December. Infantry strength was not sufficient to occupy all the commanding terrain during the passage of the motor column, and CCF groups infiltrated back into areas vacated by Marine riflemen. Effective air support reduced most of these efforts to harassing attacks, but Marine vehicle drivers were singled out for special attention, making it necessary to find replacements among nearby troops. To 1-5 fell the mission of furnishing close-in flank protection on the left. Marine air and artillery supported infantry attacks clearing the flanks and the column jolted on with frequent halts. The night passed without incident except for a CCF attack on 311. George battery gunners had to employ direct fire to repulse the communists, and a 105mm howitzer was lost as well as several vehicles. 
Dark Horse, leading the way, was meanwhile fighting for nearly every foot of the road during the advance of 2 December. George Company on the left went up against Hill 1520, while Dog Easy moved astride the MSR. By noon, George had secured its objective. Dog Easy advanced against moderate resistance to a point about 300 yards beyond Hill 1520, where a demolished bridge had spanned a rock ravine as the road turns from south to east. Here, Chinese automatic weapons fire halted the column until a strike by 12 Corsairs cleared the enemy from the ravine. On the right, Captain Harold B. Williamson's Howe Company was to have joined the attack, moving through the high ground south of the bend in the road. A Chinese strongpoint delayed its advance, and Howe was pinned down by heavy enemy fire while attempting to cross a stream bed halfway to its objective. The last airstrike of the day freed Captain Williamson's unit, which secured its objective after dark. During the last minutes of daylight, the engineer platoon, now commanded by Technical Sergeant Edward L. Knox, constructed a bypass around the blasted bridge. About 1900, the first vehicles followed the tank across. Taplet's battalion continued its slow progress with George and Howe companies clearing the high ground on opposite sides of the road while Dog Easy moved to stride the MSR. At about 0200 on the 3rd, the advance came to a halt 1,000 yards short of Fox Hill. Dog Easy, which had suffered heavy casualties, particularly among its key NCOs, had reached the limit of exhaustion and 3-5 secured for the rest of the night. Not until daylight did Howe Company discover that it had halted 300 yards short of its final objective, the hill mass southwest of Fox Hill. At dawn on 3 December, the ground was covered with six inches of new snow, hiding the scars of war and giving a deceptively peaceful appearance to the Korean hills as the Marine Column got underway again with Sergeant Knox's engineers at the point, just behind Sergeant Munsell's lone tank. Alternately serving as engineers and riflemen, this platoon came through with 17 able-bodied men left out of the 48 who started. Dog Easy Company having been rendered ineffective by its casualties, Taplet moved George Company down from the left flank to advance astride the road. First Lieutenant Charles D. Mice took over the reorganized outfit, assisted by Second Lieutenant August L. Camerata. The two riddled Dog Easy platoons were combined with George Company under the command of 2nd Lieutenant John J. Cahill and Technical Sergeant Don Faber. Cahill had the distinction of leading the platoon which fought the first action of Marine ground forces in the Korean conflict. But it hardly seemed possible on this sub-zero December morning that the encounter had taken place barely four months before, or that the temperature that August day had been 102 degrees in the non-existent shade. Korea was a land of extremes. Dark Horse was not far from a junction with the Ridge Runners. The night of 2 to 3 December had passed quietly in Taktong Pass, where the five companies occupied separate perimeters. The Marines on Fox Hill lighted warming fires in the hope of tempting the enemy to reveal his positions. The Chinese obliged by firing from two nearby ridges. One CCF group was dug in along a southern spur of the hill held by Abel and Baker companies, and the other occupied a ridge extending outward beyond Taktong Pass in the direction of Hagaru. Simultaneous attacks in opposite directions were launched by 1-7. Davis led Morris's and Newton's companies against the CCF force barring the way to Hagaru. Tige moved out with Kirkaba and Hovatter's companies, meanwhile, against a larger CCF force on high ground south of the Big Bend in the road. This stroke took the Chinese by surprise. As they fell back in disorder, the Communists did not realize that they were blundering into the path of the oncoming Marines of Williamson's Howe 5, attacking south of the MSR. Colonel Litzenberg, who had been informed by radio, turned to Lieutenant Colonel Murray and said, Ray, notify your 3rd Battalion commander that the Chinese are running southwest into his arms. Taplet was unaware that Tigay's attack was forcing about a battalion of Chinese into his lap. He had spotted the Chinese in strength on the high ground south of the road when day broke. Attempts to lay artillery on the Chinese having failed because of the range from Hagaru, the 3-5 commander called for an airstrike. 
The overcast lifted just as the Corsairs came on station. They hit the demoralized communists with napalm and rockets while the 81mm mortars and heavy machine guns of the two covering marine forces opened up with everything they had. Probably the greatest slaughter of the Udemni breakout ended at 10.30 with the CCF battalion completely eliminated, as the 3-5 report phrased it, and Howe Company in possession of the CCF positions. At 1300 on 3 December, after Davis had cleared the enemy from the ridge northeast of Toktong Pass, the basic maneuver of the breakout was completed by the junction of 3-5 and 1-7. Several more fights awaited Taplet's men on the way to Hagaru, but at Toktong Pass they had fulfilled their mission. That the victory had not been gained without paying a price in casualties is indicated by the following daily returns of effective strength in the three rifle companies. George Company, 1 December, 114, 2 December, 96, 3 December, 84, 4 December, 80. Howe Company, 1 December, 180, 2 December, 167, 3 December, 131, 4 December, 73. Item Company, 1 December, 143, 2 December, 41, 3 December, 41, 4 December, 41. Total, 1 December, 437, 2 December, 304, 3 December, 256, 4 December, 194. This is a total of 243 battle and non-battle casualties as compared to the 144 suffered by the same units during the CCF attacks of 27 to 30 November. Entry into Hagaru Perimeter When the truck column with its wounded men reached Toktong Pass, it halted to receive the casualties of 1735 and Fox Company of 27. Lieutenant Commander John H. Craven, chaplain of the 7th Marines, helped to assist the litter cases into vehicles. Since there was not room for all, the walking wounded had to make room for helpless men. They complied with a courage which will never be forgotten by those who saw them struggling painfully toward Hagaru alongside the truck column. When the tank leading the 3-5 column reached Toktong Pass, it halted only long enough for Colonels Taplet and Davis to confer. D-23 then moved out and the four companies of 1-7 came down from their hillside positions and fell in behind. Stevens 1-5, having leapfrogged 3-5, followed next on the way to blocking positions further east of the MSR. Taplet remained in Toktong Pass until after midnight, acting as radio relay between Colonels Litzenberg and Murray, by now in Hagaru, and 2-5 in the rear. At about midnight, the 3-5 commander sent G&H companies into the vehicle column to furnish security for the artillery, and an hour later the remainder of the battalion joined the column. Royce's 2-5 which had passed through 3-7 came next, followed by Harris's rear guard. Interspersed among the infantry were elements of artillery and service troops with their vehicles, and the column became more scrambled after each halt. Two observation planes of VM-06 circled overhead to give warning of enemy concentrations. Marine planes were on station continuously during daylight hours, strafing and rocketing to the front and along both flanks. A total of 145 sorties, most of them in close air support of troops advancing along the Hagaru Udemni MSR, were flown on 3 December by the following units. VMF-214, 36 sorties. VMF-323, 28 sorties. VMF-212, 27 sorties. VMF-312, 34 sorties. VMF-N-513, 7 sorties. VMFN 542, 13 sorties. Total, 145 sorties. At the other end of the route, the Royal Commandos, reinforced by a platoon of tanks, were sent out from Hagaru at 1630 on 3 December to drive the Chinese from the road leading into that perimeter. Thanks to excellent air support, 1-7 met no opposition save harassing attacks. One of Davis's flanking patrols reported the flushing out of a few Chinese so exhausted by cold and hardships that they had abandoned their weapons and holed up together for warmth. 
If these Marines had been in a mood for such reflections, they might have recalled that the American press of late had been bemoaning the supposed decline of the nation's young manhood. UN reverses in the summer of 1950 had led editorial writers to conclude that our troops had neither the legs for long marches nor the backs for the bearing of military burdens. Mechanization had gone so far, they lamented, that we had become the servants rather than the masters of our own wheeled and tracked vehicles. The Marines of Davis's battalion might have taken grim satisfaction, therefore, in encountering Chinese peasants, inert all their lives to privations, whose will to fight had been broken by the hardships of the past week. These Marines had not known a full night's sleep during that week. They had subsisted on a diet of crackers varied with canned rations thawed by body heat. They had been under continuous nervous pressure as well as physical strain, and yet they were able to summon one last burst of pride when the point neared the Hagaru perimeter at 1900 on 3 December 1950. Several hundred yards from the entrance, a halt was called while the men closed up into a compact column. Then they came in marching, their shoulders thrown back and their shoe packs beating a firm tread on the frozen road. The Marines at the head of the column were followed by the walking wounded and the vehicles loaded with more serious cases, some of whom had been strapped to the hoods. All casualties were given medical care and the remaining troops taken into warming tents for hot coffee. Many of them appeared dazed and uncomprehending at first. Others wandered about aimlessly with blank faces. But there were few who had suffered any psychological disturbances that could not be cleared up with a good night's sleep and some hot food. Troops of 411 and 35 were due to arrive next at Hagaru, while 15 and 25 echelon companies forward along the MSR to provide flank protection. Not all the Chinese had lost aggressiveness, but the column had little difficulty until 0200 on 4 December. Then it came to an abrupt halt when prime movers of eight 155mm howitzers ran out of diesel fuel. As far back as Sin Hung Ni, 150 gallons had been requested, but none had been delivered. While the troops ahead, including G and H of 3-5, continued on towards Hagaru, unaware of the break, a bad situation developed around the stalled guns. Following the halting of the convoy, Major Angus J. Cronin, in charge of 411's vehicle column, and his handful of truck drivers and cannoneers drove off a platoon of Chinese. These Marines were soon joined by Lieutenant Colonel Feehan's 111 and Able Company of 15. By the time Lieutenant Colonel Taplett arrived, the 155s had been moved off the road by Captain O.R. Lodge of 411, who continued in spite of a wound until more severely wounded in the head. Royce and Stevens arrived shortly afterwards, and the three battalion commanders drew up a hasty plan. While 3-5 built up a base of fire, a platoon of Easy Company 2-5 would move through the ridge north of the road to knock out the Chinese strong point. Up to this time, there had been few and minor instances of panic during the breakout from Udem Ni. But some confusion resulted when the enemy took advantage of the delay to blow a small bridge ahead and increase his rate of fire. Thus a new roadblock awaited after the howitzers were removed, and two truck drivers were killed while the engineers repaired the brake. Other drivers bypassed the bridge and made a dash for safety by crossing the little stream on the ice. A comparatively few men, giving way to panic, were endangering the entire column. Behind one of the fleeing trucks, an angry warrant officer pounded in pursuit, shouting some of the most sulfurious profanity that Lt. Col. Taplett had ever heard. This was Chief Warrant Officer Alan Carlson of Baker Company, 111. He disappeared around a bend in the road, only to return a moment later with a chastened driver towing a 105mm howitzer. Carlson hastily recruited a crew and set up the piece beside the road for point-blank fire at the enemy position, while Taplett directed the fire of a 75mm recoilless rifle. A Charlie battery howitzer and a 1-5 heavy machine gun added their contribution as a platoon of Easy Company 2-5 attacked under the cover of airstrikes. The Chinese position was overrun at 0830 at an estimated cost to the enemy of 150 dead. 
Two other attacks were launched by infantry units of Royce's battalion on the high ground to the left before the MSR was cleared. When the 155mm howitzers were pushed off the road, it had been assumed that they would be retrieved. Only 1,000 yards farther down the MSR was a cache of airdrop diesel fuel, but efforts to bring back replenishments were frustrated by enemy fire. Attempts at recovery by the British Marines failed later that day, and orders were given for the destruction by air of the eight stalled howitzers plus a ninth which had previously been abandoned after skidding off the road. This was the largest loss of weapons in the Udemy breakout. At 1400 on 4 December, the last elements of the rear guard, 3-7, entered the perimeter and the four-day operation passed into history. Some 1500 casualties were brought to Hagaru, a third of them being in the non-battle category, chiefly frostbite cases. It had taken the head of the column about 59 hours to cover the 14 miles and the rear unit 79 hours. Under the circumstances of its execution, commented General Smith, the breakout was remarkably well conducted. Since centralized control of the widespread elements was a difficult task, particularly with a joint command, unit commanders were required to exercise a high degree of initiative. The spirit and discipline of the men under the most adverse conditions of weather and terrain was another highly important factor contributing to the success of the operation and also reflecting the quality of the leadership being exercised. End of chapter 12, part 2, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 13, part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Regroupment at Hagaru The Marines at Hagaru would have been astonished to learn how much anxiety over their encirclement was being currently felt in the United States. It had been a rude shock for Americans who believed that the troops in Korea would be home by Christmas to realize that the unexpected Chinese intervention had created virtually a new war. This war, moreover, was apparently going against the UN forces. On Thanksgiving Day, the victory over communist aggression had seemed almost complete, yet only a week later, the headlines announced major reverses. The 8th Army was in full retreat, and an entire Marine division was said to be trapped. So disturbing were the reports from Korea, Newspaper readers and radio listeners could scarcely have imagined the mood of confidence prevailing at Hagaru after the arrival of the troops from Udemy. Even prior to that event, few Marines had any doubts as to the ability of the division to fight its way out to the seacoast. The Hagaru perimeter presented a scene of bustling activity during the first days of December. Trucks and jeeps bounced along the bumpy roads in such numbers as to create a traffic problem. Twin-engine planes roared in and out of the snow-covered airstrip at frequent intervals throughout the daylight hours. Overhead, the flying boxcars spilled a rainbow profusion of red, blue, yellow, green, and orange parachutes to drift earthward with heavy loads of rations, gasoline, and ammunition. The busy panorama even had its humorous aspects. Parka-clad marines displaying a five-day growth of beard went about with their cheeks bulging from an accumulation of Tootsie Rolls, a caramel confection much esteemed by stateside youngsters for its long-lasting qualities. The post-exchange section had originally brought merchandise into Hagaru on the assumption that it would be established as a base. No space in vehicles was available for its removal, and the commanding general directed that the entire remaining stock $13,547.80 worth, chiefly candies and cookies, should be issued gratuitously to the troops. Tootsie Rolls proved to be a prime favorite with men who would have scorned them in civilian life. Not only were they more tasty than half-frozen sea rations, but they resulted in no intestinal disorders. Moreover, they were useful as temporary repairs for leaking radiators. There was nothing during the daytime to indicate the presence of CCF troops near Hagaru. 
Even in hours of darkness, the enemy was quiet throughout the first five nights of December. Apparently, the Chinese were powerless to renew the attack until reinforcements and replenishments of supplies and ammunition reached the area. 4,312 casualties evacuated by air. Evacuation of the wounded was the chief problem on 2 December, when it became evident that previous estimates of losses at Udemni and among the army troops east of the reservoir were far too low. A total of 914 casualties were flown out by the C-47s and R-4Ds that day, and more than 700 on the 3rd. Captain Herring and his assistants had assumed that the Air Force evacuation officer was screening the casualties until he informed them that this was not his responsibility. The division surgeon then set a Spartan standard. He passed personally on all controversial cases and approved for evacuation only those in as bad shape as Lieutenant Commander Lessenden, the 5th Marine surgeon who had refused to be flown out and continued on duty after both feet were painfully frozen. Apparently, it was not too severe a test for men who could stand the pain, since Lessenden suffered no permanent injuries. Captain Herring had to use his medical authority in several instances to overcome the objections of Udemni casualties who declined evacuation, though in obvious need of hospitalization. The liaison airstrip at Kotori had been of little use, since it was outside the perimeter and exposed to enemy fire but the completion of a new strip on the 2nd made it possible to evacuate about 47 casualties that day from the 2-1 perimeter. More than 1,400 casualties remained at Hagaru on the morning of 5 December. They were all flown out before nightfall, making a total of 4,312 men, 3,150 Marines, 1,137 Army personnel, and 25 Royal Marines, evacuated from Hagaru by air in the first five days of December, according to Marine figures. Ten Corps estimated a total of 4,207 from the same period. R-4Ds of the 1st Ma, flying under wing operational control, were represented in the flights to and from Hagaru as well as the C-47s of the Combat Cargo Command, FIF. The large-scale casualty evacuation was completed without losing a man, even though the aircraft landing on the rough strip careened precariously as they bounced along the frozen runway. Only two planes could be accommodated simultaneously at first, but marine engineers widened the 2,900-foot strip until six planes could be parked at a time. A four-engine Navy R-5D made a successful landing with stretchers flown in from Japan. After taking off with a load of wounded, the pilot barely cleared the surrounding hills, and it was decided to risk no further evacuations with such large aircraft. Two crash landings marred operations on the field. An incoming Marine R-4D, heavily loaded with artillery ammunition, wiped out its landing gear on the rough surface and was abandoned after its load had been put to good use by the gunners. A second accident involved an Air Force C-47 which lost power on the takeoff and came down just outside the Marine lines without injury to its load of casualties. Troops from the perimeter were rushed out immediately to rescue its occupants, but the plane had to be destroyed. Not until long later were final official casualty reports rendered for the period of the Udemni regroupment and breakout. Regimental figures were not available, and the totals included the losses suffered by the troops at Hagaru during the night of 30 November to 1 December. Following are the total figures for the 1st Marine Division as a whole throughout this five-day period. KIA, 135. DOW, 29. MIA, 55. WIA, 921. Total battle, 1,140. Non-battle, 1,194. 537 replacements flown to Hagaru. At 13.59 on 3 December, 10 Corps issued OI-22, directing the 1st Marine Division to withdraw all elements to Hamhung area via the Hagaru-Hamhung axis as rapidly as evacuation of wounded and other preparations would permit. General Allman flew to Hagaru that same day for a conference with General Smith. Nothing further was said about destruction of equipment. 
At that very time, in fact, various critical items were being salvaged and flown out from Hagaru when space on planes was available. Surplus weapons had accumulated as a result of casualties and the Marine General wished to avoid the destruction of any material that could be removed by air without interfering with casualty evacuation. It was particularly necessary to salvage and fly out the parachutes and packages used for airdrops, since a critical shortage of these had been reported from Japan. Before leaving Hagaru, the division also planned to evacuate large quantities of stoves, tents, typewriters, rifles, machine guns, and damaged 4.2-inch mortars. Space and empty planes landing at Hagaru was utilized not only for bringing in equipment and medical supplies, but also replacements. Since the Wonsan landing, some hundreds of Marines, most of them wounded in the Inchon Seoul operation, had returned from hospitals in Japan. These men, upon reporting to Hungnam, were temporarily assigned to the headquarters battalion, since the division had no provision in its TO for a replacement organization. Ordinarily, they would have been returned to their units, but enemy action made this procedure impossible until the completion of the airstrip. During the first five days of December, therefore, 537 replacements were flown to Hagaru, fit for duty and equipped with cold weather clothing. Those destined for the 1st Marines were assigned to the 3rd Battalion for perimeter defense, and personnel for the 5th and 7th Marines joined those units after their arrival at Hagaru. Major General William H. Tunner, U.S. Air Force, the Chief of the Combat Cargo Command, expressed astonishment during his visit of 5 December on learning about these replacements. He had come to offer his C-47s for troop evacuation after the casualties were flown out, but General Smith explained that all able-bodied men would be needed for the breakout. Airdrops of Ammunition Visitors and press correspondents arrived daily at Hagaru in the empty C-47s and R-4Ds. Among them was Miss Margaret Higgins, reporter for the New York Herald Tribune. General Smith ruled that for her own protection, considering the possibility of enemy attack, she must leave the perimeter before nightfall. French and British publications were represented as well as most of the larger American dailies and wire services. At one of the press conferences, the question arose as to the proper name of the Marine operation. A British correspondent had intended to refer to it as a retreat or retirement, but General Smith held that there could be no retreat when there was no rear. Since the division was surrounded, he maintained, the word retreat was not a correct term for the coming breakout to the coast. General Smith and Lieutenant Colonel Murray were interviewed for television by Charles de Soria, who also shot Marines on infantry duty and casualties awaiting evacuation. These pictures and recordings were later shown in the United States under the title Guess the Mean. The correspondents were astonished to find the Hagaru perimeter so lacking in enemy activity. The quiet was shattered at 2010 on 5 December when two B-26s bombed and strafed the area. Marine night fighters were absent on a search mission, but one was recalled to offer protection against further efforts of the sort. A possible explanation was advanced by 1st Lieutenant Harry S. Wilson of VMF 542, who reported that he had received orders by radio to attack Hagaru. It was his conviction that Chinese use of captured radio equipment accounted for the B-26 attack. The interlude of CCF activity gave the 1st Marine Division an opportunity to build up a stock of airdropped ammunition and supplies. Poor communications had prevented the obtaining of advance information as to the requirements of the UDEM-NI troops, and their needs had to be estimated by the assistant G-4. It was planned that units moving out from Hagaru would take only enough supplies for the advance to Koto Ri. Material would be airdropped there to support the next stage of the breakout. The C-119s of the Combat Cargo Command were called upon to fly in the largest part of the total of the 372.7 tons requested for air delivery at Hagaru. C-47s and R-4Ds were available for some items, particularly of fragile nature, and specially packaged small drops to meet specific needs could be made by planes of the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing. 
Officers and men of the headquarters battalion at Hagaru were ordered to assist the 1st Regulating Detachment in the operation of the Hagaru airfield. Army service troops were also assigned to the task, and dumps were set up adjacent to the drop zone for the direct issuing of supplies. The major items requested were artillery, mortar and small arms ammunition, hand grenades, gasoline and diesel oil, rations, and communication wire. There is no record of the amounts actually received. Pilots sometimes missed the drop zone so far that the containers were captured by the enemy or landed in areas where recovery was not feasible because of enemy fire. In other instances, the supplies fell near the positions of frontline units which issued them on the spot without any formalities of bookkeeping. Breakage rates were high due to the frozen ground. About 70% of the POL products and 70 to 80% of the rations were recovered in usable condition. Of the artillery ammunition delivered to the drop zone, 40% was badly damaged and only 25% ever reached the gun positions. About 45% of the small arms ammunition was recovered in usable. 100% of the requested mortar ammunition and 90% of the 81mm rounds were put into the air over the drop zone, though the damage rate was nearly as high as that of the artillery shells. In spite of the seemingly low percentages of receipts as compared to requests, it was considered that the Hagaru airdrops had been successful on the whole. Without the extra ammunition, commented General Smith, many more of the friendly troops would have been killed. There can be no doubt that the supplies received by this method proved to be the margin necessary to sustain adequately the operation of the division during this period. Planning for Breakout to Kotori The need of the Udemni troops for recuperation was so urgent that 6 December was set as the D-Day of the attack from Hagaru to Kotori. On the recommendation of his staff, General Smith decided that the need of the troops for rest and regroupment outweighed the advantages of a speedy advance, even though the enemy would be allowed more time to get his forces into position along the MSR. Another factor influencing this decision was the thinning of the command group and staff sections of the division. It will be recalled that General Craig, the assistant division commander, had recently been returned on emergency leave to the United States. Colonel Walseth, G-1, was wounded on 30 November, while Lieutenant Colonel Chidester had been MIA since that date. Colonel McAllister, G-4, had been directed to remain at Hungnam to coordinate logistic functions. A serious handicap to planning was the shortage of staff personnel. This was due in part to the casualties suffered by the last convoy of headquarters troops to move up from Hungnam. Moreover, the office force had been depleted by calls for reinforcements to defend the perimeter. By dint of working round the clock, however, planning for the breakout to Kotori was completed on schedule. Operation Order 25-50, issued at 0800 on 5 December, provided for an advance of the 1st Marine Division at first light the following morning on the kotori chinhung ni Majandong axis to close the Hamhung area. The principal subordinate units were assigned these tasks. A. RCT-5, 3-1 attached, to relieve all elements on perimeter defense in the Hagaru area by 1200, 5 December, to cover the movement of RCT-7 out of Hagaru to the south, to follow RCT-7 to the south on the hagaru ri koto ri shinhung ni axis, to protect the division rear from Hagaru to koto ri and to follow RCT-7 from koto ri to the Hamhung area as division reserve. B. RCT-7 to advance south at first light on 6 December on the hagaru koto ri shinhung ni axis to close the Hamhung area. C. RCT-1 minus, to continue to hold Kotori and Chenhung Ni, protecting the approach and passage of the remainder of the division through Kotori, and to protect the division rear from Kotori to Hamhung area. All personnel except drivers, relief drivers, radio operators, casualties, and men specially designated by RCT commanders 
were to march on foot alongside motor serials to provide close-in security. It was directed that vehicles breaking down should be pushed to the side of the road and destroyed if not operative by the time the column passed. During halts, a perimeter defense of motor serials was to be established. Nine control points were designated by map references to be used for reporting progress of the advance or directing airdrops. Demolitions to clear obstacles from the front and to create them to the rear were planned by the division engineer officer. Division Admin Order 20-50, which accompanied Operation Order 25-50, prescribed that the troops were to take enough sea rations for two days, equally distributed between individual and organic transportation. Selected items of B rations were to be loaded on organic vehicles, and the following provision was made for ammunition. On individual, up to one UF per individual weapon. On vehicle, minimum one UF, then proportionate share per RCT until dumps depleted or transportation capacity exceeded. Helicopter evacuation was indicated for emergency cases. Other casualties were to be placed in sleeping bags and evacuated in vehicles of the column. Two division trains were set up by Admin Order 20-50. Lieutenant Colonel Banks commanded train number one, under RCT-7, and number two, under RCT-5, was in charge of Lieutenant Colonel Milne. Each motor serial in the trains was to have a commander who maintained radio communication with the train commander. Truck transportation not being available for all supplies and equipment at Hagaru, a division destruction plan was issued on 4 December, making unit commanders responsible for disposing of all excess supplies and equipment within their own areas. Commanding Officer First Regulating Detachment is responsible for destruction all classes, supplies, and equipment remaining in dumps, the order continued. Unit Commanders and CO First Regulating Detachment report types and amounts of supplies and equipment to this headquarters, G4, prior to destruction. Permission to use fuel and ammunition for destruction purposes must be obtained from this headquarters, G4. 3-1 relieved by RCT-5 at Hagaru. General Smith held conferences on 4 and 5 December of senior unit commanders. During the afternoon of the 4th, General Allman arrived by plane and was briefed on the plan for the breakout. In a brief ceremony at the Division CP, he presented the Distinguished Service Cross to General Smith, Colonel Litzenberg, and Lieutenant Colonels Murray and Beale. The night of 5-6 to 6 December was the 5th in a row to pass without enemy activity at Hagaru. But if Division G2 summaries were to be credited, it was the calm before the storm for the Chinese were believed to be assembling troops and supplies both at Hagaru and along the MSR to Koto Ri. Up to this time, seven CCF divisions, the 58th, 59th, 60th, 76th, 79th, 80th, and 89th, had been identified through POW interrogations. But there were evidences that the 77th and 78th were also within striking distance. At 1200 on 5 December, the 5th Marines relieved 3-1 of the responsibility for the defense of the Hagaru area. Division elements other than infantry were withdrawn from the front line, leaving Lt. Col. Murray's three battalions, with 3-1 attached, disposed around the perimeter as follows. 1-5. From the Udemni Road around the north of Hagaru and astride the Changjin Valley to a point at the base of the ridge about 1,000 yards east of the bridge over the Changjin River. 2-5. In position on the western slopes of East Hill. 3-5. From the south nose of East Hill west across the river to link up with 3-1 south of the airstrip. 3-1. South and southwest of airstrip in sector formerly held by Howe and Item Companies of 3-1. Not only were the CCF positions on East Hill a threat to Hagaru, they also dominated the road leading south to Koto Ri. Thus, the plan for the breakout called for simultaneous attacks to be launched at first light on the 6th, RCT-5 to regain the enemy-held portion of East Hill, and RCT-7 to lead the advance of the division motor column toward Koto Ri. A plan for air support, prepared by the command and staff of the 1st MAW, 
was brought to Hagaru by Brigadier General Thomas J. Cushman, Assistant Wing Commander, on 5 December. Aircraft were to be on station at 0700 to furnish close support for the attack on East Hill. Along the MSR to Koto Ri, an umbrella of 24 close support aircraft was to cover the head, rear, and flanks of the breakout column, while search and attack planes scoured the ridges flanking the road and approaches leading into it. Support was also to be furnished after dark by the night hecklers. All strikes within three miles of either side of the MSR were to be controlled by the ground forces while the planes were free to hit any targets beyond. The concentration of aircraft covering the advance south from Hagaru was one of the greatest of the whole war. Marine planes at Yonpo would, of course, continue approximately 100 daily sorties, to which VMF 323 would add 30 more from the Badong Strait. The Navy's fast carriers Leyte, Valley Forge, Philippine Sea, and Princeton were to abandon temporarily their deep support or interdiction operations and contribute about 100 or more attack sorties daily. The 5th Air Force was to add more power with additional U.S. and Australian fighter bombers, as well as medium and heavy bomber interdiction beyond the bomb line. To augment the carrier support for the 10 Corps consolidation and possible redeployment by sea, VMF-212 had departed Yonpo on 4 December and was re-equipping in Itami for return to battle aboard the newly arrived USS Bataan. The Sicily was also heading for the area to take back aboard the Corsairs of VMF-214 on 7 December. Continuous artillery support, both for RCT-5 and RCT-7, was planned by the 11th Marines. Two batteries of the 3rd Battalion and one of the 4th were to move out at the head of the RCT-7 train, the two from 311 to occupy initial positions halfway to Koto Ri to support the attack southward to the objective, and the 411 battery to take position in Koto Ri and provide general support northward in combination with the battery of 211 attached to that perimeter. The remaining batteries of the 3rd and 4th Battalions would provide initial support from Hagaru southward until ordered to move out. The three batteries of 111, with D-11 attached, were to support the operations of RCT-5 in a similar manner. Two batteries would move out at the head of the regimental train to position halfway to Koto Ri. The remaining two would fire to the south in support of withdrawing units and then displace when the first two were in position. Throughout the night of 5 to 6 December, the darkness was stabbed by flashes as the artillery at Hagaru fired concentrations to saturate the area along the Hagaru Koto Ri axis. In order to prevent cratering of the road, the 155s fired VT rounds. A second purpose of this bombardment was to expend profitably the surplus of ammunition which could not be brought out. At daybreak on the 6th, the division headquarters broke camp. General Smith had decided to fly the command group to Koto Ri in advance of the troops so that planning could begin immediately for the breakout from Koto Ri southward. General Barr visited during the morning and was informed that the 7th Infantry Division casualties who had reached Hagaru had been flown out. The remaining 490 able-bodied men, including 385 survivors of Task Force Faith, had been provided with Marine equipment and organized into a provisional battalion under the command of Lt. Col. Anderson, U.S. Army. This battalion was attached to the 7th Marines and sometimes referred to as 31-7. Throughout the morning, General Smith kept in close touch with the progress of RCT-7 toward Koto Ri. At 1400, a reassuring message was received from Col. Litzenberg, and the commanding general took off from Hagaru by helicopter. Ten minutes later, he and his aide, Capt. Martin J. Sexton, landed at Koto Ri. The other members of the command group, following by OY and helicopter, set up in a large tent at Koto Ri and started planning for the next stage. End of chapter 13, part 1, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 13, part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953. Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Regroupment at Hagaru. East Hill retaken from Chinese. Meanwhile, at Hagaru, Lieutenant Colonel Murray had designated his 2nd Battalion for the assault on East Hill. At 0700 on 6 December, as the 4.2-inch mortars began their planned preparation, the 7th Marines had already initiated the breakout to Kotori. When Marine planes arrived on station at 0725, a shortage of napalm tanks limited the air attacks to bombing, rocket, and strafing runs. These had little apparent effect on the objective. Further airstrikes were directed by the FAC, 1st Lieutenant Manning T. Jeter, Jr., who was severely wounded while standing on the crest to direct the Corsairs to the target. Captain David G. Johnson, the air liaison officer, took his place. A total of 76 planes participated in the day's air attacks. At 0900, Captain Smith's dog company moved out to the assault with 1st Lieutenant George A. Sorensen's 3rd platoon in the lead, followed by the 2nd and 1st platoons in that order. Attacking to the northward, Sorensen was pinned down by fire from Objective A before he had covered 50 yards. This was the enemy's main forward position on East Hill, which he had held against Marine attacks ever since seizing it in the early morning hours of 29 November. First Lieutenant John R. Hines replaced Sorensen after that officer was wounded. While he engaged the enemy frontally, First Lieutenant George C. McNaughton's 2nd Platoon poured in flanking fires and First Lieutenant Richard M. Johnson's platoon executed a flanking movement. Chinese resistance suddenly collapsed about 1100. Thus it seemed almost an anticlimax that East Hill, after holding out against the Marines more than a week, should have been retaken at a cost of one man killed and three wounded. About 30 CCF dead were found. As events were to prove, however, this was but the first round in a hard-fought 22-hour battle for the Hill Mass. The next phase began at 1130, when Royce ordered Captain Peter's Fox Company to relieve Smith so that Dog Company could resume the attack against Objective B, a ridge about 500 yards to the southeast. The lower slopes of this position were now being cleared by 2-7. After a 10-minute artillery preparation, the three platoons of Dog Company jumped off at 1250. The Chinese put up a stubborn resistance and it took until 1430 to seize the new objective. Marine casualties were moderate, however, and Captain Smith set up three platoon positions along the ridge running to the south whence he could control the road leading out of Hagaru. Later in the day, the enemy appeared to be massing for a counterattack in the saddle between the two objectives. Johnson called an airstrike and all Dog and Fox Company troops within range opened up with everything they had as McNaughton led a patrol against the Chinese in the saddle. Caught between the infantry fires and the rocket and strafing runs of the Corsairs, the CCF survivors surrendered en masse to McNaughton and his platoon. About 220 prisoners were taken to set a record for the 1st Marine Division in the Reservoir Campaign. At the request of Captain Smith, the saddle between the two Marine companies was occupied by reinforcements consisting of an officer and 11 men from the Regimental AT Company and an officer and 32 men from the 4th Signal Battalion, U.S. Army. Shortly after dark, the enemy launched a vigorous counterattack. Tanks and 81mm mortars fired in support of Marines who made good use of 2.36-inch white phosphorus rockets at close range. Although the Chinese endured frightful casualties, they returned again and again to attack until midnight. It was evident that they considered this a fight to a finish for East Hill, and at 0205 they renewed the assault against all three companies of the 2nd Battalion as well as Charlie Company of the 1st Battalion. The struggle during the next three hours was considered the most spectacular if not the most fiercely contested battle of the entire Reservoir Campaign, even by veterans of the Udemni actions. Never before had they seen the Chinese come on in such numbers or return to the attack with such persistence. The darkness was crisscrossed with a fiery pattern of tracer bullets at one moment, and the next the uncanny radiance of an illumination shell would reveal Chinese columns shuffling in a trot, only to go down in heaps as they deployed. Marine tanks, artillery, mortars, rockets, and machine guns reaped a deadly harvest, 
and still the enemy kept on coming with a dogged fatalism which commanded the respect of the Marines. Looking like round little gnomes in their padded cotton uniforms, groups of Chinese contrived at times to approach within grenade-throwing distance before being cut down. The fight was not entirely one-sided. The Marines took a pounding from CCF mortars and machine guns, and by 0300, Dog Company was hard-pressed in its three extended positions pointed like a pistol at the heart of the enemy's assembly areas. Both McNaughton and the executive officer, First Lieutenant James H. Honeycutt, were wounded but remained in action. This was the second time in three months that Dog Company had spearheaded a Marine attack on a desperately defended hill complex. Northwest of Seoul in September, only 26 able-bodied men had survived to break the back of North Korean resistance. The company commander, First Lieutenant H.J. Smith, had died a hero's death at the moment of victory, and First Lieutenant Carl F. Seidel was the unit's only unwounded officer. Now another Smith commanded dog company, and Seidel was killed as enemy pressure from front and flank threatened to overwhelm the three riddled platoons. Casualties of 13 KIA and 50 WIA were taken in the battle for East Hill as Dog Company and the Provisional Platoons fell back fighting to the former Objective A and tied in with Fox Company. Along the low ground at the northern end of East Hill, the Chinese were beaten off with ruinous losses by Jaskilka's Easy Company of 2-5, Jones's Charlie Company of 1-5, and three Army tanks. Enemy troops had to cross a comparatively level expanse which provided a lucrative field of fire for Marine supporting arms. Heaps of CCF dead, many of them charred by white phosphorus bursts, were piled up in front of the Marine positions. Next, the Chinese hit Captain James B. Heater's Able Company of 1-5, still farther to the left, and overran several squad positions. One platoon was forced to withdraw to the rise on which the Division CP had previously been located. The lines were restored at 0546 with the help of Lieutenant Hancock and his Baker Company, which had been in reserve. Altogether, the 1st Battalion had suffered casualties of 10 killed and 43 wounded, while the counted CCF slain numbered 260 in front of Charlie Company and 200 in the area of Able Company. George Company of 3-1 also beat off a Chinese attack on the south of the perimeter. With the coming of daylight, these Marines found that they had one of the Chinese withdrawal routes under their guns. Mortar and rifle fire annihilated one group of about 60 enemy and another group of 15 Reds surrendered. The New Day revealed a scene of slaughter which surpassed anything the Marines had seen since the fight for the approaches of Seoul in September. Estimates of CCF dead in front of the 2nd Battalion positions on and around East Hill ran as high as 800, and certain it is that the enemy had suffered a major defeat. When Marine Air came on station, the Chinese as usual scattered for cover. About 0200, Murray ordered 3-5, which had not been in contact with the enemy during the night, to displace to the south at the head of Division Train No. 2, followed by 1-5 and Ridge's Battalion of the 1st Marines. This meant that Royce's men with a platoon of tanks and the engineers in charge of demolitions would be the last troops out of Hagaru. Attack of RCT-7 to the south During the 22-hour battle on East Hill, the 7th Marines had been attacking toward Kodori. On the eve of the breakout, the gaps in the infantry ranks were partially filled with 300 artillerymen from the 11th Marines, bringing Litzenberg's strength up to about 2,200 men. 7th Marines Operation Order 14-50 called for the advance to be initiated at first light on 6 December as follows. 1st Battalion, to move out at 0430 to clear the ground to the right of the river. 2nd Battalion, supported by tanks, to attack as advance guard along the MSR. Provisional Battalion, 31-7, to clear the ground to the left of the MSR. 3rd Battalion, to bring up the rear of the regimental train, with George Company disposed along both flanks as security for the vehicles. Daybreak revealed a peculiar silvery fog covering the Hagaru area. The 1st Battalion, with Charlie Company in assault, had as its first objective the high ground southeast of Tunneri. 
No resistance was encountered, though 24 Chinese were surprised to sleep in their positions near the objective and 17 of them killed. The 2nd Platoon of Dog Company, 1st Tank Battalion, was attached to 27 when the advance guard jumped off at 0630 from the roadblock south of Hagaru. Almost immediately, the column ran into trouble. Upon clearing the roadblock, the lead dozer tank took three hits from a 3.5 bazooka. Within 20 minutes, the column came under heavy fire from CCF positions on the high ground on the left. Fox Company, in the lead, was allowed to pass before the enemy opened up on the battalion command group, Dog Easy Company and Weapons Company. The fog prevented air support initially. When it lifted, 1st Lieutenant John G. Theros, FAC of 27, brought in Marine aircraft and 81mm fire on the CCF position. It took a coordinated attack by the two infantry companies and the tanks, however, before the resistance could be put down and the advance resumed at 1200. Two and a half hours later, the upper reaches of this hill were cleared by D5. After 2-7 and air smothered the initial Chinese resistance, Fox Company and the platoon of dog tanks advanced down the road. About 4,000 yards south of Hagaru, they met the next resistance. Although the Chinese positions were in plain sight of 1-7, neither 2-7 nor air could spot them. Colonel Litzenberg and Lieutenant Colonel Lockwood attempted to coordinate mortar fires from 2-7 with observation from 1-7, but were unsuccessful because of poor radio communications. Following an erratic artillery barrage and some good shooting by the tanks, Fox Company cleared the enemy position about 1,500, aided by a dog-easy flanking attack and the Provisional Battalion. In order to assist 2-7, Baker Company of 1-7 came down from the ridge west of the river to act as right flank guard. Meanwhile, 1-7 continued to push ahead methodically to the right of the MSR as the three rifle companies leapfrogged one another. Enemy contact was continual but no serious opposition developed during the daytime hours. On the left flank, the Provisional Battalion had several firefights, while the advance was uneventful for the 3rd Battalion following in the rear of the regimental train. About 5,000 yards had been covered by dusk. Enemy resistance stiffened after dark, as had been anticipated. The planners had realized that the movement could have been made in daylight hours with fewer losses in personnel and equipment. But intelligence of the expected arrival of CCF reinforcements influenced the decision to continue the march throughout the night, even at the cost of increased opposition. By noon, long lines of Chinese could be seen along the skyline to the east of the road moving towards the MSR. Air attacked these reinforcements but could not stop their movement, as later events proved. About 8,000 yards south of Hagaru, in Hellfire Valley, a Chinese machine gun on the left stopped the 2nd Battalion at 2200. The column was held up until midnight before Army tank fire knocked out the enemy gun. After covering 1,200 more yards, a blown bridge caused another halt while Dog Company engineers made repairs. Movement was resumed at 0200 when a second blown bridge resulted in a delay of an hour and a half before it could be bypassed. Dawn brought a significant innovation in air support. Circling above the 11-mile column inching towards Kotori was an Airborne Tactical Air Direction Center, TADC, installed in an R5D of VMR-152 and operated by Major Harlan E. Hood and his communicators from MTAX-2. Major Christian C. Lee, commanding officer of MTAX-2, had made arrangements when he realized that with his radios packed in trucks and jeeps he could not control close air support effectively. Only the addition of one radio to those standard in the aircraft was necessary to provide basic communications, but when being readied for the pre-dawn takeoff, the mission faced failure because an engine wouldn't start. Minus a refueler truck, the crew chief, Technical Sergeant H.C. Stewart, had worked all night to pour 2,400 gallons of gas into the craft by hand. Now, in the bitter cold of dawn, he set out about to overhaul the starting motor. Two hours later, Major John N. Swartley was piloting the plane over the MSR. No trouble was encountered by 2-7 along the last few miles of the route, and the battalion was first to arrive at Kotori. 
Meanwhile, the 3rd Battalion had been assigned the additional mission of replacing the Provisional Battalion as protection for the left flank as well as rear of the 7th Marines train. A brief firefight developed at about 2100 as the Chinese closed to hand grenade range. Lt. Col. Harris deployed George and Item companies around the vehicles and drove the enemy back to a respectful distance. Between 0200 and 0430, Item Company of 37 and a platoon of tanks were sent back up the road to clear out a troublesome Chinese position near Hellfire Valley. About 0200, during a halt for bridge repairs, the 7th Marines train was hit by enemy fire. The regimental command group suffered most. Captain Donald R. France and First Lieutenant Clarence E. McGinnis were killed and Lieutenant Colonel Frederick W. Dowsett was wounded while Lt. J.G. Robert G. Metemeyer, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, gave first aid, Chaplain Lt. J.G. Cornelius J. Griffin entered an ambulance to console a dying Marine. CCF machine gun bullets shattered his jaw and killed Sergeant Matthew Caruso at his side. Lt. Col. Harris and Major Roach supervised the deployment of Howe Company troops to beat off the attack. About 0530, Lt. Col. Harris disappeared. A search was made for him to no avail and he was listed as MIA. It was later determined that he had been killed. The 1st Battalion of RCT-7, after a relatively uneventful march over the high ground west of the river, moved down the slope to join the regimental column. Major Warren Morris assumed command of the 3rd Battalion, which reached Koto Ri about 0700. At about 1100, after a brief rest, the men were ordered together with Lockwood's troops to move back up along the MSR to the north and set up blocking between Kotori and Hill 1182 to keep the road open for other units of the division. While carrying out this mission, the 2nd Battalion helped to bring in 22 British Marines who had been stranded ever since the Task Force Drysdale fight on the night of 29-30 November. Their plight was not known until 4 December, when an OI pilot saw the letters H-E-L-P stamped out in the snow and airdropped food and medical supplies. Advance of the Division Trains By 1700 on 7 December, all elements of RCT-7 were in the perimeter at Koto Ri. Division Train No. 1 was due next, and the planners had hoped that the rifle battalions would clear the way for the vehicles. As it proved, however, the Chinese closed in behind RCT-7 and attacked the flanks of the convoy, with the result that the service troops actually saw more action than the infantrymen. One of the causes may be traced to the fact that Division Train No. 1 had to wait at Hagaru until 1600 on the 6th before RCT-7 made enough progress toward Kotori to warrant putting the convoy on the road. About 2,000 yards south of Hagaru, elements of the 3rd Battalion 11th Marines were hit in the early darkness by CCF mortar and small arms fire. The gunners of George and Howe batteries deployed as infantrymen and repulsed the enemy at the cost of a few casualties. Upon resuming the march, a second firefight took place after 1,500 more yards had been covered. Several vehicles, set afire by Chinese mortar shells, blocked the road and brought the convoy to a halt. At daybreak, the enemy swarmed to the attack in formidable numbers. It was nip and tuck as all pieces of Howe battery and three howitzers of George battery were in place between the trucks of the 1st MT Battalion. There was no opportunity to dig in the trails of guns employing time fire with fuses cut for ranges of 40 to 500 yards. But the Chinese were stopped cold by two hours of continuous fire after approaching within 40 yards. All but about 50 of an estimated 500 to 800 enemy were killed or wounded before the remainder fled, according to the estimate of the gunners. The convoy of the division headquarters company also had to fight its way. Small arms ammunition had been distributed throughout the column, and light machine guns were mounted on top of truckloads. All able-bodied men with the exception of drivers and radio operators walked in single file on either side of the vehicles carrying the wounded. Progress was slowed, with many halts caused by CCF fire. At 0130, several trucks were set aflame by the enemy mortar shells and 2.36 rockets. Headquarters troops deployed in roadside ditches while two machine guns manned by bandsmen kept the Chinese at a distance. 
At 0200, the clouds cleared enough to permit strikes by night hecklers of VMFN 513. They stopped the Chinese until just before daylight, when a company-sized group penetrated within 30 yards of the convoy. During this fight, Lt. Charles H. Sullivan, who measured 6 feet 4 and weighed 240 pounds, emptied his carbine at advancing Chinese. Then he hurled it like a javelin to drive the bayonet into the chest of an opponent at 15 feet. Under the coaching of the MTAC's commander, Major Lee, two more night fighters, Major Albert L. Clark and First Lieutenant Truman Clark, pinned the Chinese down with strafing runs as close as 30 yards from the Marine ground troops. At dawn, Major Percy F. Avant, Jr., and his four-plane division from VMF-312 dumped about four tons of explosives and napalm on Chinese who broke and ran for cover. The firefight at Cost Headquarters Battalion 6 KIA and 14 WIA. The MP Company, just forward of Headquarters Company, had the problem of guarding about 160 Chinese prisoners. Captives unable to walk had been left behind at Hagaru, where Lt. Col. Murray directed that the wounded be given shelter and provided with food and fuel by the departing Marines. The prisoners escorted by the MPs were lying in the middle of the road during the attack when the enemy seemed to concentrate his fire on them while shouting in Chinese. A scene of pandemonium ensued as some of the able-bodied prisoners attempted to make a break. Now the Marines as well as the enemy fired into them and 137 were killed in the wild melee. When the convoy got underway again, two communists were captured and 15 killed after being flushed out of houses in the village of Pusong-ni. At daybreak, a halt was called in Hellfire Valley for the purpose of identifying bodies of MPs and headquarters troops killed in the Task Force Drysdale battle, which were to be picked up later. Attempts to start the looted and abandoned vehicles met with no success, and the convoy continued the movement to Kotori without incident arriving about 1000 on the 7th. At this hour, the last Marine troops had not yet left Hagaru, so that the column as a whole extended the entire 11 miles of the route. Division train number 2 had formed up during the afternoon of the 6th, but was unable to start until after dark. At midnight, the train had moved only a short distance out of Hagaru. Lt. Col. Milne requested infantry support and 3-5 was given the mission of advancing at the head of the column, along with the 5th Marines regimental train, to eliminate enemy resistance. Taplet had only two companies, one of which proceeded astride the road while the other echelon to the left rear. The late start proved to be a blessing, since the Division Train No. 2 completed most of its movement by daylight under the umbrella of Marine Air and met only light and scattered resistance. The head of the column reached Kodori at 1700, and at 2300, all the major division units were in the perimeter except 2-5, the rear guard. Both 1-5 and 3-1 had formed up in Hagaru on the morning of the 7th and moved out as rapidly as traffic would permit, which was slow indeed. They were accompanied by the 41st Commando, which had earned the esteem of all U.S. Marines by valor in combat. British imperturbability was at its best when Lt. Col. Drysdale held an inspection shortly before departing Hagaru. Disdainful of the scattered shots which were still being heard, the officers moved up and down the rigid lines, and men whose gear was not in the best possible shape were reprimanded. By 1000, nobody was left in the battered town except Royce's battalion, 1st Lt. Vaughn R. Stewart's tank platoon, and elements of Abel Company, 1st Engineer Battalion, commanded by Captain William R. Gould. This unit and Chief Warrant Officer Willie S. Harrison's Explosive Ordnance Section of Headquarters Company Engineers were attached to the 5th Marines for the mission of the demolitions at Hagaru. Gould had formed five demolition teams, each composed of an officer and four to six men. On the evening of 6 December, they began preparations for burning stockpiles of surplus clothing and equipment along with the buildings of the Hagaru train yard. There was also the duty of placing charges in the dumps of mortar and artillery ammunition which could not be transported to Hagaru. One of the main problems was the disposal of a small mountain of frozen surplus rations. A team of engineers spent hours on the 6th at the task of smashing cans and crates of food with a bulldozer and saturating the dump with fuel oil. 
The Able Company engineers came under the operational control of the 2nd Battalion after the other units of the 5th Marines departed. Demolitions were to await the order of Lt. Col. Royce on the morning of the 7th. Hagaru was full of combustibles, however, and fires of mysterious origin sent up dense clouds of smoke before the engineers touched off the oil-soaked food supplies and the buildings of the train yard. As the Marines of 2-5 pulled back toward the southern tip of East Hill, smoke blotted out the surrounding area so that enemy movements could not be detected. Worse yet, premature explosions sent up fountains of debris just as the engineers were setting up their fuses for a 20-minute delay. Detonations shook the earth on all sides. Rockets sliced through the air, shells shattered into vicious fragments, and large chunks of real estate rained down everywhere. Royce was understandably furious, since his troops were in danger during their withdrawal. By a miracle, they came off East Hill without any casualties, and the engineers were the last Marines left in Hagaru. Soon the entire base seemed to be erupting like a volcano. Visibility was reduced to zero when the engineers pulled out, after setting a last tremendous charge to blow the bridge. So compelling was the lure of loot that small groups of Chinese came down from the high ground toward the man-made hell of flame and explosions. Between clouds of smoke they could be seen picking over the debris, and the marine tanks cranked off a few rounds at targets of opportunity. It is not likely that any of Royce's weary troops paused for a last sentimental look over their shoulders at the dying Korean town. Hagaru was not exactly a pleasure resort, and yet hundreds of Marines and soldiers owed their lives to the fact that this forward base had enabled the division to evacuate all casualties and fly in replacements while regrouping for the breakout to the seacoast. If it had not been for the forethought of the division and wing commanders, with the concurrence of General Almond, there would have been no R-4D airstrip, no stockpiles of ammunition, rations, and medical supplies. And though the Marines might conceivably have fought their way out of the CCF encirclement without Hagaru, it would have been at the cost of abandoning much equipment and suffering much higher casualties. Only a few weeks before, this Korean town had been merely an unknown dot on the map. But on 7 December 1950, the name was familiar to newspaper readers and radio listeners all over the United States as they anxiously awaited tidings of the breakout. Already, it had become a name to be remembered in U.S. Marine annals along with such historical landmarks as Bella Wood, Guadalcanal, Peleliu, and Iwo Jima. Prospects of a warm meal and a night's sleep meant more than history to Royce's troops when the column moved out at last shortly after noon with the engineers bringing up the rear to blow bridges along the route. A pitiful horde of Korean refugees followed the troops, thousands of men, women, and children with such personal belongings as they could carry. Efforts on the part of the engineers to warn the refugees of impending demolitions were futile. Although these North Koreans had enjoyed for five years the blessings of communist government, the prospect of being left behind to tender mercies of the Chinese communists was so terrifying that they took appalling risks. Knowing that a bridge was about to be blown up at any instant, they swarmed across in a blind panic of flight. Never did war seem more harsh or its victims more pathetic. The rear guard had less air and artillery support than any of the preceding troops, yet CCF opposition was confined to scattered small arms fire all the way to Hellfire Valley. There the enemy lobbed over a few mortar shells during the long halt at dusk, but the rest of the advance was uneventful. Gould's engineers took chances repeatedly of being cut off when they fell behind to burn abandoned vehicles or blow bridges. On several occasions, a small group found itself entirely isolated as the infantry and even the refugees pushed on ahead. Luckily, the engineers made it without any casualties, and by midnight, the last troops of the 1st Marine Division had entered the perimeter at Kotori. Thus, the first stage of the division breakout came to a close. In proportion to total numbers, the service troops of Division Train No. 1 had taken the heaviest losses, 6 killed and 12 wounded for the Division Headquarters Company, 1 killed and 16 wounded for the Military Police Company, 4 killed and 28 wounded for the 1st Motor Transport Battalion, one killed and 27 wounded for the 1st Ordnance Battalion, and three killed and 34 wounded for the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Marines. 
Battle casualties for the entire 1st Marine Division, including those of the East Hill Battle, were as follows. KIA, 83. DOW, 20. MIA, 7. WIA, 506. Total, 616. About 38 hours were required for the movement of some 10,000 troops and more than 1,000 vehicles. The new arrivals filled the perimeter at Kotori to the bursting point, but there was to be no pause at this point. Division Operation Order 26-50, issued at 18.15 on the 7th, before the last troops had arrived, provided for the advance to be resumed from Kotori at first light the following morning. End of Chapter 13, Part 2 Read by Aaron Bennett Chapter 14, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Onward from Koto Ri. The progress of the 1st Marine Division breakout depended in no small degree on the reliable communications provided by the division radio relay linking up Hagaru, Kodori, Chinhungni, and Hungnam. At 14.40 on 6 December, the vehicles of the Hagaru Relay Terminal joined Division Train No. 1, whereupon the station at Kodori became in turn the terminal. This station was located on the highest point of ground just south of the Kodori perimeter. And though it was outside the defense area, the Chinese did not bother it until the Marines were breaking camp. Then the opposition consisted of only harassing small arms fires instead of the attack which might have been expected. In fact, the enemy did not launch another large-scale assault on Kotori after his costly repulse on the night of 28-29 to 29 November. Although the perimeter was surrounded throughout the first six days of December, Incipient CCF attacks were broken up in the enemy's assembly areas. Excellent observation as well as casualty evacuation was provided by the OYs taking off from the Kotori airstrip. They were the eyes of an impressive array of marine firepower, tanks, 4.2-inch and 81mm mortars as well as aircraft and Captain McClellan's Easy Battery of 211. The artillery 105s and the mortars did a grand job, commented Major Bartley. They were always available, shifted their fires quickly and accurately, and serviced their pieces amazingly well in the cold weather. As a further asset, the Kotori perimeter was defended by adequate numbers in comparison to Hagaru during the first critical week of CCF attacks. On 30 November, when Baker Company of the 1st Tank Battalion returned to Kotori after the Task Force Drysdale battle, Three platoons of tanks were added to the Dog Company platoon already attached to 2-1. The next day, Colonel Puller's RCT-1- was further strengthened by the arrival of the 2nd Battalion of the 31st Infantry, 7th Infantry Division, the last unit to reach Kotori from the south. These army troops had been ordered to Hagaru, but owing to the changing situation, they were directed by 10 Corps on 1 December to remain at Kotori. Under the operational control of Colonel Puller, 231 took over a sector at the southern end of the perimeter. Sporadic CCF small arms fire was received on each of the first six days of December, and enemy troop movements were observed at all points of the compass. On several occasions, a few mortar shells were lobbed into the perimeter. Not a single Marine casualty was suffered during the period though CCF losses were estimated at 646 killed and 322 wounded. Daily airdrops were required to keep the perimeter supplied with ammunition, rations, and other essentials. Captain Norman Vining, the battalion FAC, who had once been a carrier landing signal officer, guided planes to satisfactory drop zones with makeshift paddles. One day, a case of 30 caliber cartridges broke free from its chute and hurtled through the top of Lieutenant Colonel Sutter's tent during a conference. Narrowly missing several officers, it hit the straw at their feet and bounced high into the air before landing on a crate used as a table. Assembly of Division at Kotori Kotori being second only to Hagaru as an advance base, Colonel Puller at times had responsibilities which are usually shouldered by an ADC. 
On 29 November, he had been the organizer of Task Force Drysdale, and on 6 December, it became his task to make ready for the reception of the 10,000 troops from Hagaru. Although the Kotori perimeter was already overcrowded, Puller directed that hot food and warming tents be provided for all Hagaru troops upon arrival. More than 14,000 men would then be organized for the next stage of the breakout. Strength estimates were as follows. Marine garrison at Kotori, 2,640. U.S. Army units at Kotori, 1,535. Royal Marine commandos at Kotori, 25. Marines arriving from Hagaru, 9,046. U.S. Army troops arriving from Hagaru, 818. Royal Marine commandos arriving from Hagaru, 125. Rock police attached to RCT-5, 40. Total, 14,229. Puller dealt with the problem of casualty evacuation at Kotori by ordering that the OY strip be lengthened so that larger aircraft could land. The engineers of Charlie Company started the job on 6 December, and progress speeded up as the Dog Company engineers arrived next day from Hagaru with their heavy equipment. The strip had been widened by 40 feet and extended by 300 on 7 December when the first TBM landed. These planes had been borrowed from the Navy and First Ma administrative flight lines and assigned to VMO-6. They could fly out several litter patients and as many as nine ambulatory cases. Captain Alfred F. McCaleb Jr. of VMO-6 and First Lieutenant Truman Clark of VMFN-513 evacuated a total of 103 casualties. The carrier landing training of the Marines stood them in good stead as Captain Malcolm G. Moncrief, Jr., a qualified landing signal officer of VMF-312, directed the TBMs to their landings at Kotori with paddles. The clearing station established at Kotori by Company D of the 1st Medical Battalion, Lt. Commander Gustav T. Anderson, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, had a normal bed capacity of only 60, but somehow continued to handle a total of 832 cases, including non-battle casualties. The Company D medics were assisted during their last few days at Kotori by Captain Herring, the division surgeon, and Commander Howard A. Johnson, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, the CO of the 1st Medical Battalion. Captain Richard S. Silvis, Medical Corps, U.S. Navy, surgeon of the 2nd Marine Division, on temporary duty in Korea as an observer, also took an active part. Surgical assistance was welcomed by the Company D medics, since operations at Kotori were performed under the most difficult conditions. Only tents being available for patients, the hundreds of casualties brought from Hagaru added to the necessity for speedy evacuation. About 200 cases were flown out on the 7th by TBMs and liaison aircraft. By the following morning, the engineers had lengthened the OY strip to 1,750 feet, but a heavy snowfall put an end to nearly all air activity. In spite of the risks involved, one Air Force C-47 did get through to Kotori, where it could be heard but not seen while circling blindly about the perimeter. By a miracle, the plane landed safely and took off with 19 casualties. The following day saw air evacuation of casualties in full swing, with about 225 being flown out to clear the hospital tents of all serious cases. Activation of Task Force Dog A large tent in the middle of the perimeter served both as office and sleeping quarters for General Smith and his staff. Planning was immediately resumed after they arrived at Kotori on the afternoon of 6 December. Before leaving Hagaru, it had been recognized that the enemy might be saving his main effort for the mountainous 10-mile stretch from Kotori to Chinhungni. In such terrain, a mere CCF platoon could do a great deal of mischief, and the planners agreed that it would be necessary for 1-1 to attack northward from Chinhungni and clear the road. This meant that the battalion must be relieved by an army unit, and a request was made verbally to General Almond. Ten Corps had received orders on 1 December for the 3rd Infantry Division to assemble in the Wonsan area prepared for further operations, possibly to join 8th Army in West Korea. Although General Almond initiated execution of the order immediately, he sent the highest-ranking Marine officer on his staff, Colonel Forney, 
and the Corps G-2, Lieutenant Colonel William W. Quinn, to Tokyo to explain the implications of the withdrawal to this Army division from Northeast Korea. Following a conference with General Hickey, GHQ Chief of Staff, the division was released back to Ten Corps on the 3rd, and General Almond ordered it to return to the Hamhung area to protect this vital port area and to assist the breakout of the 1st Marine Division by relieving 1-1 at Chinhung Ni. At 21.15 on 6 December, the 1st Marine Division requested by dispatch that the relief be completed the next day in order to free 1-1 for the attack to the north. The relief column, designated Task Force Dog and commanded by Brigadier General Armistead D. Meade, ADC of the 3rd Infantry Division, consisted of the 3rd Battalion, 7th Infantry, the 92nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion, plus detachments of engineers, signalmen, and anti-aircraft troops. Brushing aside some Chinese roadblocks, it arrived at Chinhung Ni on the afternoon of the 7th and relieved 1-1 immediately. Airdrop of Bridge Sections Another problem which the 1st Marine Division planners had faced at Hagaru called for an engineering solution. As early as 4 December, the commanding general was notified that a critical bridge three and a half miles south of Koto Ri had been blown by the enemy for the third time. At this point, water from the chosen reservoir was discharged from a tunnel into four penstocks, or large steel pipes, which descended sharply down the mountainside to the turbines of the power plant in the valley below. Where the pipes crossed the road, they were covered on the uphill side by a concrete gatehouse without a floor. On the downhill side was the one-way bridge over the penstocks which the enemy had thrice destroyed. Between the cliff and the sheer drop down the mountainside there was no possibility of a bypass. Thus the gap of 16 feet, 24 feet counting the abutments, must be spanned if the division was to bring out its vehicles, tanks, and guns. Following the destruction of the original concrete bridge, the enemy had blown a temporary wooden structure and an M2 steel treadway span installed by Army engineers. No prefabricated bridging was available at Hagaru, and time did not permit the construction of a timber trestle bridge. The possibility of Bailey Bridge sections was considered but rejected for technical reasons. Finally, after a detailed study of the break from the air on 6 December, Lt. Col. Partridge estimated that four sections of an M2 steel treadway bridge would be required. Prospects did not appear bright when a bridge section was badly damaged on the 6th after being test dropped at Yanpo by an Air Force C-119. Nevertheless, it was decided to go ahead the next day with the drop at Koto Ri. There were four U.S. Army Treadway Bridge, Brockway, trucks at Koto Ri, two of which were operative. After conferring with 1st Lieutenant George A. Babe of the 1st Engineer Battalion and Colonel Hugh D. McGaw of the 185th Engineer C. Battalion, U.S. Army, Partridge decided to request a drop of eight sections in order to have a 100% margin of safety in case of damage. After analyzing the causes of the unsuccessful test drop, Captain Blazengame of the Air Delivery Platoon had larger parachutes flown to Yanpo from Japan, accompanied by Captain Cecil W. Hospelhorn, U.S. Army, and a special crew of Army parachute riggers. Blazengame and a 100-man work detail from the 1st Amphibian Tractor Battalion worked all night at Yanpo to make ready for the drop next day by eight C-119s of the Air Force. At 0930 on 7 December, three of the 2,500-pound bridge sections were dropped inside the Koto Ri perimeter and recovered by the Brockway trucks. The remaining five sections were delivered by noon, one of them falling into the hands of the Chinese and one being damaged. Plywood center sections were also dropped so that the bridge could accommodate any type of marine wheel or tracked vehicle. Thus the tanks could cross on the metal spans only, while the trucks could manage with one wheel on the metal span and the other on the plywood center. All the necessary equipment having been assembled at Koto Ri by the late afternoon of the 7th, the next problem was to transport it three and a half miles to the bridge site. Colonel Bowser, the Division G3, directed the engineers to coordinate their movements with the progress made by RCT-7 the following morning. Lieutenant Colonel Partridge attended a briefing conducted by Colonel Litzenberg on the eve of the assault 
and it was agreed that the trucks with the bridge section would accompany the regimental train. First Lieutenant Ewald D. Vom Ord's 1st Platoon of Company D Engineers was designated as the escort. First Lieutenant Charles C. Ward's engineers led the 7th Marines trains. Both platoons were assigned the task of installing the bridge sections. Division Planning for Attack On the assumption that the gap over the penstocks would be successfully spanned, the 1st Marine Division issued Operation Order 26-50 at 1850 on 7 December. Although the last operation order had specified the Hamhung area as the objective, it was found necessary at Koto Ri to give more explicit instructions for the advance to the southward. The plan was simple. Recognizing the sharp cleft in Funchalin Pass as the most difficult defile of the entire breakout, General Smith ordered the seizure of the heights overlooking the pass from the north end of Hill 1081, dominating the road through the pass. In its details, the plan shaped up as follows. 1. RCT-7, reinforced with the Provisional Army Battalion, to attack south from Koto Ri at 0800 on 8 December and seize objectives A and B, the first being the southern extension of Hill 1328, about 2,500 yards southwest of Koto Ri, and the other, the second nose, due south of Koto Ri. 2. RCT-5 to attack and seize Objective D, Hill 1457, two and a half miles south of Koto Ri, while RCT-7 continued its attack and seized Objective C, a nose dominating the MSR two and three-fourths miles south of Koto Ri. 3. At 0800, as RCT-7 jumped off at Koto Ri, the 1st Battalion of RCT-1 was to attack from Chinhung Ni and seize Objective E, Hill 1081, three miles to the north. 4. RCT-1, less the 1st Battalion but reinforced by 231, was to protect Koto Ri until the division and regimental trains cleared, whereupon it was to relieve RCTs 5 and 7 on objectives A, B, C, and D. 5. Upon relief by RCT-1, RCTs 5 and 7 were to proceed south along the MSR to the Hamhung area. 6. RCT-1 was to follow RCT-5 and protect the division rear. Artillery plans provided for one battery of 211 and one of 311 to answer the calls of RCT-7 for supporting fires. The other batteries of 311 were to move south with the motor column while two batteries of 111 supported RCT-5. The remaining battery of 311 was attached to 211 with the mission of moving south to Chinhung Ni and taking a position from which to support the withdrawal of RCT-1 as rear guard. Easy Battery of 211, left behind at Koto Ri, was laid to fire to the north and west, while Fox Battery of 211 and the 92nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion at Chinhung Ni supported the attack of 1-1 on Hill 1081. The plan of the 1st Ma for air support was essentially the same as the one which provided so effective during the advance from Hagaru to Koto Ri. An objective lesson of that movement had been the personnel and equipment losses suffered by the division trains as a consequence of a late start. The planners were determined not to repeat this mistake. As a further precautionary measure, General Smith directed that the tanks form the last elements of the motor column. Thus, in the event of a breakdown on the twisting, single-lane road, it would not be necessary to abandon all the vehicles behind a crippled tank. As for the enemy situation, G-2 summaries indicated that early in December the CCF-26 Corps, consisting of the 76th, 77th, and 78th Divisions, reinforced by the 94th Division of the 32nd Corps, had moved down from the north and taken positions on the east side of the MSR between Hagaru and Koto Ri. There they relieved the 60th Division, which moved into the area south of Koto Ri. The 76th and 77th Divisions occupied positions along the MSR in the Koto Ri area, while the 78th and 94th Divisions were apparently held in reserve. Elements of the 89th Division, operating from the mountainous area southwest of Koto Ri, conducted harassing operations against the MSR in the vicinity of Chinhung Ni as well as Koto Ri. 
The 60th CCF Division held prepared positions on the high ground south of Kotori commanding Funchalin Pass and the MSR leading to Chinhung Ni. That these positions included Hill 1081, the dominating terrain feature, was revealed by prisoners taken in the vicinity by patrols of the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines, prior to 8 December. Battle of 1-1 in the Snowstorm Division plans had not called for the swirling snowstorm which reduced visibility to 50 feet and precluded air support at first light on 8 December. In spite of weather conditions, the assault battalions of RCT-7 moved out from Kotori on schedule after 1-1 attacked northward from Chinhung Ni. The planners had realized that the success of the movement to Chinhung Ni would depend to a large extent on the seizure of Objective E, Hill 1081. On 2 December, Lt. Col. Schmuck had led a reconnaissance patrol into Funchalin Pass as far north as this position. Citing large numbers of Chinese on both sides of the road, he called for artillery fires with good effect. The reconnaissance did much to establish Hill 1081 as the key terrain feature. Although 1-1 had patrolled aggressively, the battalion had engaged in no large-scale action so far in the reservoir campaign. The men were fresh, well-rested, and spoiling for a fight when they moved out at 0200 on 8 December from an assembly area south of Chinhung Ni after being relieved by Task Force Dog. Schmuck's battle plan provided for three companies to advance in column along the MSR in the pre-dawn darkness. Since orders were to attack at 0800, a start at 0200 was considered necessary in order to make the six-mile approach march. Captain Ray's Charlie Company, in the lead, was to take Objective 1, the southwestern nose of Hill 1081, and hold it while the other two companies passed through to carry out their missions. Captain Barrow's Able Company was to attack east of the MSR and fight its way to the summit of Hill 1081, and Captain Noren's Baker Company to advance to the left flank along the slopes between Barrow and the MSR. The combination of snow and darkness reduced visibility almost to zero as 1-1 set out along the slippery MSR five hours before daybreak. All heavy equipment had been sent to the rear from Chinhung Ni, and the only vehicles were two ambulances and a radio jeep. In the snow-muffled silence of the night, the men took on protective coloring as feathery flakes clung to their parkas. Objective 1 was seized shortly after dawn, following a difficult approach march against negligible resistance. The battalion commander prepared for the next phase by bringing up 81mm mortars and an attached platoon of 4.2s and then placing those weapons in raised position. He also directed that the five attached army self-propelled quad 50 caliber and twin 40mm guns of B Company 50th AAA AW Battalion be moved to a little rise off to the left of the road in the vicinity of the village of Pehujang. From this position, they covered the MSR as far as the bridge over the penstocks. At 1000, the main attack was set in motion. Baker Company advanced along the wooded western slope of Hill 1081 as Barrow attacked up the hogback ridge leading to the summit. The snowstorm fought on the side of the Marines by hiding their movements from the Chinese occupying the high ground east of the MSR around the Great Horseshoe Bend where the road passed under the cable car line. Noren's men saw hundreds of enemy footprints but met only scattered opposition until they came to the first CCF roadblock on their left flank. There they were stopped by two machine guns, but a Marine patrol worked around on the uphill side and routed the Communists with a machine gun and 60mm mortar attack. In the absence of air and artillery support, the 4.2s and 81mm mortars emplaced in the Charlie Company position were called upon whenever visibility permitted. Surprise was Noren's best resource, however, when Baker Company came up against the CCF bunker complex on the western slope of Hill 1081. The enemy had so little warning that the Marines found a kettle of rice cooking in the largest bunker, an elaborate log and sandbag structure which had evidently been a CCF command post. The entire complex was taken after a brief but savage fight in which all defenders were killed or routed. Schmuck set up his CP in a captured bunker, where he and his officers soon discovered that several regiments of Chinese lice had not yet surrendered. Only enough daylight was left for the sending out of patrols, whereupon Noren secured for the night. 
His losses amounted to three killed and six wounded. Barrow's men had no physical contact with Baker Company while clawing their way upward along an icy ridge line too narrow for deployment. A sudden break in the snow afforded the able company commander a glimpse of a CCF stronghold on a knob between him and his objective, the topographical crest of Hill 1081. The drifting flakes cut off the view before he could direct mortar fire, but Barrow decided to attack without this support and rely upon surprise. Advancing in column along the steep and narrow approach, he sent Lieutenant Jones with two squads of the 2nd Platoon to execute a wide, enveloping movement on the left. Lieutenant McClellan's 1st Platoon had a similar mission on the right. Barrow himself led Staff Sergeant William Roach's 3rd Platoon in a front attack. It took more than an hour for the two flanking forces to get into position. Not until they had worked well around the Chinese bunker complex did Barrow give the signal for attack. Perhaps because silence had been enforced during the stealthy advance, the assault troops yelled like Indians as they closed in on the foe. Out of the snowstorm, Barrow's men erupted with maximum violence, and the enemy was too stunned to put up much of a fight. The only effective resistance came from a single CCF machine gun which caused most of the Marine casualties before Corporal Joseph Leeds and his fire team knocked it out, killing nine communists in the process. More than 60 enemy bodies were counted after the Marines cleaned out the bunkers and shot down fleeing Chinese. Barrow's losses were 10 men killed and 11 wounded. By this time, it was apparent that the Chinese had held an integrated system of bunkers and strong points extending to the summit of Hill 1081. The battalion had been strictly on its own all day, all contact with the infantry of Task Force Dog having ended with the relief. When communications permitted, however, 1-1 could count on the excellent direct support of the 92nd Armored Field Artillery Battalion, U.S. Army, commanded by Lt. Col. Leon F. Lavoie. The Army cannoneers had set up near Fox Battery of 211, using the fire control data of this Marine artillery unit. The night was clear, promising air and artillery support in the morning, as Abel Company consolidated in the captured CCF positions. Although the battalion aid station was only 700 yards away, the terrain was so difficult that litter bearers took several hours to struggle down with the Marine wounded. About midnight, the Chinese interrupted with an attack in estimated platoon strength, but Barrow's men drove them off with CCF losses of 18 killed. The rest of the night passed quietly, and Baker Company had no disturbance on the high ground overlooking the MSR. Advance of RCT-7 and RCT-5 While these events were taking place, the attack to the south from Koto Ri also fell short of the day's objectives. Colonel Litzenberg's plan called for two of his four battalions, the fourth being the Provisional Battalion of Army Troops, to clear the high ground on either side of the road so that a third battalion could advance astride the MSR, followed by the Reserve Battalion and Regimental Train. Major Morris, commanding 3-7, had been assigned the task of attacking on the right at 0800 and seizing Objective A, the southernmost of the cluster of hills known collectively as Hill 1328. He made such slow progress against CCF and small arms fire that at 1100 Colonel Litzenberg suggested the commitments of 3-7's reserve company. All three companies, replied Morris, are up there, 50 men from George, 50 men from Howe, 30 men from Item. That's it. Early in the afternoon of 8 December, Litzenberg committed his reserve, 2-7, to assist 3-7. Lockwood's battalion was on the road south of 3-7 and attacked west in an attempt to get in the rear of the enemy holding up 3-7. Easy and Fox companies attacked abreast and by 1800 the two battalions had joined on the northeastern slopes of the objective. In view of the approaching darkness, however, the attack was postponed until morning and the troops consolidated for the night short of the objective, which was seized the following morning. Litzenberg's plan for the seizure of the heights overlooking the northern entrance to Funchalin Pass provided for the Army Provisional Battalion to take Objective B. The soldiers jumped off at 0800, on the left of the MSR, supported by two tanks of the 5th Marines AT Company. By 0900, the battalion had secured its objective without meeting any resistance. 
Litzenberg then ordered a further advance of 800 yards to the northwestern tip of Hill 1457. At 1330, the Army troops secured their second objective, still without resistance, and tied in with 1-5 for the night. Lieutenant Colonel Davis, having become regimental executive officer after Dowsett was wounded, Major Sawyer took over command of 1-7. His plan called for the battalion to advance about 2,000 yards down the road and wait for 3-7 to come up on his right flank. Then the two battalions would move along together. The 1st Battalion jumped off at 0800 and reached its phase line without opposition. 1st Lieutenant Bobby B. Bradley's platoon advanced down the road to gain contact with the Chinese while the remainder of the battalion halted. When 2-7 began its attack in support of 3-7, Sawyer's battalion moved out. Bradley's patrol having run into opposition from the northern reaches of Hill 1304, Companies A and C moved west of the MSR in a double envelopment of the enemy position. Company B continued the advance towards Objective C, meeting a heavy crossfire from Chinese to their front and on Hill 1304. Lieutenant Kirkaba was killed and Lieutenants Chu In Lee and Joseph R. Owen wounded. First Lieutenant William W. Taylor took command and managed to clear the enemy from his front just before dusk. Abel and Charlie companies faced less resistance in overrunning the foxholes and two bunkers on Hill 1304. With dusk falling, Sawyer did not attempt a further advance. Abel and Charlie companies dug in on Hill 1304 while Baker set up a perimeter slightly short of Objective C. The first serials of the truck convoy had moved closely on the heels of 1-7 and had to be backed up to a level area near Objective A. There they formed a perimeter reinforced by H&S and weapons companies of 1-7. Division Operation Order 26-50 had directed Lt. Col. Murray's RCT-5 to await orders before attacking Objective D. It was nearly noon on the 8th before the 1st Battalion, in assault, was directed to move out from Kotori. Lt. Col. Stevens followed the MSR for a mile, then sent two companies out to the left to occupy the objective, Hill 1457. Baker Company seized the intervening high ground and set up to cover the attack of Charlie Company up the slopes of the ridge leading to the objective. Charlie Company fell in with a patrol from the Army Provisional Battalion attached to the RCT-7 and the two combined forces to drive the enemy off the high ground about 1550. A weak Chinese counterattack was easily repulsed, and at 1700 as darkness fell, Baker and Charlie companies tied in with the Army troops, while Abel Company formed its own perimeter overlooking the MSR. In reserve, the 41st Commando moved into the high ground behind 1-5 to guard against infiltration. The day story would not be complete without reference to the Treadway Bridge train, which moved out about 1400 on the 8th in the trace of 1-7. Instructions were to install the sections at the first opportunity, but the site had not been secured as darkness approached. A few Chinese mortar rounds falling in the vicinity of the vulnerable Brockway trucks influenced the decision to return them closer to Kotori. Summing up the attacks of 8 December, weather and terrain had done more than the enemy to prevent all assault units of the 1st Marine Division from securing their assigned objectives. Casualties had not been heavy, however, and for the most part the troops were in a position for a renewal of their efforts in the morning. As for the Kotori perimeter, the 8th had passed with only scattered small arms fire being received by the 2nd and 3rd battalions of the 1st Marines in Division Reserve. All day the Dog Company roadblock, on the route to Hagaru, was like a dam holding back the human torrent of Korean refugees. From this throng rose a low-pitched wail of misery as homeless men, women, and children huddled without shelter in the snowstorm of the 8th. It was a distressing spectacle to the Marines in the perimeter, yet the refugees could not be admitted because of the probability that Chinese soldiers had infiltrated among them, watching for an opportunity to use hidden weapons. There was little the Marines could offer by way of succor except medical care in some instances. Two women gave birth during the bitterly cold night of the 8th with the assistance of Navy medics. In the morning, the crowd of refugees, swollen by new arrivals, waited with patience of the humble to follow the Marine rearguard to the seacoast. White is the color of mourning in Korea, 
and snowflakes drifted down gently over the common grave in which 117 Marines, soldiers, and Royal Marine commandos were buried on the 8th at Kotori. Lack of time had prevented the digging of individual graves in the frozen soil. Although the necessity of conducting a mass burial was regretted, all available space in planes and vehicles was needed for the evacuation of casualties. End of chapter 14, part 1. Read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 14, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953. Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Onward from Kotori. Marine Operations of 9 and 10 December. New snow sparkled in the sunlight as the day of 9 December dawned bright, clear, and cold. A brief reconnaissance convinced Captain Noren that in the early darkness of the previous evening he had stopped one ridge short of his objective, the northwest slopes of Hill 1081, covering the approach to the cable underpass. Baker Company of 1-1 moved forward without CCF interference to the position. Captain Barrow had his men test fire their weapons before mounting the final assault on the dominating knob of the hill. This proved to be a wise precaution, since many of the mechanisms had frozen. After thawing them out, Able Company attacked in column with the 1st Platoon in the lead. Although the assault troops had the benefit of excellent air, artillery, and mortar support, they came under intense small arms fire from the Communists occupying camouflage log and sandbag bunkers. McClellan's men were hard hit, but his left flank squad worked its way forward in brief rushes to positions within 200 yards of Objective E, the topographical crest of Hill 1081. At this point, Staff Sergeant Ernest J. Umbaugh organized a squad grenade attack which wiped out the first CCF bunker. A stretch of about 175 yards, swept bare in places by the icy wind, now lay between the Marines and the final knob. Barrow perceived that this deadly CCF field of fire could be skirted by troops working their way around a shelf jutting from the military crest. Under cover of fire from his 60mm mortars and a strike by four Corsairs, he brought up his 2nd and 3rd platoons. While McClellan profited by the cover of scrub trees to come up behind the objective, Jones built up a base of fire to cover the direct assault of Roach's platoon as it stormed up the crest. McClellan had to contend with the enemy's last-ditch stand in two log bunkers which the 1st platoon knocked out by tossing grenades through the embrasures. The communists resisted to the last gasp, but at 1500 the marines were in undisputed possession of Hill 1081. Sergeant Umbaugh paid with his life at the moment of victory, and Barrow had only 111 able-bodied men left of the 223 he had let out from Chin Hung Ni. But the Marines had won the decisive battle of the advance from Kotori. They held the key height dominating Funchalin Pass, though 530 counted enemy dead testified to the desperation of the CCF defense. Able Company had the most spectacular part, but the victory owed to the united efforts of all three rifle companies in supporting arms. While Barrow held the crest of the hill, Noren pushed farther along the cable car track, meeting stubborn resistance from scattered enemy groups. The collapse of CCF resistance on Hill 1081 had a beneficial effect on the Marine advance from Kotori. RCT-7 continued its attack on the morning of the 9th with effective air and artillery support. Lieutenant Hovatter's Able Company of 1-7 seized the remainder of Hill 1304 while Lieutenant Taylor's Baker Company moved south to Objective C. The Army Provisional Battalion occupied the high ground between Objective C and D. These movements were carried out against ineffectual enemy resistance or none at all. Whenever a few communists dared to raise their heads along the MSR, the airborne TADC and the R-5D had the communications equipment to control aircraft on station and to direct their employment in response to ground force units. The 1st Battalion of RCT-5 maintained its positions on Objective D, Hill 1457, all day. At Kotori, the other two battalions and regimental headquarters made preparations to move out the following day. As a preliminary to the withdrawal of RCT-1-, from Kotori, 
The 3rd Battalion was relieved in its positions along the perimeter by the 41st Commando. Lieutenant Colonel Ridge's men then moved out to relieve 37 on Objective A and occupy Objective B. The 2nd Battalion of RCT-7, less a company with the regimental train, outposted the MSR between Objectives A and C at about 1630. Captain Morris's Charlie Company and a platoon of Baker Company, 1-7, moved down the MSR and secured the bridge site after a short fight. While Charlie Company outposted the area, the Baker platoon crossed behind the broken bridge and suddenly found about 50 Chinese in foxholes. They were so badly frozen, reported Sawyer, that the men simply lifted them from the holes and sat them on the road where Marines from Charlie Company took them over. Late in the afternoon, a patrol from 1-7 attempted to make contact with 1-1 by moving down the MSR. Chinese fire forced the men off the road, and they scrambled across the defile below the overpass and into 1-1's lines. Lieutenant Colonel Partridge arrived with Weapons Company 1-7, and the bridge sections followed in the Brockway truck. Even the enemy lent a hand when Communist prisoners were put to work as laborers. After the abutments were constructed, a Brockway truck laid the treadways and plywood panels in position so that both trucks and tanks could cross. At about 15.30, three hours after the start, the bridge was in place. Partridge drove his jeep to the top of the pass to inform Lt. Col. Banks, commanding Division Train No. 1, that he could begin the descent. Sawyer's troops had not been idle that afternoon, and a total of about 60 CCF prisoners were taken during attacks to drive the enemy back from the bridge site. At about 1700, Partridge returned, and an hour later the first elements of the division trains began to cross. Only a few vehicles had reached the other side when a disastrous accident threatened to undo everything that had been accomplished. A tractor towing an earth-moving pan broke through the plywood center panel, rendering it useless and with the treadway spaced as they were, the way was closed to wheeled vehicles. A first ray of hope glimmered when an expert tractor driver, Technical Sergeant Wilford H. Prosser, managed to back the machine off the wrecked bridge. Then Partridge did some mental calculations and came up with the answer that a total width of 136 inches would result if the treadways were placed as far apart as possible. This would allow a very slight margin at both extremes two inches to spare for the M26s on the treadways, and barely half an inch for the jeeps using the 45-inch interval between the metal lips on the inboard edges of the treadways. Thanks to skillful handling of the bulldozers, the treadways were soon respaced. And in the early darkness, Partridge's solution paid off when the first jeep crossed, its tires scraping both edges. Thus the convoy got underway again as an engineer detachment guided vehicles across with flashlights while Sawyer's troops kept the enemy at a distance. Advance reports of the bridge drop had brought press representatives flocking to Koto Ree and casualty evacuation planes. David Duncan, of Life, a former Marine, took realistic photographs of the troops which attracted nationwide attention. Keyes Beach sent out daily reports while making notes for a book about his adventures in Korea. Miss Margaret Higgins, who refused to be outdone by male colleagues, was twice requested to leave Kodori before nightfall by Marine officers, who respected her pluck as a reporter, but felt that the perimeter was no place for a woman in the event of an enemy attack. Hundreds of words were written about the bridge drop. Some of these accounts were so dramatized as to give stateside newspaper readers the impression that the span had been parachuted to earth in one piece, settling down neatly over the abutments. Headlines reported the progress of the 1st Marine Division every day, and front-page maps made every American household familiar with the names of such obscure Korean mountain hamlets as Kotori and Chinhongni. General Shepard and Colonel Frederick P. Henderson flew up to the perimeter on the 9th for a conference with General Smith. Before their departure, they were informed that all remaining casualties at Koto Ree would be evacuated that day. All night long on 9-10 to 10 December, an endless stream of troops and vehicles poured across a span that was doubtless the world's most famous bridge for the moment. The sensation throughout that night, recalled Lt. Col. Partridge in retrospect, was extremely eerie. There seemed to be a glow over everything. There was no illumination and yet you seemed to see quite well. There was artillery fire, 
and the sound of many artillery pieces being discharged. There was the crunching of the many feet and many vehicles on the crisp snow. There were many North Korean refugees on one side of the column and Marines walking on the other side. Every once in a while, there would be a baby wailing. There were cattle on the road. Everything added to the general sensation of relief, or expected relief, and was about as eerie as anything I've ever experienced in my life. Advancing jerkily by stops and starts, the column met no serious opposition from Chinese who appeared to be numbed by cold and defeat. Prisoners taken that night brought the total up to more than a hundred during the movement from Kotori to Chinhungni. Some of them were suffering from gangrene, the result of neglected frozen limbs, and others showed the effects of prolonged malnutrition. These captives testified that CCF losses from both battle and non-battle casualties had been crippling. At 0245 on the morning of the 10th, the leading elements of the 1st Battalion, RCT-7, began to arrive at Chinhung Ni. A traffic regulating post had been set up at that point the day before by Colonel Edward M. Snedeker, Division Deputy Chief of Staff, for the purpose of controlling the movement of Marine units to the south. The remaining elements of RCT-7 were strung out from Objective C to the cableway crossing of the MSR. Traffic moved without a hitch until 0400, when two trucks bogged down in a U-shaped bypass across a partially frozen stream about 2,000 yards beyond the Treadway Bridge. Major Frederick Simpson, commanding the 1st Divisional Train, had the vehicles pushed off to one side while the engineers built up the road. After a delay of three hours, the column got underway again, with the first vehicles reaching Chinhung Ni at 0830. Ultimately, both division trains got through without a fight, thanks to avoiding the delays which had caused so much trouble during the advance from Hagaru to Kotori. Following the trains, the 7th Marines moved through the pass. Lieutenant Colonel Lockwood's 27, less Company E, guarding the regimental train, led the way for the regimental command group the Provisional Army Battalion, 3-7, and the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Marines. During the early morning hours of the 10th, George Company of 3-1 beat off an attack on Objective A by an enemy force estimated at 350 men. This was the only noteworthy instance of CCF activity otherwise limited to scattered shots, and it was believed that the Communists were sideslipping southward, parallel with the MSR. Confirmation of that assumption came at 1200, when Able Company of 1-1 sighted Chinese marching in platoon and company columns through the valley only about 1,000 yards east of Hill 1081. Almost simultaneously, other dense CCF columns crossed the field of fire of the attached Army self-propelled AAA guns while pouring around an adjacent slope. Lieutenant Colonel Schmuck called immediately for airstrikes and artillery fires. Able Company hit the enemy with 4.2-inch and 81mm mortar rounds, and the Army teams cut loose with 50 cal and 40 millimeter bursts. The slaughter continued for an hour as the Chinese kept on moving southward with that fatalism which never failed to astonish the Marines. Baker Company of 1-1 launched an assault with close air support at 1300 on a CCF strong point adjacent to the railroad and north of the battalion's positions overlooking the MSR. Noren's men found 3.5-inch rocket launchers their most effective weapon when clearing the communists from heavily timbered and sandbag bunkers. Excellent close air support was received, though two Marine KIA casualties resulted from an error by Navy planes. All day the seemingly endless column of vehicles and troops wound southward along the twisting mountain road. At 10.30, General Smith and key members of his staff displaced from Kotori and proceeded by C-47 and helicopter to the rear CP of the division at Hungnam. By 1800, both division trains, all elements of RCT-7, and the 1st, 3rd, and 4th battalions of the 11th Marines had closed Chinhung Ni. There, the infantrymen in trucked for Hungnam. The 5th Marines column followed the 7th, with 3-5 leading the way and 2-5 close behind. Just south of Objective A, a brief firefight was necessary to silence a CCF machine gun, whereupon the movement continued without further incident until the two battalions reached Chinhung Ni at dusk. The 1st Battalion was not relieved by 2-1 until 1800 and did not close Chinhung Ni until the early morning hours of the 11th. 
The withdrawal of RCT-1- and detached units from Koto Ri commenced on the afternoon of the 10th. The 3rd Battalion, it will be recalled, had relieved RCT-7 units the day before on objectives A, B, and C, and the 1st Battalion occupied objective E. The regimental plan called for 1-1 to hold the Hill 1081 area and protect the MSR until the other units of the regiment passed through whereupon Schmuck's battalion was to pull out with the tanks at the end of the column as the rear guard. The movement from the Kodori perimeter commenced at 1500 when h and Company of RCT-1 departed. The 2nd Battalion Minus of the 11th Marines fell in behind, followed in order by a detachment of the 185th Sea Engineers, U.S. Army, the 2nd Battalion of the 31st Infantry, U.S. Army, the 2nd Battalion of RCT-1, the Division Reconnaissance Company, and Lt. Col. Milne's Tank Column, consisting of Companies B and D of the 1st Tank Battalion, the Tank Company of the 31st Infantry, U.S. Army, and the Tank Platoon of the 5th Marines A.T. Company. As the last elements left Koto Ri, the 92nd F.A. Battalion at Chinhungni began laying heavy concentrations on the evacuated base. Only scattered shots were received by the tail of the column from Chinese troops mingling with the Korean refugees. Several small enemy groups on the flanks of the column were taken under fire and dispersed. But with 3-1 guarding objectives A, B, and C, no serious opposition developed during the first stage of the withdrawal. Completion of Division Breakout at dusk on 10 December, all indications made it appear that the movement of the 1st Marine Division southward would be completed according to plan with only minor losses of personnel and equipment. Following the seizure of Hill 1081, casualties had been comparatively light and enemy resistance ineffectual. Then, between midnight and 0100 on 11 December, two reverses occurred in areas the Marines supposed to be safe. The MSR south of Chinhung Ni was under the protection of troops of the 3rd Infantry Division, Task Force Dog, at Chinhung Ni, and two battalions of the 65th Infantry in the vicinity of Sedong and Majandong. It was manifestly impossible, of course, for the Army troops to guard every yard of the road, for the rugged terrain offered many potential ambush sites. Guerrilla activity had been reported near Sedong, but the division trains and the 5th and 7th Marines had passed through without incident. On the afternoon of the 10th, Korean civilians warned of an impending attack by Chinese soldiers who had infiltrated into this village. As previously indicated, Colonel Snedeker had arrived at Chinhung Ni the previous afternoon. At his suggestion, Task Force Dog sent out an infantry patrol which returned with a report of no enemy activity. At dusk, an attack on the traffic turnaround outside Sudong caused Snedeker to halt all traffic at Chinhung Ni until the MSR was cleared. After a firefight in the darkness, elements of the 65th Infantry reported at dusk that the enemy roadblock had been cleared and the Marine Column resumed its movement southward. During the next few hours, Colonel Snedeker's worst problem was lack of transport. The division had requested that the maximum number of trucks, ambulances, and narrow-gauge freight cars be collected at Majandong, the new railhead. Only about 150 trucks were actually made available, however, 110 of them being from division service units in the Hungnam area. In spite of this shortage, the flow of traffic was being maintained when an explosion of CCF activity brought everything to a stop at Sudong shortly after midnight. Mountain defiles had usually been the scene of enemy ambushes, but this time the Chinese swarmed out from behind houses in the village with grenades and burp guns. Several truck drivers of the RCT-1 regimental train were killed by the first shots and their vehicles set on fire. In the flickering light, a confused fight ensued as trucks to the rear stopped. The Marines of the RCT-1 train resisted as best they could, but leadership was lacking until Lt. Col. John U.D. Page, U.S. Army, and Marine PFC Marvin L. Wasson teamed up as a two-man task force which routed a group of about 20 Chinese at the head of the vehicle column. The valiant Army artillery officer paid with his life, and Wasson received two wounds from a grenade explosion. Pausing only for first aid, he got back into the fight as another Army officer, Lt. Col. Walden C. Winston, commanding the 52nd Transportation Truck Battalion, U.S. Army, 
directed a counterattack by Marine and Army service troops. Harry Smith, a United Press correspondent, also had a part in the action. Wasson called for a machine gun to cover him while he fired three white phosphorus rounds from a 75mm recoilless at a house serving the enemy as a stronghold. It burst into flames and the survivors who ran out were cut down by machine gun fire. The Marine PFC, a Jeep driver who was dubbed the Spirit of 76 by Winston, then volunteered to help push trucks of exploding ammunition off the road. Winston gradually brought order out of chaos, but it was daybreak before the MSR was cleared so that the column could start moving again. The RCT-1 regimental train had suffered casualties of 8 killed and 21 wounded, while equipment losses consisted of 9 trucks and an armored personnel carrier. Lack of infantry protection was a factor in another reverse which occurred at the tail of the division column. General Smith's final orders for withdrawal provided that the tanks were to come out behind the 1st Marine's train, with the infantry of that regiment bringing up the rear. Thus a breakdown in the armored column would not block the road for wheeled vehicles, yet the tanks would have protection against close-in attack. The 1st Marines prepared detailed plans for the leapfrogging of battalions during the final withdrawal phase. In effect, these called for 2-1 to relieve 1-5 on Objective D and remain there until relieved in turn by 2-31. The Army Battalion would hold until 3-1 passed through, then follow Ridge's Battalion down the MSR. After 2-1, 3-1, and 2-31 had passed through Lt. Col. Schmuck's positions around Hill 1081, 1-1 would follow as rear guard. The first departure from plan occurred when Lt. Col. Sutter discovered after starting up Hill 1457, that Objective D was so far from the road and so steep that most of the night would be required merely for the battalion to make the climb. No enemy having been sighted, he asked permission to return to the road and continue along the MSR. This request was granted by Colonel Puller and 2-1 resumed the march, followed by 211 minus 231 and h and Company of RCT-1 in that order. Lieutenant Colonel Ridge's 3-1, which remained on objectives A, B, and C until 2100, fell in at the end of the regimental column. About midnight, after waiting for 3-1 to move down the pass, the tank column began its descent with only recon company as protection. Lieutenant Hargett's platoon of 28 men guarded the last 10 tanks and the other two platoons screened the middle and head of the column. Behind the last machine, approaching as close as they dared, were the thousands of refugees. CCF soldiers had mingled with them, watching for an opportunity to strike, and Hargett had the task of keeping the Koreans at a respectful distance. Progress was slow as the 40 tanks inched around the icy curves with lights on and dismounted crewmen acting as guides. Shortly before 0100, the ninth machine from the rear had a brake freeze which brought the tail of the column to a halt for 45 minutes. The rest of the tanks clanked on ahead, leaving the last nine stranded along the MSR southwest of Hill 1457 and about 2,000 yards from the Treadway Bridge. The enemy took advantage of the delay when five CCF soldiers emerged in file from among the refugees as a voice in English called that they wished to surrender. Hargett went to meet them cautiously, covered by Corporal George A.J. Amiot's bar. Suddenly, the leading Chinese stepped aside to reveal the other four producing hidden burp guns and grenades. Hargett pulled the trigger of his carbine, but it failed him in the sub-zero cold. The former All-Marine football star then hurled himself at the enemy group, swinging his carbine. He crushed a Chinese skull like an eggshell, but a grenade explosion wounded him as the ambush developed into an attack from the high ground on the flank as well as the rear. Before the remaining four Chinese could do Hargett any further harm, Amiot shot them down one by one. The fight turned into a wild melee in which friend could hardly be distinguished from foe. Hargett's platoon slowly fell back until the last tank was lost to the enemy along with its crew. The men in the next-to-last tank had buttoned up and could not be aroused to their danger by banging on the hull with rifle butts. While making the effort, Hargett was stunned by an enemy explosive charge which blew PFC Robert D. DeMont over the sheer drop at the side of the road, leaving him unconscious on a ledge. 
The other men of his platoon believed that he had been killed and continued their withdrawal, only to find the next seven tanks abandoned with their hatches open. Amiot, wearing body armor, was covering their retirement, firing from prone, when a CCF grenade exploded after landing squarely on his back. The Chinese must have suspected black magic when he went on coolly picking off opponents as if nothing had happened. It was a precarious situation for Hargett and his remaining 24 men. But they fought their way out without further casualties, and meanwhile tank crewmen had succeeded in freeing the brake of the lead tank and driving two tanks down the road. One of them was brought out by Corporal C.P. Lett, who had never driven before. I'm going to get this tank out of here even if I get killed doing it, he told Hargett. By sheer determination, coupled with luck, he maneuvered around the obstacles ahead and down the icy road to safety. Captain Gould and his demolitions crew of engineers had been waiting for hours to blow the Treadway Bridge after the last elements of the division crossed. With the passage of the two tanks and Hargett's platoon, it was believed that all Marines who could be extricated were safely over the span. On this assumption, which later proved to be erroneous, Chief Warrant Officer Willie Harrison set off the demolition charges. The losses of the recon platoon were three MIA, two of them later changed to KIA, and 12 wounded. Crews of the two rear tanks were missing and presumed dead. Hargett's losses would have been more severe except for the fact that some of his men were wearing marine body armor made of lightweight plastics. To another man of Hargett's platoon went the distinction of being the last Marine out at the finish of the Chosen Reservoir breakout. When durable PFC DeMott recovered consciousness after being blown over the brink by the CCF pack charge explosion, he found himself precariously perched on a ledge overhanging the chasm. Slightly wounded, he managed to climb back on the road where he encountered only Korean refugees. Upon hearing a tremendous detonation, he realized that the bridge had been blown. He remembered, however, that pedestrians could cross through the gatehouse above the penstocks, and he came down the mountain with the refugees to Chinhung Ni. There he was given a welcome befitting one who has cheated death of a sure thing. The remaining tanks made it safely to Chinhung Ni without benefit of infantry protection other than what was afforded by Recon Company. Lieutenant Colonel Schmuck did not receive a copy of the 1st Marine Operation Order 16-50, he explained, his only information being a frago designating 1-1 as rear guard and a hasty 30-second conference with Colonel Puller when the 1st Marine Command Group passed through. I was informed, he added, that the tanks were in the rear of the 1st Marines, that 2nd Battalion, 31st Infantry, was bringing up the rear, and that as soon as that unit passed, I would employ my battalion as rear guard. No mention at all was made of the reconnaissance company. In order to check off the units that passed endlessly through my lines, I established a checkpoint at the Incline Railway overpass and kept a close record of movements. A great deal of intermingling of units was observed by the 1-1 commander. At 0300, after sighting the lights of the tanks, he gave orders for Abel Company to commence the withdrawal in order to consolidate my battalion for the rear guard action prior to daybreak. When the first tanks reached my position, I was first startled to find no 231 accompanying them and then flabbergasted to discover that the recon company was somewhere out there screening the movement. This canceled my carefully laid covering plan. No further trouble resulted for the tanks and recon company. Ahead of them, the infantry units continued the movement southward from Chinung Ni, chiefly by marching because of the shortage of trucks. Lieutenant Colonel Sutter's men proved that foot slogging is not a lost art by covering the 22 miles from Koto Ri to Majon Dong in a 20 hour hike with packs, heavy parkas, individual weapons, and sleeping bags. Battle casualties of the division for the final stage, the attack from Koto Ri southward, were as follows. KIA 51, DOW 24, MIA 16, WIA 256, total 347. At 1300 on 11 December, the last elements of the division cleared Chinhung Ni. Majon Dong had been left behind at 1730 without audible regrets, and by 2100, all units, 
with the exception of the tanks, had reached assigned assembly areas in the Hamhung Hungnam area. The armored column arrived at the LST staging area of Hungnam half an hour before midnight, thus bringing to an end the breakout of the 1st Marine Division. End of chapter 14, part 2, read by Aaron Bennett. Chapter 15, Part 1 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hungnam Redeployment Wave and look happy. These were the first words to greet some of the wary, unshaven Marines upon arrival in the Hamhung Hungnam area. They grinned obligingly in response to the press photographer snapping pictures of the motor column from the roadside. They were happy indeed to be back in a world of hot meals and hot baths. They were happy to be alive. Marines and attached army troops found it astonishing as well as flattering to learn that such expressions as epic and saga and miracle of deliverance were being applied to the breakout in American newspapers. The press correspondents in turn were astonished to learn that never for a moment had the men doubted that they would slug their way out to the sea coast. The running fight of the Marines and two battalions of the Army's 7th Infantry Division from Hagaru to Hamhung, 40 miles by air but 60 miles over the icy, twisting, mountainous road, was a battle unparalleled in U.S. military history, commented Time. It had some aspects of Bataan, some of Anzio, some of Dunkirk, some of Valley Forge, some of the Retreat of the 10,000, 401 to 400 B.C., as described in Xenophon's Anabasis. Not until the Marines had fought their way as far as Chinhung Ni, the weekly news magazine continued, did there appear to be much hope that they would come out as an organized force. Then, for the first time, it looked as if most of the 20,000 Marines would get through. By reading contemporary press accounts, it is possible to recapture the mood of the American public upon realization of the disaster which had overtaken the 8th Army. It was defeat, the worst defeat the United States ever suffered, reported Time in the issue of 11 December 1950. The nation received the fearful news from Korea with a strange seeming calmness, the kind of confused, fearful, half-believing matter-of-factness with which many a man has reacted upon learning that he has cancer or tuberculosis. The news of Pearl Harbor, nine years ago to the month, had peeled out like a fire bell. But the numbing facts of the defeat in Korea seeped into the national consciousness slowly out of a jumble of headlines, bulletins, and communiques. Days passed before its enormity finally became plain. Newsweek called it, America's worst military licking since Pearl Harbor. Perhaps it might become the worst military disaster in American history. Barring a military or diplomatic miracle, the approximately two-thirds of the U.S. Army that had been thrown into Korea might have to be evacuated in a new Dunkirk to save them from being lost in a new baton. Footnote. Newsweek, 36, number 24, 11 December 50, 11. Such quotations, comments General MacArthur, referring to the excerpts from Time and Newsweek, certainly do not reflect the mood of the American public at the time, but rather the emotional reaction of irresponsible writers. Neither of the two news magazines had the slightest access to the basic information and factors which involved the decisions and operations of our government and its higher military commanders. The unreliability of these non-professional estimates of the situation is indeed eloquently demonstrated by comparing them with the actual military reports by the commands involved. General D. MacArthur, Letter to Major General E. W. Snedeker, 17 October 56. The situation in West Korea was depressing enough, but at least the 8th Army had a line of retreat left open. It was with apprehension that the American public stared at front-page maps showing the entrapment of the 1st Marine Division and attached U.S. Army units and British Marines by Chinese forces. Press releases from Korea did not encourage much expectation that the encircled troops could save themselves from destruction by any means other than surrender. 
In either event, the result would be a military catastrophe without parallel in the nation's history. The first gleam of hope was inspired by the news that the Marines had seized the initiative at Udemni and cut a path through Chinese blocking the route to Hagaru. Then came the thrilling reports of airdrops of supplies at Hagaru and the mass evacuation of casualties by air. Much of the humiliation felt by newspaper readers was wiped clean by pride as General Smith's troops fought through to Kotori and Chinhungni in sub-zero cold. The airdrop of the bridge sections was a dramatic climax to the realization that what had been a hope was now a fact. The chosen reservoir troops had saved themselves and inflicted a major defeat on the Chinese communists in the doing. Testimony of POWs had left no doubt that the mission of the three CCF Corps was the annihilation of the surrounded United States forces, but the result had been enemy losses which did not fall far short of annihilation of the CCF units themselves. It was in a spirit of prayerful thanksgiving, therefore, that Americans read about the column of grimy, parka-clad men which came out of the mountains of Northeast Korea on 11 December 1950. They had come out fighting, and they had brought their wounded and most of their equipment out with them. Marines billeted in Hungnam area. As late as 9 December, it had been General Smith's understanding that the 1st Marine Division would occupy a defensive sector south and southwest of Hungnam. Then Colonel McAllister at Hungnam was notified by Ten Corps that plans for the defense of the Hungnam area had been changed, so that the Marines were to embark immediately for redeployment by water to South Korea. General Smith was informed on the 10th, and so promptly was the new plan put into effect that the 1st Marine units were already loading out before the last elements of the division arrived at Hungnam. No changes were necessary, and the plans for the reception of Marine units in the Hungnam area worked out by Colonel Snedeker and Colonel McAllister on orders of General Smith. On 8 December, Snedeker had issued detailed instructions which designated defensive sectors for RCT-1 at Chigyong and for RCT-5 and RCT-7 in the vicinity of Yampo Airfield. The 1st Amphibian Tractor Battalion was charged with making such preparations to receive the returning troops as putting up tents, installing stoves, erecting heads, and equipping galleys. The Navy, as usual, was ready. On 15 November, it may be recalled, General Smith had candidly expressed his misgivings about the strategic outlook to Admiral Morehouse and Captain Sears. Morehouse was Chief of Staff to Admiral Joy, ComNav Fee, and Sears served in a light capacity under Admiral Doyle, CTF-90. This frank discussion had not fallen upon deaf ears, and on the 28th, only a few hours after the first CCF attacks at Udem Nee, ComNav Fee alerted CTF-90 as to the possible need for a redeployment operation by sea. The following day, Joy advised that events in the Chosen Reservoir area made it desirable for ships of TF-90 to be on six hours' notice either in Korean waters or at Sasebo, Japan. CTF-90 commenced planning immediately for either an administrative or emergency unloading. His Operation Order 19-50, issued on the 28th for planning purposes, provided for half of the amphibious force to conduct redeployment operations on the East Coast under Doyle as Comp Fib Grew 1, while the other half had a similar mission on the West Coast under Admiral Thackeray, Comp Fib Grew 3. At this time, Comp Fib Grew 3 and most of the amphibious units were in Japanese ports for upkeep and replenishment. All were directed by Admiral Joy on the 29th to proceed to Sasebo. Comfibgru-1 had just completed the opening of Hungnam as a major resupply port and was preparing to withdraw to Japan with the remaining amphibious force. On 30 November, however, the deteriorating situation of ground forces in Korea made it necessary for all units of TF-90 to be in Korean waters. The emergency appeared to be more critical on the west coast, and two-thirds of the smaller amphibious ships were allotted to the Incheon area while the transports were divided equally between Incheon and Hungnam. The first week of December was devoted to planning and preparing for a redeployment of Ten Corps by sea, which appeared more likely every day. Mine-sweeping operations were resumed at Hungnam to enlarge the swept anchorage area and provide swept channels for gunfire support ships. Ten Corps Operation Order 9-50, 
issued on 5 December, provided for the defense of the Hungnam area by setting up a perimeter with a final defense line about 7 miles in radius. Pie-shaped sectors of fairly equal area, converging on the harbor, were assigned to the following major units from east to west. 1st Rock Corps, less one division at Songjin, 7th Infantry Division, 3rd Infantry Division with 1st KMC Regiment minus, and the 1st Marine Division. The Marine sector included Yampo Airfield. On 8 December, a conference held on board the Mount McKinley by ComNav V and CTF-90 was attended by Vice Admiral Struble, Com 7 Fleet, Rear Admiral John M. Higgins, Com Crew Div 5, and Lieutenant General Shepard, CG FMF PAC. General Shepard was present as representative of Commander Naval Forces Far East on matters relating to the Marine Corps and for consultation and advice in connection with the contemplated amphibious operation now being planned. General Allman was directed on the 9th to redeploy to South Korea and to report to the commanding general of the 8th Army after assembling in the Ulsan, Pusan, Masan area. He was to release the 1st Rock Corps as soon as possible to the Rock Army in the Samchuk area. An assembly area in the vicinity of Masan, widely separated from the other units of 10 Corps, was specified for the 1st Marine Division. CTF-90 was assigned the following missions. 1. Provide water lift for and conduct redeployment operations of UN forces in Korea as directed. 2. Control air and naval gunfire support in designated embarkation areas. 3. Protect shipping en route to debarkation ports. 4. Be responsible for naval blockade and gunfire support of friendly units east coast of Korea, including Pusan. 5. Be prepared to conduct small-scale redeployment operations, including ROC forces and UN prisoners of war. 6. Coordinate withdrawal operations with CG-10 Corps and other commands as appropriate. 7. Support and cover redeployment operations in the Hungnam or other designated Korean embarkation area. No such large-scale sea lift of combined Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine elements, not to mention the ROC units, had been attempted since Okinawa. The time was so short, moreover, that action could not wait on detailed planning and organization. In any event, the job had to be done. An enormous fleet of shipping must be assembled from every available source in the Far East. More than 100,000 troops must be embarked, and it was estimated at first that 25,000 Korean refugees must be evacuated, though this figure had to be nearly quadrupled. Mountains of supplies and thousands of vehicles must be outloaded from a comparatively small port. While these activities were in progress, the perimeter must be protected with naval gunfire and aircraft against an enemy credited by 10 Corps G-2 estimates with the capabilities of launching an attack of 68 depleted divisions against the Hamhung Hungnam area. It was dubbed an amphibious landing in reverse since the plan called for the methodical shrinking of the perimeter under cover of airstrikes and naval gunfire until the last platoon of the ground forces had embarked. Then would come the grand finale of the demolitions. Embarkation of 1st Marine Division The Wonsan evacuation was instructive as a rehearsal for the Hungnam redeployment. From 2 to 10 December, Lt. Col. Crow's 1st Shore Party Battalion had charge of the outloading while sharing the defense of the harbor with a battalion from the 3rd Infantry Division and two KMC battalions. Another Marine outfit, Company A of the 1st Amphibian Truck Battalion speeded up the operation by making hundreds of round trips between docks and ships with DUKWs. Air cover and naval gunfire from supporting ships of TE 90.21 was so effective that Wonsan had no enemy interference worth mentioning. Covering missions continued to be fired until the last friendly troops withdrew, and operations were completed without the necessity of destroying UN supplies and equipment. Altogether, 3,834 troops, 7,009 Korean civilians, 1,146 vehicles, and 10,013 bulk tons of cargo had been outloaded when the operation was completed on 10 December. One detachment of shore party troops sailed for Pusan with the DUKWs in preparation for unloading the 1st Marine Division upon its arrival at that port. 
The Hungnam evacuation plan, as outlined in 10 Corps Operation Order 10-50, issued on 11 December, provided for the immediate embarkation of the 1st Marine Division and the 3rd Rock Division. A smaller perimeter than the original concept was to be defended, meanwhile, by the 7th and 3rd Infantry Divisions, with the latter having the final responsibility. Major units were to withdraw gradually by side-slipping until only reinforced platoons remained as covering forces holding strong points. Plans called for naval gunfire and air support to be stepped up as the perimeter contracted. CTF-90 assumed control of all naval functions on 10 December after approving loading plans made at a conference of Navy officers and representatives of 10 Corps. Colonel Forney, Deputy Chief of Staff, 10 Corps, was appointed Corps Evacuation Control Officer with responsibility for the operation of the Hungnam Port and was assigned a small staff. Major Richard W. Schutz of General Shepard's party was placed in charge of the operations section. Two former TTU PAC Marines on the 10 Corps staff were assigned sections, Major Charles P. Wyland, the Loading Shore Section, and Major Jack R. Monday, the Navy Liaison Section. Lieutenant Colonel Harry E. Moisel, U.S. Army, headed the Movement Section, and Captain William C. Cool, U.S. Army, the Ration Section. Lieutenant Colonel Charles E. Warren served as Colonel Forney's executive officer until he was incapacitated by pneumonia and relieved by Lieutenant Colonel Crow. The 2nd Engineer Special Brigade, U.S. Army, was responsible for operation of the dock facilities, traffic control in the dock areas, and for furnishing Japanese stevedores, winch operators, cargo handling equipment, and dunnage. A reinforced company from the 1st Shore Party Battalion worked the LST and small craft beaches while controlling the lighterage for ships loading in the stream. It was decided on 11 December that 1st Marine Division staging to assembly areas should commence immediately. Loading was to be expedited so that ships could be used for a second and even third turnaround. Embarkation Order 3-50, issued by the division on the 11th, assigned vehicle and cargo assembly areas to units and an embarkation control office was set up in the dock area. As compensation for the cramped confines of the Hungnam Harbor, the tidal range was less than a foot as compared to the maximum of 31 feet at Incheon. And though the docks had space for only seven ships, Major Wyland planned to double berth four additional ships and load them from the onboard side. In addition, 11 LSTs could be handled simultaneously, seven at Green Beach 1 and the others at Green Beach 2. Marine units awaiting shipping remained on a standby basis, ready to begin loading at once upon assignment of space by the embarkation officer. The division rear CP at Hungnam had become the only CP with General Smith's arrival, and on the 11th, General Craig, the ADC, returned from emergency leave. General MacArthur flew to Yanpo Airfield on the 11th for a brief conference with General Almond and approved the 10 Corps plan. A date of 27 December was set for Corps units to pass under the control of the 8th Army in South Korea. The outloading of the 1st Marine Division was making good progress on the 12th when General Smith visited the docks on a tour of inspection. That evening, he and General Shepard attended a dinner at the Corps CP in honor of General Almond's 58th birthday. The Army was represented by Major Generals Barr, Soule, and Clark L. Ruffner, 10 Corps Chief of Staff. By the following day, the 5th and 7th Marines were ready to sail. Embarkation officers loaded their ships by sight, planning as they went along. Not knowing in advance what type of ship might be assigned, they found that carefully calculated stowage diagrams were out of the question. Under these circumstances, amphibious training and experience were invaluable. Space in the tent city established by 10 Corps to the rear of the LST beaches had been made available to Marine units awaiting embarkation. Most of them, however, moved directly from their bivouac areas to the beach. While the Marines were outloading, the two Army divisions defending the perimeter had only minor patrol actions. Their artillery supplied most of the interdiction fires at the outset, with naval gunfire giving the deep support. Vigorous air support by Navy, Air Force, and Marine planes also did much to discourage any hostile intentions the enemy may have had. MiG-SIS-1, the ground control intercept squadron at Yanpo, 
stopped directing the high altitude fighters on 11 December and passed over to the USS Mount McKinley the task of keeping the perimeter clear of any enemy planes. Overall control of air still remained ashore with MTAX-2. At 1500 on the 13th, General Smith went aboard the USS Bayfield and opened the Division CP. As his last duty on shore, he attended memorial services held by the division at the Hung Nam Cemetery. While the commanding general paid his tribute to the honored dead, Chinese POWs were making preparations for the internment of the last bodies brought down from Chin Hung Ni. The marine loading was completed on the 14th. At a conference that day with CTF-90 on board the Mount McKinley, General Smith inquired as to the possibility of having the ships carrying the Marines unload at Masan instead of Pusan, thus saving a 40-mile movement by truck. Admiral Doyle pointed out that this procedure was not feasible because of the lack of lighterage facilities at Masan. The additional turnaround time, moreover, would have delayed the evacuation of remaining Corps units. The 14th was also the day when Marine airstrikes from Yampo ended with the departure of the last of the wing's land-based fighters for Japan. Shortly after midnight, the air defense section of MTAX-2 passed control of all air in the Hungnam area to the Navy's Tactical Air Control Squadron 1 of TF-90 aboard the USS Mount McKinley. The Marine Squadron then set up a standby tack aboard the LST until the final withdrawal on 24 December. At 10.30 on 15 December, as the Bayfield sailed, the curtain went down on one of the most memorable campaigns in the 175-year history of the Marine Corps. A total of 22,215 Marines had embarked in shipping consisting of an APA, an AKA, three APs, 13 LSTs, three LSDs, and seven commercial cargo ships. The Yampo airlift continued, however, until 17 December when the field was closed and a temporary airstrip nearer the harbor was made available to twin-engine R-4Ds for the final phase of the air evacuation. The only marine units left in Hungnam were a reinforced shore party company, an Anglico group, and one and a half companies, 88 LVTs, of the 1st Amphibian Tractor Battalion. They passed under the operational control of Ten Corps to assist in the outloading of Army units. Also, Colonel Becker C. Batterton, commanding MAG-12, had moved to Hungnam for the final evacuation of his air group from Yanpo and to arrange for loading its heavy equipment and remaining personnel aboard SS Tawanda Victory. Then on 18 December, he flew his command post to Itami. The Last Ten Days at Hungnam with ten days remaining for the embarkation of the two army divisions, the problem of Korean refugees threatened to disrupt the schedule. But CTF-90 contrived somehow to find the shipping, and the homeless Koreans were willing to put up with any hardships to escape from communist domination. It became standard practice to embark at least 5,000 on an LST, not counting children in arms, and no less than 12,000 human sardines found standing room on one commercial cargo ship. The most fragile link in the complex chain of operations was represented by the two 390-ton diesel electric tugs. No others were available, nor were spare parts to be had, yet both tugs had clocked more than 5,000 running hours since the last overhaul. Thus it seemed almost a miracle that neither broke down for more than three hours in all, and repairs were made with materials at hand. On the 18th, when the last rock sailed for Samchuk, the 7th Infantry Division was in the midst of its outloading. By 20 December, all troops of this unit had embarked, according to schedule. Responsibility for the defense of Hungnam then passed to Admiral Doyle as General Allman and his staff joined CTF-90 on board the flagship Mount McKinley. General Seoul's 3rd Division now manned the shore defense alone. When the perimeter contracted to the immediate vicinity of Hungnam, following the evacuation of Hamhung and Yanpo Airfield, Two cruisers, seven destroyers, and three rocket-firing craft covered the entire front from their assigned position in minesweep lanes. A total of nearly 34,000 shells and 12,800 rockets was fired by these support ships, with the battleship Missouri contributing 162 16-inch rounds at the finish of the bombardment. About 800 more 8-inch shells and 12,800 more 5-inch shells were expended at Hungnam, than during the naval gunfire preparation for the Incheon landing. Seven embarkation sites were employed. 
From left to right, they were designated as Pink Beach, Blue Beach, Green 1 and 2 Beaches, and Yellow 1, 2, and 3 Beaches. The 7th RCT, holding the left sector, was to embark from Pink Beach. Blue and Green 1 Beaches were assigned to the 65th RCT in the center, while the 15th RCT had Green 2 and the 3 Yellow Beaches. HR had been set at 1100 on the 24th, and 7 LSTs were beached at 0800 to receive 3rd Infantry Division troops. Soon the three regiments were reduced to as many battalions which acted as covering forces while the other troops fell back to assign beaches. All withdrawals were conducted methodically along specified routes by units using marked panels. Then the battalions themselves pulled out, leaving only seven reinforced platoons manning strong points. The Hung Nam redeployment came to an end when these platoons boarded an LST after a search for stragglers. Air and naval gunfire support had made it an uneventful finish except for the accidental explosion of an ammunition dump on Pink Beach, resulting in two men killed and 21 wounded. All beaches were clear by 1436 on Sunday afternoon, the 24th, with Abel and Baker companies of the Amtrak Battalion sticking it out to the end. Marines of these units provided fires to cover the flanks of the last withdrawals and manned 37 LVTs evacuating Army troops from Pink Beach. With the exception of three LVTs lost in the ammunition dump explosion on that beach, all LVTs and LVTAs were safely re-embarked on LSDs at the finish of the operation. Remarkably few supplies had to be left behind for lack of shipping space. Among them were 400 tons of frozen dynamite and 500,000 pound bombs. They added to the tumult of an awe-inspiring demolition scene. The entire Hungnam waterfront seemed to be blown sky high in one volcanic eruption of flame, smoke, and rubble which left a huge black mushroom cloud hovering over the ruins. The chill, misty dawn of Christmas Day found the Mount McKinley about to sail for Ulsan with CTF-90 and Generals Almond and Shepard after an eminently successful operation. It had been pretty much the Navy's show, in the absence of enemy interference, and the final statistics were staggering. 105,000 military personnel, 91,000 Korean refugees, 17,500 vehicles, and 350,000 measurement tons of cargo loaded out in 193 shiploads by 109 ships. With naval, air, and surface units effectively isolating the beachhead, we were able to take our time and get everything out, commented Admiral Joy on 26 December. Admiral Doyle has turned in another brilliant performance. We never, never contemplated a Dunkirk, not even faintly. Marines arrive at new assembly area. While the remaining 10 Corps units completed outloading at Hungnam, the Marines were landing at Pusan and proceeding by motor march to their new assembly area in the vicinity of Masan. General Craig, the ADC, had gone ahead with the advance party from Hungnam and made arrangements for the reception of the division. News from the front in West Korea was not encouraging as the 8th Army planned further withdrawals, for G2 reports indicated that the advancing Chinese were about to launch a great new offensive shortly. Despite the persistent rumors that all Korea might be evacuated by UN forces, General MacArthur insisted in his special communique of 26 December that operations were skillfully conducted without loss of cohesion and with all units remaining intact. In its broad implications, I consider that these operations, initiated on 24 November and carried through to this Hungnam redeployment, have served a very significant purpose possibly in general result the most significant and fortunate of any conducted during the course of the Korean campaign. The might of a major military nation was suddenly and without warning thrown against this relatively small United Nations command, but without attaining a decision. Due to intervening circumstances beyond our power to control or even detect, we did not achieve the United Nations objective but at a casualty cost less than that experienced in a comparable period of defensive fighting on the Pusan perimeter, we exposed before too late secret political and military decisions of enormous scope and threw off balance enemy preparations aimed at surreptitiously massing the power capable of destroying our forces with one mighty extended blow. 
Questions to the proper evaluation of the 8th Army withdrawal turned into a controversy during coming months with political as well as military implications. Press representatives, military critics, and soldiers of other nations, while crediting MacArthur with the great victory at Inchon, were for the most part of the opinion that the 8th Army withdrawal of November and December was a costly reverse. Footnote. General MacArthur comments are as follows. This, again, is a non-professional estimate belied by the facts and the viewpoints of all senior commanders present. It was the purpose of Red China to overwhelm and annihilate through a sneak attack the 8th Army and 10 Corps by the heavy assault of overwhelming forces of a new power, not heretofore committed to war, against which it knew or rightly surmised there would be no retaliation. This plan was foiled by our anticipatory advance which uncovered the enemy's plot before he had assembled all of his forces, and by our prompt strategic withdrawal before he could inflict a crippling blow of a Pearl Harbor nature. This was undoubtedly one of the most successful strategic retreats in history, comparable with and markedly similar to Wellington's Great Peninsula withdrawal. Had the initiative action not been taken and an inert position of adequate defense assumed, I have no slightest doubt that the 8th Army and 10 Corps both would have been annihilated. As it was, both were preserved with practically undiminished potential for further action. I have always regarded this action, considering the apparently unsurmountable difficulties and overwhelming odds, as the most successful and satisfying I have ever commanded. MacArthur, Letter, 17 October, 56 Marine officers in Korea had no first-hand knowledge of USAC operations. It was obvious, however, that an 8th Army retirement south of the 38th parallel had made it desirable if not actually necessary for 10 Corps to withdraw from Northeast Korea, even though General Ullman held that a Hamhung Hungnam perimeter could be defended throughout the winter. End of Chapter 15, Part 1 Read by Aaron Bennett Chapter 15, Part 2 of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950-1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Hungnam Redeployment Contributions of Marine Aviation the close coordination of aviation with the ground forces in the Chosen Campaign was due in large measure to the assignment of additional pilots to the 1st Marine Division as forward air controllers. They had been plucked from 1st Marine Aircraft Wing squadrons barely in time to join their battalions before embarkation at Incheon. Increasing the number of facts to two per battalion did much to bring air support down to the company level when needed. Air units frequently had to rely upon charts with place names, grid coordinates, and scales different from those in the hands of the ground troops. Here the marine system of the man on the ground talking the pilot onto the target by reference to visual landmarks paid off. Cloudy, stormy weather was common. Three night fighter pilots were lost because of icing, disorientation, and insufficient radio aids to navigation. Two VMF-212 land-based pilots saved themselves from destruction only by landing on the Bedong Strait with their last drops of gas. With the approach of winter and cold weather, aircraft on the landing strips had to be run up every two hours at night to keep the oil warm enough for early morning takeoffs. Ordnance efficiency dropped. Planes skidded on icy runways. Once, after a six-inch snow, Eighty men and ten trucks worked all night to clear and sand a 150-foot strip down the runway at Yanpo. As early as mid-November, it once took hours of scraping and chipping on the Badong Strait to clear three inches of glazed ice and snow off the decks, catapults, arresting wires, and barriers. Planes which stood the night on the flight deck had to be taken below to the hangar deck to thaw out. On another occasion, VMF-214 had to cancel all flight operations because 68-knot winds, heavy seas, and freezing temperatures covered the Sicily's flight deck and aircraft with a persistent coat of ice. One pilot of VMF-323 had to return shortly after takeoff because water vapor froze in his oil breather tube in flight. 
With the back pressure throwing oil all over his windshield and billowing black vapor and smoke out of his cowl, he landed only to have the front of his Corsair burst into flames when the escaped oil dripped on the hot exhaust stacks. Quick work by the deck crews extinguished the fire. A hazard as great as being shot down was a crash landing or bailout at sea, where the water was cold enough to kill a man in 20 minutes. Survival clothing and equipment was so bulky that pilots could barely get into their cockpits. Maintenance and servicing problems ashore, complicated by dirt, dust, and scarcity of parts, kept mechanics working to the point of exhaustion. Insufficient trucks forced the ground crews to refuel and arm planes by hand, often from rusting fuel drums. Two destructive crashes, one fatal, were attributed to accumulated water and gasoline. Aboard ship until mid-November, VMF-214 was able to keep 91% of its planes operative. When suddenly deployed ashore to Wonsan, its aircraft availability dropped to 82% and at Yanpo 67%. Once back at sea again in December, it jumped up to 90%. Basic difference in close air support doctrine between the Navy and Marines and Air Force were resolved by close and friendly liaison between the 1st Marine Aircraft Wing and the 5th Air Force Commands, by a Marine aviator attached to the Joint 8th Army 5th Air Force Operations Center at Seoul, and by indoctrination of non-Marine units of the 10 Corps in the Marine Navy style of close air support. Difficulties in inter-service communication slowed 5th Air Force operations orders to carrier squadrons, both Navy and Marine. Messages were routed via FIF and ComNav Fee in Tokyo and arrived hours late. Ashore, even MAG-12 during the first two weeks at Wonsan received its 5th Air Force mission orders 6 to 36 hours late. A direct radio teletype between 1st MA and 5th Air Force headquarters alleviated the situation. And when the CG First Ma received full control of the air over the 10 Corps area on 1 December, these problems were eased. Actual control of air support for the scattered ground units demonstrated close cooperation between the Navy and Marine Corps. This was evident from the time the Navy's Tactical Air Control Squadron 1 on the USS Mount McKinley passed control to the Air Defense Section of MTAX-2 at Hamhung to the time that control returned to the ship in the Hungnam evacuation. When the Marines had control, the ship stood by as an emergency tack and acted as a radar reporting station for MTAX-2. When control was passed back afloat, the air defense section of MTAX-2 stood by as a standby tack aboard an LST until the last man was pulled off the beach. Furthermore, three officers from McSIS-1 went aboard Mount McKinley to help out as air defense controllers. They were experienced. All through the Wonsan Chosen campaign, the Mixis had directed the defensive fighter patrols, circling Wonsan and Yanpo, to check all unidentified aircraft before the latter got close enough to do any damage. Mixis-1 also steered lost planes to base in bad weather, occasionally vectored them to the GCA radar-controlled landing pattern, and even assisted MTAX-2 in directing air support planes to fax. Tactical air support in the 10 Corps zone was directed to the ground units by the air support section of MTAX-2. From 26 October to 11 December, 3,703 sorties in 1,053 missions were controlled by the TACPS of Marine, Army, and ROC units. Close air support missions accounted for 599 of the total, 468 for the 1st Marine Division, 8 for the 3rd Infantry Division, 56 for the 7th Infantry Division, and 67 for the ROCs. The remaining 454 missions were search and attack. When FAC communications failed from valley to valley, aircraft became radio relays and controllers. This was highlighted by the airborne TADC orbiting over the road from Hagaru. Approximately half of the Marine air missions were in support of non-Marine ground units. The ROC and the U.S. Army units were not as well supplied with experienced facts as the 1st Marine Division. In these areas, four Air Force Mosquitoes, AT-6 Texan training planes, were assigned to 10 Corps to assist in the control of air support. When shore-based Marine air support was about to cease with the closing of Yanpo Airfield, VMF-214 and VMF-212 quickly moved their operations aboard carrier, 
and during the final phases of the Hung Nam evacuation, almost half of the Marine tactical air strength was operating from carrier bases. VMF-214 flew back aboard Sicily on 7 December without missing a mission, and VMF-212, which had moved to Itami on 4 December to draw and test a new complement of carrier Corsairs, was aboard the USS Bataan eight days later. When the month ended, still another squadron, VMF-312, was polishing up its carrier landing technique for seaborne duty. The outcome of the Hagaru withdrawal owed much to airdrop supplies and to casualty evacuations by General Tunner's Combat Cargo Command, CCC. Assisting combat cargo and marine support were the Wing's R-4D twin-engine transports and TBM World War II-type torpedo bombers, both of which were flown largely by the field desk pilots of the Wing and group staffs. Most of the Marines' share of the heavy airlifting, however, was done by the four-engine R-5D transports of Colonel Dean C. Roberts' VMR-152. Early in October, this squadron had been temporarily shifted from the Trans-Pacific airlift of the Navy's Fleet Logistics Air Wing to support the Marines in the Wonsan Campaign. In Korea, its operations were controlled by the Combat Cargo Command, which committed an average of five Marine R-5Ds a day into the CCC airlift. In such missions, these transports supported all UN units from Pyongyang to Yanpo in points north. Marine transports not committed by the CCC for general UN support in Korea were available for wing use. From 1 November until Christmas, VMR-152 safely carried 5 million pounds of supplies to the front and evacuated more than 4,000 casualties. The Chosen Reservoir campaign opened two new chapters in marine aviation history. The first was the use of the airborne TADC to control the air support of the division column between Hagaru and Chinhung Ni. The second was the appearance of VMF-311, the first marine jet squadron to fly in combat. Beginning on 10 December, the newly arrived squadron flew interdiction missions for four days from Yanpo. Then it moved to Pusan to operate for the remainder of the month, with 5th Air Force jets streaking up the Long Peninsula to cover the withdrawal of the 8th Army. Appreciation for the assistance given by Marine Aviation to Marine Ground Forces was expressed in a letter of 20 December from General Smith to General Harris, the commanding general of the 1st Marine Air Wing. The division commander said, Without your support, our task would have been infinitely more difficult and more costly. During the long reaches of the night and in the snowstorms, many a Marine prayed for the coming of day or clearing weather when he knew he would again hear the welcome roar of your planes as they dealt out destruction to the enemy. Even the presence of a night heckler was reassuring. Never in its history has Marine aviation given more convincing proof of its indispensable value to the ground Marines. A bond of understanding has been established that will never be broken. The story of air support in the Chosen Reservoir campaign would not be complete without a summary of the results of VMO-6. Marines took a proprietary interest in Major Gottschalk Squadron, which had put into effect the helicopter techniques worked out at Quantico by the Experimental Squadron, HMX-1. Some of these techniques were having their first test in combat, for the development of rotary wing aircraft in 1950 was at a pioneer stage comparable to that of fixed wing aircraft in the first year of World War I. On 28 October, VMO-6 had a strength of 25 officers, 95 enlisted men, 10 light fixed wing aircraft, 8 OY-2s, 2 L-5Gs, and 9 HO-3S-1 helicopters. From that date until 15 December, the squadron made 1,544 flights for a total of 1,624.8 hours. The principal missions were as follows. Reconnaissance, OYs, 393, helicopters, 64, transportation, OYs, 130, helicopters, 421, evacuation, OYs, 29, Helicopters, 191. Liaison, OYs, 35. Helicopters, 90. Artillery spot, OYs, 39. Helicopters, 0. Utility, OYs, 26. Helicopters, 60. Rescue, OYs, 0. 
helicopters 11. But statistics can give no idea of the most significant achievement of VM-06 in the reservoir campaign. For during the most critical period, the only physical contact between units separated by enemy action was provided by the OYs and helicopters. The importance of this contribution can hardly be overestimated. Losses Sustained by the Enemy Marine losses in Northeast Korea, as reported by the Secretary of the Navy, included a total of 4,418 battle casualties from 26 October to 15 December 1950. 604 KIA, 114 DOW, 192 MIA, and 3,508 WIA. The 7,313 non-battle casualties consisted largely of minor frostbite and indigestion cases who were soon restored to active duty. Eight Marine pilots were KIA or died of wounds, four were MIA, and three were wounded. General Smith estimated that a third of the non-battle casualties were returned to duty during the operation. Enemy losses for the same period were estimated at a total of 37,500, 15,000 killed and 7,500 wounded by Marine ground fires, plus 10,000 killed and 5,000 wounded by Marine air. Not much reliance can be placed in such figures as a rule, but fortunately we have enemy testimony as to heavy losses sustained by the Chinese communists. This evidence goes far toward explaining why they did not interfere with the Hungnam redeployment. Contrary to expectations, Chinese military critiques have been candid in admitting failures and unsparing in self-criticism. Among captured documents are summaries of the operations of the three CCF armies encountered by the Marines in the Chosen Reservoir area. These major units, representing at least 11 and probably 12 divisions, were as follows. 20th CCF Army, 58th, 59th, and 60th Divisions, with the 89th Division of the 30th Army attached. 26th CCF Army, 76th, 77th, and 78th Divisions, with probably the 94th Division of the 32nd Army attached. 27th CCF Army, 79th, 80th, and 81st Divisions, with the 70th Division of the 24th Army attached. All three armies were major units of the 9th Army Group of the 3rd CCF Field Army. In mid-October, the leading elements of the 4th CCF Field Army had crossed the Yalu to oppose the U.S. 8th Army. The operations of 10 Corps in Northeast Korea being considered a threat to the left flank, the 42nd Army was detached with a mission of providing flank protection, pending relief by units of the 3rd CCF Field Army. Three divisions, the 124th, 125th, and 126th, were represented. While the last hovered on the left flank of the 4th Field Army, the 124th was hard hit near Sudong during the first week of November by RCT-7 of the 1st Marine Division. In order to cover the withdrawal of the remnants, the 125th Division moved south of Hagaru from the Fusen Reservoir area. Both CCF divisions then fell back to Udemni, where they were relieved by units of the 20th Army, 3rd Field Army. This ended the operations of the 4th Field Army in Northeast Korea. Shortly after the appearance of the 20th Army in the Udemni area, the 27th Army moved into positions north of the Chosen Reservoir. Thus, the enemy had available eight divisions for the attacks of 27 to 28 November on the Marines in the Udamni area and the three 7th Infantry Division battalions east of the Chosen Reservoir. If it may be assumed that these CCF divisions averaged 7,500 men each, or three-fourths of full strength, the enemy had a total of 60,000 men in assault or reserve. The Chinese, as we know, failed to accomplish their basic mission which prisoners agreed was the destruction of the 1st Marine Division. In every instance, the efforts of the first night were the most formidable, with enemy effectiveness declining sharply after a second or third attack. The explanation seems to be that the 12 divisions were sent into northeast Korea with supplies which would have been sufficient only if the first attempts had succeeded. The following comment by the 26th Army supports this conclusion. A shortage of transportation and escort personnel make it impossible to accomplish the mission of supplying the troops. As a result, 
Our soldiers frequently starve. From now on, the organization of our rear service units should be improved. The troops were hungry. They ate cold food, and some had only a few potatoes in two days. They were unable to maintain the physical strength for combat. The wounded personnel could not be evacuated. The firepower of our entire army was basically inadequate. When we used our guns, there were no shells, and sometimes the shells were duds. The enemy's tactical rigidity and tendency to repeat costly errors are charged by the 20th Army to inferior communications. Our signal communication was not up to standard. For example, it took more than two days to receive instructions from higher level units. Rapid changes of the enemy's situation and the slow motion of our signal communications caused us to lose our opportunities in combat and made the instructions of the high level units ineffective. We succeeded in the separation and encirclement of the enemy, but we failed to annihilate the enemy one by one. The units failed to carry out the orders of the higher echelon. For example, the failure to annihilate the enemy at Udamni made it impossible to annihilate the enemy at Hagaru. The higher level unit's refusal of the lower level unit's suggestion of rapidly starting the combat and exterminating the enemy one by one gave the enemy a chance to break out from the encirclement. One of the most striking instances of the tactical inflexibility which stultified Chinese efforts was found at Hagaru. With only a depleted Marine Infantry Battalion and service troops available to defend a perimeter four miles in circumference, the enemy needed mere daylight observation to ascertain and avoid the most strongly defended positions. Yet these were just the positions chosen for the attack, not only on the first night, but also the second occasion 48 hours later. The CCF tactics were mechanical, commented the 27th Army. We underestimated the enemy, so we distributed the strength, and consequently the higher echelons were over-dispersed while the lower echelon units were over-concentrated. During one movement, the distance between the three leading divisions was very long, while the formations of the battalions, companies, and units of lower levels were too close, and the troops were unable to deploy. Furthermore, reconnaissance was not conducted strictly. We walked into the enemy fire net and suffered heavy casualties. Summing up the reasons why the Marines at Udemni were not exterminated promptly, the 27th Army concludes that it was because our troops encountered unfavorable conditions during the missions and the troops suffered too many casualties. This would seem to be another way of saying that the Chinese failed to destroy the 1st Marine Division because they themselves were nearly destroyed in the attempt. At any rate, evidence from the enemy documents points overwhelmingly to crippling losses both for Marine firepower and non-battle casualties chargeable to lack of equipment and supplies. The 20th Army had 100 deaths from tetanus caused by improper care of wounds. Hundreds of other soldiers were incapacitated by typhus or ailments of malnutrition and indigestion. More than 90% of the 26th Army suffered from frostbite. The 27th Army complained of 10,000 non-combat casualties alone out of a strength of four divisions. The troops did not have enough food, they did not have enough houses to live in, they could not stand the bitter cold, which was the reason for the excessive non-combat reduction in personnel more than 10,000 persons. The weapons were not used effectively. When the fighters bivouacked in snow-covered ground during combat, their feet, socks, and hands were frozen together in one ice ball. They could not unscrew the caps on the hand grenades. The fuses would not ignite. The hands were not supple. The mortar tube shrank on account of the cold. 70% of the shells failed to detonate. Skin from the hands was stuck on the shells and the mortar tubes. Testimony as to the effects of marine firepower is also given by the 26th Army. The coordination between the enemy infantry, tanks, artillery, and airplanes is surprisingly close. Besides using heavy weapons for the depth, the enemy carries with him automatic light firearms which, coordinated with rockets, launchers, and recoilless guns, are disposed at the front line. The characteristic of their employment is to stay quietly under cover and open fire suddenly when we come to between 70 and 100 meters from them, making it difficult for our troops to deploy and thus inflicting casualties upon us. 
The 20th and 27th armies appear to have been bled white by the losses of the first week. Early in December, the units of the 26th Army appeared on the east side of the MSR between Hagaru and Koto Ri, and this unit furnished most of the opposition from 6 to 11 December. Seven divisions in all were identified by the 1st Marine Division, and since the taking of prisoners was not a matter of top priority with men fighting for existence, it is likely that other CCF units were encountered. The CCF 9th Army Group, according to a prisoner questioned on 7 December, included a total of 12 divisions. This POW gave the following statement. Missions of the four armies in the 9th Group are to annihilate the 1st Division, which is considered to be the best division in the U.S. After annihilating the 1st Marine Division, they are to move south and take Hamhung. As to the reason why the Chinese took no advantage of the Hungnam redeployment, there seems to be little doubt that the 9th Army Group was too riddled by battle and non-battle casualties to make the effort. This is not a matter of opinion. Following the Hungnam redeployment, as the U.S. 8th Army braced itself to meet a new CCF offensive, UN and FECOM G2 officers were naturally concerned as to whether the remaining 9th Army Group troops in Northeast Korea would be available to strengthen the CCF 4th Field Army. It was estimated that only two weeks would be required to move these troops to West Korea, where they had the capability of reinforcing the CCF attack against the 8th Army. Efforts to locate the 9th Army Group were unavailing for nearly three months. Then a prisoner from the 77th Division of the 26th Army was captured by U.S. 8th Army troops on 18 March 1951. During the following week, POW interrogations established that three divisions of the 26th Army were in contact with 8th Army units northeast of Seoul. The only conclusion to be drawn, comments the Marine Corps Board study, based on information collected by 1st Mar Div and 10 Corps, and that by UN and FEC, is that all Corps of 9th Army Group had been rendered militarily ineffective in the chosen reservoir operation and required a considerable period of time for replacement, re-equipment, and reorganization. Thus it appears that the Marines not only saved themselves in the chosen reservoir fights, they also saved U.S. 8th Army from being assailed by reinforcements from Northeast Korea in the CCF offensive which exploded on the last night of 1950. Results of the Reservoir Campaign There could be no doubt, after taking into account the CCF mission, that the 9th Army Group, 3rd Field Army, had sustained a reverse in Northeast Korea which amounted to a disaster. On the other hand, it might have been asked whether a retrograde movement such as the Marine Breakout, even though aggressively and successfully executed, could be termed a victory. This question involves issues too complex for a clear-cut positive answer, but it would be hard to improve upon the analysis of results in the Marine Corps Board study. Although the operations of this phase constitute a withdrawal, despite the fact that CG First Mardiv characterized them as an attack in a new direction, the withdrawal was executed in the face of overwhelming odds and conducted in such a manner that, contrary to the usual withdrawal, some very important tactical results were achieved. These may be summarized as follows. 1. Extricated First Mar Div from a trap sprung by overwhelming enemy ground forces by skillful employment of integrated ground and air action which enabled the division to come through with all operable equipment, with wounded properly evacuated, and with tactical integrity. 2. Outfought and outlasted at least seven CCF divisions under conditions of terrain and weather chosen by the enemy and reputedly to his liking. Although frostbite took a heavy toll on the division, it hit CCF units far harder, perhaps decisively. 3. In the process of accomplishing two above, rendered militarily non-effective a large part of 9th CCF Army Group. Those units not contacted by 1st Mar Div were fixed in the chosen reservoir area for possible employment against the division and consequently suffered from the ravages of sub-zero cold and heavy air attacks. 4. As a direct result of three above, enabled 10 Corps to evacuate Hungnam without enemy interference and, consequently, as a combat effective unit with all personnel and serviceable equipment. Pressure on 10 Corps by 9th CCF Army Group during the seaward evacuation of the Corps, a most difficult operation, 
would undoubtedly have altered the result. Improvisations and tactics were now and then made necessary by unusual conditions of terrain, weather, or enemy action. But on the whole, the Marines saved themselves in the reservoir campaign by the application of sound military tactics. In the doing, they demonstrated repeatedly that the rear makes as good a front as any other for the militarily skilled and stout-hearted, and that a unit is not beaten merely because it is surrounded by a more numerous enemy. Inevitably, the Marine campaign has been compared to that classic of all military breakouts, the March of the Immortal Ten Thousand, which is the subject of Xenophon's Anabasis. Stranded in the hostile Persian Empire in the year 401 BC, these Greek mercenaries cut their way to safety through Asiatic hordes. The following description of the tactics used by Xenophon and his lieutenant Cherisophus to overcome roadblocks in mountain country will have a familiar ring to marine veterans of the reservoir. The enemy, by keeping up a continuous battle and occupying in advance every narrow place, obstructed passage after passage. Accordingly, whenever the van was obstructed, Xenophon, from behind, made a dash up the hills and broke the barricade, and freed the vanguard by endeavoring to get above the obstructing enemy. Whenever the rear was the point attacked, Cherisophus, in the same way, made a detour and by endeavoring to mount higher than the barricaders, freed the passage for the rear rank, and in this way, turn and turn about, they rescued each other and paid unflinching attention to their mutual needs. Spears and arrows have been superseded by bazookas and machine guns, but the basic infantry tactics of the reservoir breakout were essentially those which served Xenophon and the 10,000 more than 33 centuries ago. Organization, combat, training, spirit, and discipline enabled the Marines, like the Helenas before them, to overcome numerical odds and fight their way over Asiatic mountain roads to sea. The overall strategic effect of the reservoir campaign, as summarized by the Marine Corps board study, were as follows. 1. Played a prominent part in enabling 10 Corps, a considerable segment of the total UN forces in Korea, to be withdrawn from Hungnam as a combat effective force available for employment with the 8th Army in South Korea at a time when that army was retreating and was in critical need of a reinforcement. 2. Were largely responsible for preventing reinforcement of CCF forces on 8th Army front by 12 divisions during a period when such reinforcement might have meant to 8th Army the difference between maintaining a foothold in Korea or forced evacuation therefrom by being instrumental in rendering 9th CCF Army Group, a force of three corps of four divisions each, militarily non-effective for a minimum period of three months. That the breakout of the 1st Marine Division had affected American political and military policy at the highest levels was the assertion of the editorial in time. When referring to what it termed the Great Debate in December 1950 as to whether American forces should be withdrawn from Korea, the news magazine commented, When the Marines fought their way down to Hungnam through the unconquerable Chinese hordes and embarked for Pusan with their equipment, their wounded, and their prisoners, the war in Asia took on a different look. The news stories, pictures, and newsreels of the Hungnam action contributed more to forming U.S. policy than all the words in the great debate. The nation and the revitalized Eighth Army now knows that U.S. fighting men will stay in Korea until a better place and a better opportunity is found to punish communist aggression. General Douglas MacArthur as Sink UNC, in his 11th Report of Operations of UN Forces in Korea, submitted the following to the United Nations Organization regarding the Chosen Reservoir Operation. In this epic action, the Marine Division and attached elements of the 7th Infantry Division marched and fought over 60 miles in bitter cold along a narrow, tortuous, ice-covered road against opposition from six to eight Chinese Communist Force Divisions, which suffered staggering losses. Success was due in no small part to the unprecedented extent and effectiveness of air support. The basic element, however, was the high quality of soldierly courage displayed by the personnel of the ground units which maintained their integrity in the face of continuous attacks by numerically superior forces, consistently held their positions until their wounded had been evacuated, and doggedly refused to abandon supplies and equipment to the enemy. 
United Nations Air Forces threw the bulk of their effort into close support of ground forces, cutting their way through overwhelming numbers of Chinese communists. The toll of the enemy taken by the United Nations aircraft contributed in large measure to the successful move of our forces from the Chosen Reservoir to the Hungnam area despite the tremendous odds against them. Air support provided by the United States Marine Air Force and naval aircraft in this beleaguered area, described as magnificent by the ground force commanders, represented one of the greatest concentrations of tactical air operations in history. Rear Admiral James H. Doyle attributed the successful evacuation at Hungnam in large measure to the Marine breakout. Writing to General Smith several months later, he asserted that he had filled in what has been a neglected page in the story of the Hungnam redeployment. It is simply this, that the destruction of enemy forces wrought by the 1st Marine Division on the march down the hill was a major factor in the successful withdrawal and that the destruction was so complete the enemy was unable to exert serious pressure at any time on the shrinking perimeter. To my mind, as I told you at Hungnam, the performance of the 1st Marine Division on that march constitutes one of the most glorious chapters in Marine Corps history. Letters of commendation were received by the 1st Marine Division from General Cates, CMC, General Shepard, Admiral Joy, General Collins, Chief of Staff, U.S. Army, General Almond, and many other high-ranking military leaders. But for depth of feeling, for sincerity and emotion, there was no message which appealed more to the officers and men of the division than the concluding paragraph of this tribute from the commanding general, who had guided their destinies with unswerving courage and who had come out with them, Major General Oliver P. Smith. The performance of officers and men in this operation was magnificent. Rarely have all hands in a division participated so intimately in the combat phases of an operation. Every Marine can be justly proud of his participation. In Korea, Tokyo, and Washington, there is full appreciation of the remarkable feat of this division. With the knowledge of the determination, professional competence, heroism, devotion to duty, and self-sacrifice displayed by officers and men of this division, my feeling is one of humble pride. No division commander has ever been privileged to command a finer body of men. End of chapter 15, part 2. End of U.S. Marine Operations in Korea, 1950 to 1953, Volume 3, The Chosen Reservoir Campaign, by Lynn Montross and Nicholas Canzona. Read by Aaron Bennett.